Okay, can we have uh, Mr. Majet and Mr. Bellamy please come down? Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Vincent Bernard Orn Sr., the Chairman of the Committee on Business and Consumer Regulatory Affairs. I'd like to call this round table to order. Uh, we're here today uh, for this public hearing on PR 20-125, the Vending Business License Regulation Resolution Act of 2013. The time now is 11.15 a.m. on Friday, May 10th, 2013. We're located in room 412 in the John A. Wilson Building, located at 1350 Pennsylvania Avenue here in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. The purpose of this roundtable is to discuss PR 20-125, the Vending Business License Regulation Resolution, which would establish new regulations for vending business licenses, license fees for market manager business licenses, and fines for violations of vending business license regulations here in the District of Columbia. This is the fourth set of proposed regulations drafted since the enactment of the Vending Regulation Act in 2009. The stated purpose of the Vending Regulation Act was to lift a vending moratorium established by this council in 1998. The moratorium was meant to give the, the Department of Consumer Regulatory Affairs time to study mobile vending in the city and create a clear set of rules to fairly regulate and oversee mobile vending within the district. Since that time, mobile vending has grown at a rapid pace and the need for a clear and fair set of regulations is greater than ever. The increased popularity of mobile vending is driven not only by the foods industry's desire to provide new and innovative options, but by social media tools such as Facebook and Twitter which have changed the way that many food vendors market to customers. Today, both food trucks and brick and mortar restaurants establishments rely on social media to advertise their brand, maintain customer relationships, and increase their accessibility. There's an ongoing goal of this committee to support and encourage the growth and continued creativity of both established businesses and new economic pursuits in the District of Columbia. To that end, we believe the purpose of these regulations is to achieve and foster the safe, efficient, and effective management of vending throughout the District of Columbia and allow both new and seasoned ventures to exist in harmony. With that in mind, however, it is important to remember the Council is limited by Section 11 of D.C. Law 18-71, which does not allow for amendments to these regulations. The bottom line is that the Council can only act to approve or disapprove the rules before us in their entirety. Based on the law, we cannot add, amend, or delete any provisions. I believe this is problematic in practice, and going forward, I'm interested in introducing legislation that will give the Council more flexibility in approving or disapproving regulations in the future. I can tell you my current thought is that we, the Council, should have an opportunity to really seize control of this issue and perhaps even uh, be in a position to modify these regulations because it appears to me that there has been a lot of common ground established. So at this point I am working with our General Counsel's Office to see if I can in fact introduce emergency legislation to, uh, uh, to rid of, of, the, uh, of the opportunity to uh, add, amend, or delete any provisions in these regulations. With that in mind here today, I'm looking, to our, I'm looking for common ground, I'm looking for areas where we can fashion something where we can all move forward. And I am heartened by the article that I read this morning in, in the Washington Post, where it appears that the government has come forward with a number of locations. I believe the total is 150 locations. Uh, I'm also heartened by the uh, comments by, uh, I think, Mr. Uh, David Povich that indicated that he does realize that there should be a manage there should be management of public space. Uh, I'd also take note to his comment that uh, the 150 uh, uh, locations, uh, he would like to see them in uh, the regulations themselves. I don't know if that could actually be done, but at least that to me it shows that there's some, some movement. Uh, I also received a, a, a letter from uh, 
the Food Truck Association of Metropolitan uh, Washington. I read through it and I was very intrigued by the uh, vending, what do you call the vending improvement detail. Uh, I thought that was a, a very interesting uh, idea. So the fact that uh, everyone is coming up with, with ideas, I think that's uh, good as well. I also uh, received a, a letter from the Restaurant Association, and there's a couple of things that uh, caught my eye that I would, I would certainly be asking the, the administration about, in particular, uh, in the case in this letter, that uh, the requirement that the, the 10 feet clear pedestrian travel way is the same requirement that must be met by sidewalk cafes and other and others who use public space for commercial purposes. So I'd like to e explore that uh, and ascertain whether or not it's just uh, uh, the trucky, the food trucks that are being singled out or if this is the law that, uh, yeah. that uh, others have to follow as, as well. I uh, also take note in the Restaurant Association's uh, letter, uh, it should be noted that other locations <coughs> that haven't uh, uh, created laws and regulations, a lot of them are more stringent than what the district government is, uh, is, is has put before us as well, and it's their uh, contention that even in those jurisdictions, uh, the food trucks have continued to flourish in other jurisdictions. So I wanted to put that all on the record and let everyone know I'm reading all the information that, that you uh, put forth, and uh, I think that we will have an opportunity to fashion something, if especially out of this hearing, if we get a lot of good ideas, we can find some common ground and see whether or not makes sense for the council just to vote this up or vote it down, or we can work with uh, our general counsel's office and introduce emergency legislation that provides us an opportunity to uh, amend the 2009 law that would give us the opportunity to fashion a nice uh, compromise. Uh, the regulations before us today includes provisions governing vending, licensure, and permits, vendor operations and locations, the destination of sidewalk and roadway vending locations, public markets, vending development zones, and solicitation from the public space. In addition, the proposed rulemaking amends the fee for a Class C business license and establishes a schedule of fines for vending business license civil fractions. The specific issues today surround the 23 mobile roadway vending zones that the regulations aim to create that would serve as areas where food trucks can sell meals between 10.30 a.m at 2.30 p.m. without parking meter time limits. Uh, I can't tell you, that, uh, when I read this, I was concerned that the regulations tend to indicate that uh, there would only be a minimum of three food trucks. And I do know uh, uh, operating downtown, at least in the Farragut Square area, is at least 23 to 25 uh, every day. But there's some clarity came out in the Post article today, and we'll be examining uh, that as well. Uh, also. Um, would let the government know uh, in the restaurant association's letter, I believe they said there was no uh, maximum number of trucks that could uh, operate, so I'll ask you about that as well. Mobile vendors seeking those spots would pay a $25 to enter a monthly lottery, and lottery winners would pay $150 per vehicle per month to park in the zones. Vendors will be allowed to sell meals in some areas outside those zones as long as they park in legal spots and abide by meter restrictions. But those trucks would have to be at least 500 feet from the vending zones. And in the central business district where the majority of the food trucks roam, there would have to be 10 feet of unstructured sidewalk adjacent to each truck. And I do know that's, that the uh, food truck industry, they have problems with those provisions. So today's roundtable, I hope to flesh out the pros and cons of these regulations and to learn how these regulations will impact business in the district for better or for worse. I want to thank you all for coming out today to participate in this process and to have your perspective added to this dialogue. I'm optimistic that common ground can be reached on the areas that are in dispute. And I would also note uh, that you know when you have a good settlement, no one gets what they want, but you get what you can live with. And so it's in that, in that vein, I would hope that we would all look to uh, what is reasonable and what we can accomplish here in the nation's capital and stay in the forefront of providing an environment uh, that really caters to uh, our customers, to our consumers. I can tell you, all those emails I've been receiving, I must receive about 10,000 emails. Uh, so people really love the food truck industry and they like the variety. 
And so, uh, you know, we need to take the consumers uh, uh, under consideration. But also, we receive emails about people desiring to park, and they feel like they're being pushed aside for the food trucks. So that's the interest that we have to take under consideration. As well as the, the Golden Triangle bid, uh, they have concerns about the, the trash, management of the lines, and things of that nature. So there are a number of interests that has to be taken under consideration, not just the brick and mortar restaurants and food trucks themselves, but there are a number of interests that have to be considered as we move forward to fashion a workable solution. I see uh, I've been joined by two of my colleagues. And at this time, I would like to uh, provide uh, the at-large council member, David Grosso, an opportunity uh, for an open statement. Mr. Grosso. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, uh, Chairman Orange, for convening this hearing. I think it's necessary and important that we hear from all the sides on what's going on here. Um, I've been involved in uh, these kinds of regulatory discussions now for a very long time. When I first joined the council as a staff member, I was working on the rewrite of the ABC laws for Council Member Sharon Ambrose. Um, so I think that um, I have good uh, perspective on what it takes to get to a point where everybody can live with a law or a regulation. Um, and now I don't think this is much different, you know, and, and ultimately um, it's not a question of uh, whether or not we do or don't regulate. It's a question of how well do we do it and how do we do it in a way that everyone can live with. Um, and in this situation, I have to say I've met with, uh, with all the sides, and I appreciate that. The government came in and met with me, the food trucks folks have come in and met with me, the restaurant association, everybody's met with me. Um, in a way that has helped me develop my opinions on this. I think I'll learn more today as we go forward. Um, I'll say from the outset, though, that I'm also concerned the fact that these regs can't be amended by the council. The council has, in my mind, a responsibility in these situations to be involved and be engaged, and sometimes down into the detail. Um, so um, that said, I, you know, I'm not inclined at this point to support these regulations because that's the only option I have in order to be engaged and involved in this. And so I was really pleased to hear you say, Chairman Orange, that you're looking at ways that we can be engaged in this and, and from a real productive manner. Because ultimately, we can't have um, Wild Wild West out there where people are fighting each other to get spots to sell their products. But we also can't have an overburdening regulatory structure that makes it impossible for entrepreneurs and innovators to get out there and, and you know sell their wares. Um, and, you know, all, you know, that I think I weigh a little bit heavier on the side of not having overburdened regulations because, uh, frankly speaking, we're the um, last on the list of business-friendly cities in this country, um, and that's an embarrassment to me every single time I think about it. And I'm just happy that uh, entrepreneurs like food trucks um, and other entities um, like Uber and other smart innovations like that are uh, coming to the district still in spite of the fact that we are hard to do business in this. And so... As a you know, legislature and a leader in this city, I feel an obligation to do what I can to help move our city to a better place where people feel welcome here and want to come here and do business. Um, that said, again, I'll reiterate, though, that these have to be fair, they have to be unambiguous, and they have to work for everybody. Um, and what I've heard from everyone is that 80 to 90 percent of these regulations do that, that people were working well together, that they were coming to the table to discuss these issues. And all I'm saying is maybe it takes the leadership of the council to move us to the next level. The responsibility we have is to take that opportunity and do it. So I'm looking forward to this hearing. I'm looking forward to hearing about, um, you know, how the uh, administration believes that they are answering the questions and concerns of the of the industry. And I'm, and I'm looking forward to hearing how the industry believes we can move forward and do a better job with what we're doing here. Ultimately, I think it would be best if we didn't have to hold another hearing uh, so it would be good if everybody could express their opinions now, get them out there, make sure we know what's going on, and perhaps then it makes it easier for the council when we have to amend these to do it quickly and maybe get it done before the summer recess, which I think is something we should shoot for uh, and encourage the committee to try to do that. Um, so with that, I'm looking forward to the testimony, and I want to thank everyone, I guess, just finally. Um, when we talk about being engaged in the government and being engaged in what's going on in the government, this is what it's all about, uh, whether it's uh, coming in and meeting with me, sending me letters, uh, uh, engaging me on Twitter or, you know, with emails. That's what I expect of people, and that's what I'm pleased to see every single day in this in this particular discussion. Um, the government's been open and willing to come in and meet with me and talk to me about it. 
uh, and, the, and the industry folks from whatever perspective have been open and willing to talk to me. The commitment I made when I ran for office is that I was going to be uh, open and listen and engage in every issue that mattered, and this is one of those times where you've made it easy for me to be informed and engaged by being engaged yourself. So uh, thank you for doing that, and I hope everyone continues to be engaged in the way they are now. Um, I am, for the first time in my short career, trending on Twitter. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Grosser. Now we have an open statement from the Ward 1 Council Member, Jim Graham. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm very anxious to hear the testimony, particularly from the government, but also from all of those who have taken the time to come down here. Do you know what this reminds me of? You know, I've been around Washington long enough to remember the debate over sidewalk cafes. And there are elements of that that remind me of this, because people were horribly concerned. I mean, they were, they were aghast at the thought that people would be sitting outside eating food, and there'd be dust, and there'd be fumes from the cars, and there'd be illness, there'd be litter. And I remember those arguments, because when I came to Washington to go to Georgetown University Law Center as a graduate fellow, um, there were no sidewalk cafes in Washington. And what, what is the element of that that reminds me of this? It's the vitality that comes with the food trucks, the vitality that comes with the sidewalk cafes is very similar because I think what we have seen the food truck vendors do in this city is bring a lot of excitement as well as satisfy a lot of appetites that heretofore were not being satisfied at least at the prices that were being charged. And some of these food truck vendors have gone into bricks and mortar, I think that's the term now, bricks and mortar restaurants. And so they have moved on to actually open restaurants and this has happened on 11th Street in Ward 1 and Georgia Avenue in Ward 1. And all of that is really contributory to, to, the, to the liveliness of a neighborhood. Uh, at the same time, i got to say, we've got to try to strike a balance. And I'm not sure that the mayor's regulations strike that balance. Uh, and and I, I, I heard what you said, uh, Mr. Chairman, about the notion of being able to amend regulations. This would be an ideal opportunity to, to attempt to to refashion some of these regulations. I'm not sure whether we can do that in midstream or not, but it's the type of thing that uh, we ought to consider. And I do appreciate what Mr. Grosso has said, which is that his options right now are to vote yes or no. And, and, and uh, so you either take it or you move it. But I think the people I represent are very excited about taking it from the food trucks. And they're very excited about having these opportunities in the neighborhoods. And I'm quite certain that we can find ways, whether in these regulations or some other path, to, to strike the right kind of balance so that our businesses are not hurt. I do want to say to those of you who are from here, from Adams Morgan and from U Street, um, and I know that I've heard from all of you, or many of you, uh, I think that you know, I'm listening to what you have to say. Uh, I don't want to suggest that I'm going to dismiss your points of view, but I think we should work together to get this area down. I think this has been a very exciting thing. And you remember when they put up the signs, Mr. Chairman? Pizza on 14th Street at Pennsylvania Avenue. Pizza by the slice. And there was such excitement in this building. That the notion that we could, that people could walk, I haven't been to it, I must confess. I did go by and say hello, but I haven't eaten the pizza. But people could just step outside the door and there was a really good meal in terms of pizza. So I know the excitement is palpable, it's contributing, and so I hope that we can move forward on this. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, uh, I'd like to thank uh, both my colleagues for the opening statement. Uh, once again, um, we do have a deadline. The deadline is June 22nd. And um, to my colleagues, especially uh, Ross, I would like to be in a position to take that opportunity away from you, go up or down fashion something by, by June 22nd. But I also want to caution uh, those that uh, would favor uh, the council being able to modify the, these regulations and alter them or delete some. Sometimes you have to be careful what you ask for because all of a sudden you're going to have 13 council members that are going to weigh in uh, and have their own ideas on how this should operate. So while I continue to hear that 80% of these regulations are good, uh, you know, it may not be what you want when you get the legislative body involved in this process and then us getting involved in this process and we sign off on it still has to go to the mayor 
the signature. So you just open it up to another entire process that you know you have not had to deal with uh, as, as we uh, have been going through this process. But I do think that there's a lot, a lot of common ground that I have heard from all sides. Hopefully through this hearing today, we'll be in a position to, to move forward uh, in, in, in one accord. But with that, I would like to now uh, welcome uh, the government's witness, uh, Nicholas Budget and Mr. Terry Bellamy. Mr. Budget is the director of the Department of Consumer Regulatory Affairs, and Mr. Bellamy is the director of the Department of Transportation. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, Chairperson Orange members and staff of the Committee on Business, Consumer, and Regulatory Affairs. I am Nicholas Majet, Director of the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. I'm joined by Terry Bellamy, Director of the Department of Transportation. As you know, DCRA issues and administers business licenses and DDOT regulates public space. Thus, both agencies work together to regulate vending in public space. Additionally, um, we are um, we're working with uh, William Howland, Director of the Department of Public Works, and staff from the Department of Health are here. We are here today to testify in support of proposed resolution 20-125 the Vending Business License Regulation Resolution of 2013. I should note at the outset that our journey to today's hearing has been a very long one. Since enactment by the Council of the Vending Regulation Act in October 2009, the District of Columbia government has promulgated four rounds of proposed rulemakings to regulate vending business licenses. June 25, 2010, January 20, 2012, October 5, 2012, and February 8, 2013. After each round of proposed rulemaking, we received extraordinary levels of public comments. To be fully transparent, we took the unprecedented step of posting on the DCA website every single public comment we received. My testimony will cover the main provisions of the proposed vending regulations and then focus on the specific types of vending and how they would benefit significantly under our proposal. If these proposed regulations did what some of the media has been reporting they would do, I can assure you that we would not be here today asking for your support. We support vending and particularly want to encourage more district residents to operate as vending entrepreneurs. We believe these proposed regulations would facilitate that goal. Currently, only about a third of all district licensed vendors are district residents. And based on the most recent information from the Office of Tax and Revenue, vending businesses contribute approximately $760,000 in annual sales tax revenue to the district. We believe enactment of these proposed regulations will allow for an increase in new vending businesses and will result in increased tax revenue from this potential growth industry. A, overall provisions of the proposed regulations. First, the proposed regulations clearly differentiate mm -hmm. between different forms of vending and whether the vendor is selling food or merchandise. There are specific requirements for sidewalk vendors, stationary roadway vendors, mobile roadway vendors, ice cream trucks, and farmers markets. This clear demarcation between different types of vending reflects the current business practices we see operating in the district. Second, the proposed regulations eliminate the current requirement that a vendor business license be issued only to a sole proprietorship. This will allow vendors to incorporate, create a limited liability company, partnership, or any other type of business entity and obtain business partners and raise capital for their business. This change in licensing is a significant investment that benefits vending entrepreneurs and promotes small and local business development. Third, the proposed regulations liberalize the current vendor's helpers provisions to allow an individual to work for more than one licensed vendor. 
This will encourage licensed vendors to hire multiple helpers and it will empower helpers to move around among different licensed vendors. Fourth, the proposed regulations make clear that the Department of Health's safe, food safety requirements apply to any licensed vendor selling food items. Finally, the proposed regulations establish a schedule of civil infraction fines for violations of the regulations and create an appeals process with the Office of Administrative Hearings. B, sidewalk vending. We currently have 299 licensed sidewalk vendors operating throughout the district selling both food and merchandise. In keeping with the requirements of the Vending Regulation Act, the proposed regulations grandfather long-time licensed vendors to their current sidewalk locations. Once the grandfathered licensed vendor gives up his or her vending license, the sidewalk location is reviewed to ensure compliance with the proposed regulations, vending location requirements such as distance from crosswalks, tree boxes, etc. We believe this will protect long-time licensed sidewalk vendors by legalizing their current locations as well as allowing the district to reassess these locations after the grandfather vendor is no longer operating. The proposed regulations also, also allow DDOT to eliminate a grandfathered sidewalk vending location if the lo current location is needed for a transportation related use but would provide the licensed sidewalk vendor an opportunity to identify a new potential sidewalk location subject to DDOT review and approval. If DDOT approves a new proposed sidewalk location, DCRA would issue the grandfathered vendor a new vending site permit for that location at no additional cost to the vendor. The proposed regulations clearly designate the legal sidewalk vending zones in commercial areas throughout the district and clearly set out the minimum distance requirements from fire hydrants, curbs, crosswalks, etc. To best allocate sidewalk vending locations, the proposed regulations create a bifurcated process. First, DCA will identify and propose sidewalk vending locations to DDOT for review and approval. These locations would then be subject to a lottery for licensed sidewalk vendors. Second, prospective vendors would be able to identify potential sidewalk vending locations they believe meet the minimum distance requirements and submit them to DCRA for DDOT review. If approved, the location will be assigned to the vendor who first identified it on a submitted complete vending site permit application. We believe this system will encourage entrepreneurs to do their own due diligence on areas they think would make su successful vending locations. This is how any brick and mortar business operates when choosing a location to lease and we believe it will work just as well for the vending businesses. A significant benefit of this bifurcated system is that it allows new sidewalk vending locations to be identified, reviewed, and approved as soon as the proposed vending regulations are enacted. The proposed regulations maintain the current business license fees for sidewalk vendors. $475 for a Class A uh, food, two-year license, and $410 for a Class B merchandise, two-year license. Additionally, the regulations establish a new annual vending site permit fee of $600 per sidewalk location. This fee reflects the cost of utilizing public space for a commercial purpose and the technological, administrative, and enforcement requirements for the issuance of vending site permits for each sidewalk vending location. Roadway vending. In addition to sidewalk vending, the district has issued vending licenses for several decades to roadway vendors that are parked on streets along the National Mall at Constitution Avenue and Independence Avenue and the Ellipse at 15th Street and 17th Street. We currently license 186 roadway vendors who participate in monthly lotteries conducted by the Metropolitan Police Department for 76 spaces. The proposed regulations classify these vendors as stationary roadway vendors to reflect the fact that they are required to stay at a single location rather than roaming throughout the district. Under the proposed regulations, we maintain the current number and 
current number and locations of these vending locations. But we will allow any licensed mobile roadway vendor to also compete in the monthly lottery for these locations. While the stationary roadway vendors traditionally offer mainly tourist fare, such as hot dogs, sodas, t-shirts, and souvenirs, by opening the monthly lottery to new vending businesses, we believe the additional competition will help increase the quality and diversity of offerings and will better serve a very large customer base of visitors. Although the proposed regulations maintain the current business license fees at the same rates as for sidewalk vendors, they institute a new monthly vending site permit fee of $450 per stationary roadway location. This fee reflects the equivalent cost of weekly parking meter fees per location. Pu public market managers and solicitors. To deal with the significant increase in farmers' markets operating in the district, the proposed regulations create a new license category for public market managers. The market managers would be responsible for ensuring that all farmers public market vendors comply with applicable district requirements, particularly with the Department of Health Food Safety Code. Additionally, the proposed regulations would exempt this um, would exempt individual farmers public market vendors from licensure requirements. We believe this will encourage more vendors to participate in public markets, including new types of public markets vendors, such as sellers of antiques, artwork, and other locally made merchandise. This will benefit district consumers by expanding the types of, of goods offered for sale, as well as providing consumers with more locally grown and sustainable food options, which is one of the key items in the Mayor's Sustainable DC Initiative. The proposed regulations maintain the current license provisions for solicitors, but make significant modifications that will substantially benefit the district's tourism industry. We currently have six licensed solicitors and are proposing that employees of licensed sightseeing tour companies be able to offer tickets for sale within 10 feet of sightseeing tour bus stops that are permitted by DDOT. Currently, such ticket sales are allowed only at a physical storefront. But with the increasing use of handheld technology, tickets can be bought and issued completely electronically, thereby negating the need for a physical storefront presence. By broadening the allowable ticket sales activity, we believe this will encourage more tourism in the district by making it far easier for visitors to purchase tour tickets. And of course, each sightseeing tour ticket sold translates into an increase in district sales taxes collected from visitors spending money at district businesses. Mobile roadway vending and food trucks. Perhaps the most discussed provisions of the proposed regulations are those governing mobile roadway vending. These provisions would regulate all types of mobile vending, including food trucks, while also authorizing new mobile services and merchandise businesses. Let me make one thing absolutely clear. Mayor Gray strongly supports the creative and innovative food options that food trucks offer to district consumers. There's absolutely no plan, desire, hope, or wish by this administration to have food trucks banned from operating in the District of Columbia. District consumers enjoy a very robust offering of food trucks and we are very supportive of the hardworking entrepreneurs that run food trucks. They can serve as great, as great culinary incubators as well as allow established restaurants to branch out into new markets. Over the course of the last year, staff from both DDOT and DCRA, as well as from the Executive Office of the Mayor, have reached out and met repeatedly with food truck business representatives. This administration will not ban food trucks from operating in the district. DDOT has had multiple meetings with the leadership of the Food Truck Association, including an October meeting attended by approximately 70 food truck business operators to answer the questions about the proposed regulations and to ask for their assistance in developing regulations that met their business needs, as well as DDOT's responsibility to manage the use of public space. 
BCLA staff has also met repeatedly with the leadership of the Food Truck Association, including as recently as yesterday, to discuss the proposed regulations, as well as respond to concerns about the impact of the proposed regulations on the food truck business model. This administration has been more than willing to talk and listen to the food truck business owners. We have heard some assertions that food truck operate outside the scope of the district's food safety and health codes. Let me assure you that is absolutely not the case. The Department of Health conducts regular, unannounced health inspections of food trucks, just as they do for restaurants. Every food truck is held to the same food handling and storage requirements as restaurants. In fact, we would not issue a license to a food truck unless it passes a joint inspection conducted by DCRA, the fire marshal, and the Department of Health. Additionally, anyone on a food truck that is handling food must have a food handler certificate issued by the Department of Health. Since the arrival of the first Fulgerville Brothers food truck in the early, 2000, uh, early 2009, we have seen an explosion of new food trucks. But these food trucks operate under antiquated 30-year regulations that treat them as neighborhood roaming ice cream trucks. Under the ice cream rule, food trucks are required to keep moving until they are flagged down by a customer and may only remain at a location so long as they have a waiting line of customers. Once their line of customers has been served and leaves, the trucks are required to move to a new location. These outdated requirements simply do not make sense when applied to food trucks, most of whom need, to, need time to prepare their food before they begin vending or any other types of mobile vendors. And that is why the proposed regulations create a set of rules more suited to modern mobile vending businesses. We propose to eliminate the ice cream truck rule for food trucks and provide them with two options. First, food trucks would be able to park at any legal parking spot that has a minimum of 10 feet of adjacent unobstructed sidewalk paying the parking meter and remain at the location for the amount of time allowed by the parking meter. What this means is that if a meter allows two hours of parking, the food truck can pay for two hours and then must move at the end of the time, feeding the meter is prohibited by law. Second, food trucks could choose to vend in a designated mobile roadway vending location. Under this option, DCA with DDOT participation would propose MRV locations in commercial areas. Each MRV location could have a minimum, and I need to emphasize the word minimum, of three food trucks. In other words, a MRV location could not be established for only a single vehicle. DDOT would install signs indicating that the MRV locations are reserved for the exclusive use of mobile vendors on weekdays between 10.30 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. Once a MRV location is created, no other food trucks would be allowed to park and vend within 500 feet of the designated MRV location unless they are located in another MRV location. In the proposed locations, proposed regulations, we identified some 20 potential MRV locations in prime downtown areas currently served by food trucks. We have worked with DDOT to evaluate each of those locations and have come up with parking spaces for approximately 180 mobile vending vehicles. The map attached at the end of, the of my testimony shows the potential MRV locations in the downtown commercial areas, as well as how many vehicles could be located at each MRV location. As you can see from the map, this is a far larger number of food trucks that would be able to vend from MRV locations than some of the hyperbole we've seen in the media. For those watching at home or who don't have easy access to the attached map, those 20 potential MRV locations and parking spaces for food trucks include Fairgus Square West, 10 spaces, Fairgus Square East, 9 spaces, McPherson Square, 13 spaces, Franklin Square, 13 spaces, Metro Center North, 6 spaces, Metro Center South, 3 spaces, Union Station, 15 spaces, Chinatown, 5 spaces, Federal Aviation Administration West, 14 spaces, Federal Aviation 
Administration South, 10 spaces. Federal Center, Center Southwest, 11 spaces. LaFont Promenade, 12 spaces. Naval Yard, 12 spaces. Judiciary Square, 6 spaces. Noma, 4 spaces. George Washington University, 3 spaces. U.S. Housing and Urban Development, 6 spaces. Southwest Waterfront, 4 spaces. Virginia Avenue Northwest Westbound, 13 spaces. And Virginia Avenue Northwest Eastbound, 11 spaces. As you can see from the list, just these 20 potential MRV locations alone would contain exclusive four-hour parking spaces for 180 food trucks. Access to a spot in a MRV location would be by a draft-style lottery conducted by DCRA open to all licensed vendors based on the vendor's preferences and does designed to ensure that all vendors have equal opportunity to vend at prime downtown commercial locations. The proposed regulations create a monthly lottery per MRV location per day of the week. For example, in a potential Franklin Square MRV location with spots for 13 food trucks, we will conduct a lottery for each spot for each day of the week. The lottery will be held electronically with the results posted immediately. It is the same system we have been using very successfully for several years to assign sidewalk vending locations around National Park Stadium as well as being used during the 2009 and 2013 presidential inaugurations. The proposed regulations create a 500-foot radius around a designated MRV location where no other food trucks could park and vend. Because food trucks participating in the MRV location would be paying a monthly $100, $150 fee to park at the MRV locations, this requirement prevents additional food trucks from setting up just outside the MRV location, paying no monthly fee, benefiting from the crowds attracted to the food trucks that were assigned to the MRV location, and upsetting the public space management balance the MRV location was designed to achieve. We also note the concern about the requirement that there be 10 feet of an adjacent unobstructed sidewalk space for food trucks that choose to park outside the MRV locations. The DDOT standard width for sidewalks in the downtown area is a minimum of 16 feet with a six foot planting area. Most, if not all, the sidewalks in the downtown area are greater than 10 feet in width. An obstruction is considered an impermeable structure such as a sidewalk cafe, bench, occupied bike rack, concrete planter, or retaining wall. A permeable or point obstruction such as a parking meter or tree box is not considered an obstruction as it only briefly obstructs the path of travel. Therefore, a food truck would be able to park adjacent to a 10-foot wide sidewalk even if there is a parking meter or tree box at the location. Attached to my testimony are several PowerPoint slides that illustrate how a single stretch of sidewalk can have varying widths and, and objects. On the widely circulated and very misleading map distributed by the Food Truck Association, the entire block would be shown as being entirely off limits to food truck vending. In reality, however, that is clearly not the case. Only in the area that is less than 10 feet wide would food trucks not be allowed to vend. They could, however, park and vend in, legal, in a legal parking space a short distance down the same block where the sidewalk is 16 feet wide. We believe that MRV locations will greatly benefit food trucks by, by allowing them to park for four hours each day with no risk of receiving parking tickets. It will be a significant change from the current regulatory requirement that prohibits food trucks from staying at any location without a line of waiting customers. While we understand the concerns about the proposal, it will not have anywhere near the apocalyptic apocalyptic impact on food trucks that we've seen bandied about in some media reports. Quite the contrary, we think these regulations will assist food trucks and improve their business opportunities, providing clear operating requirements. 
Without these regulations, the current stiff competition for prime locations will continue and escalate further as more food truck operators are licensed. What we often see occurring are food trucks employees or family members parking their personal vehicles, vehicles at prime locations, often beginning very early in the morning in order to claim the space. These personal vehicles are often parked illegally during rush hour and regularly block lanes as they jockey with the food trucks for these highly sought after curbside locations. Food truck operators currently focus a tremendous amount of time and energy on figuring out ways to get prime locations, evade the two-hour parking limits, and avoid parking tickets. It is worth noting that according to parking enforcement data from the Department of Public Works, Food trucks received more than $100,000 in parking tickets in 2012 and thus far in 2013. This is an incredibly significant cost to these small businesses and simply is not financially sustainable for them. We believe that food truck operators can better spend their time and energy running their businesses and providing services to customers rather than playing a game of cat and mouse with parking enforcement officers. Some are strongly advocating that the proposed regulation be rejected and that we all go back to the drawing board. Let me be very clear that if these proposed regulations are not approved and the district government was to strictly enforce the current laws and requirements for food trucks, laws that we believe each food truck would concede they're violating every single day, that would have a drastic and immediate impact on the district vibrant food truck industry. Conclusion. We strongly support enactment of these proposed regulations so that there is a clear regulatory framework for vending in the District of Columbia. We commit ourselves to ensuring vending business entrepreneurs can operate safely and legally and are willing to revisit provisions of these proposed regulations if, once implemented, they appear to not work as effectively as we envision. Chairperson Orange, thank you for the opportunity to testify on PR 20-125. Director Bellamy and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Uh, let's set the clock at uh, 10 minutes. We'll do two rounds. Uh, Mr. Majette, Mr. Bellamy, thank you very much for your uh, testimony yeah. here today. Um, Mr. Majette, let me begin where you end, ended here. You, you stated... Let me be very clear that if these proposed regulations are not approved and the district government was to strictly enforce the current laws and requirements for food trucks, laws that we believe each food truck would concede they are violating every single day, that would have a drastic and immediate impact on the district's vibrant food truck industry. Can you uh, elaborate upon on what's being violated every single day? If, the current law as it exists if we uh, were to, uh, I guess, enforce that, uh, what are we talking about here? Okay. Well, first of all, Council, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask my vending coordinator to join me, Vincent Parker. Sure. Okay. Uh, with respect to your question, currently there are no specific laws for uh, mobile vendors. So the most applicable rule is the ice cream rule. That rule requires that a, a truck only stopped if flagged down by a customer, and once they complete the transaction of that customer or any other customers who may also approach the truck, they must then leave that site. So currently, there, since there are no specific regulations for mobile food vendors, we have to apply the ice cream truck rule, which we, we, we're not, we haven't applied because we anticipated regulations that would specifically regulate them. Okay, but are you saying, in, in, in essence, though, if these regulations are not improved, that uh, the executive is prepared to enforce the laws as written and that uh, the food trucks would not be allowed in those locations that they're in now because they would be, uh, they cannot be in compliance with ice cream uh, trucks? Is, is that what we're saying? Well, what I'm saying is we get as many emails as you get from brick and mortar uh, stores. Um, and others who complain that the food trucks are violating the current law. And our response is we're working on proposed regulations, um, and in the meantime, we have not specifically enforced the ice cream truck rule. However, you know, at some point, I mean, 
with the complaints we receive and so forth, they, they, I mean, there may be a time where we have to enforce the, the law. Okay, and so in enforcing the law, let's, let's assume right now we're down in Farragut Square, uh, and you have to enforce the law. What does that mean? Most of those vendors will be not in compliance with the current law. And so they will be told to, to move on? Correct. Okay. And, uh, and under the current law, if you don't have a customer, then you must move on. If you don't have a line, you must move on. Correct. And actually it's more or less customer driven because the customer has to waive you. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And, uh, and once again, that's what the executive is prepared to do if these regulations are not approved? Well, what I'm saying is, I'm not saying not, I'm saying you, we, we have to enforce the law and there is some discretion um, in enforcing the law and because of the demand for food trucks, I mean, obviously there's a big demand from the, the uh, citizens and, and visitors to the District of Columbia for food trucks. We sort of uh, held off in enforcing the law, uh, knowing that new regulations would be implemented and approved by the council. It's taken us a lot longer than we expected, but we thought by now we'd have a set of regulations that we could enforce. Okay. Uh, l let me talk about the, uh, what you've put forth today. Uh, approximately 180 mobile vending vehicles would be able to operate in prime locations? Correct. Uh, correct. What is the total universe of the food trucks in the District of Columbia right now? Uh, go ahead. ahead. Councilman Orange, there's approximately Please just state your name for the record. I'm Vincent Parker, the vending manager for DCRA. Okay. There are approximately 200 food trucks currently operating in the district uh, with vending licenses. On the average day, it's closer to 100 or 120 in the city, sir. Okay. So, so un un under your scenario here, then all the food trucks that are operating, uh, in the city right now would have an opportunity if they desire to operate in prime locations. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Now, um, it's my understanding that this information just came out yesterday. <coughs> have you had an opportunity to share this with the food truck uh, industry? Yes, sir. Um, since the initial plan was drafted, um, we've been in communication with the Food Truck Association um, and ind individual operators as well and have advised them that the plan was never to limit the number or decrease the number. The plan was always to maintain similar numbers that they currently have in the areas where they vend. Okay. Well, up until, uh, you know, this article came out and I've had several uh, meetings uh, with food truck industries folks as well, uh, they never came to the table with the idea that there were 180 locations that they, that they could could utilize, and I would say based on on, on today's article, where um, Mr. Pavich is indicating, okay, well, put that in writing, put that in, in the regulations, that that could have served as an opportunity for us to, uh, you know, perhaps be on, on the same page. So it seems as though they're saying this just came forward. Uh, yes, sir. We um the spaces were required to be. Uh, in compliance with the regulations as far as distance requirements from fire hydrants, crosswalks, um, and those measurements uh, and those requirements were required to be uh, coordinated after between DDOT and DCRA to establish these areas. Um, once the regulations were proposed, um, we met with the Food Truck Association, um, and then we also began working with the Department of Transportation to go out and evaluate these areas that we proposed to establish the exact area where they'll, where they'll be located and how many trucks will be in each location. Okay. Now, these 180 uh, locations, so they meet all the criteria of, of your proposed regulations. That is, they meet the 10-foot the, the rule? Sir, in the MRV locations, the 10-foot rule is not a requirement. These are the designated areas. So that's a provision that is not um, in these proposed regulations that are mobile roadway vending locations do not require that 10-foot rule, um, albeit most of the locations do comply with the 10-foot rule as applied by DDOT. Um, most, if not all, I believe, comply with the 10-foot rule, but it's not a requirement that they do. Okay. Then, then why does this, this re requirement even exist? I mean, if you're going to re require, if you're saying that in the, in the prime locations that are downtown where there's a, a overcrowding of people all the time, and that's where all our tourists go. And you're saying that uh, the 10-foot the rule doesn't apply in the MRV. However, outside the MRV, it, it requires. I don't see the rationale for a 10-foot rule. Right. The, the uh, Department of Transportation uh, standardly applies the 10-foot rule, and they can speak to the reasoning or the, um, the implications of the 10-foot rule 
in an MRV location as opposed to outside an MRV location. Okay, okay well, someone can speak to that. I, and, and let me put the question like this. Why, why are we discriminating? Why in, right. why in the MRV the 10-foot rule doesn't apply where there are going to be more people? Right. And, and clearly uh, that's where... Uh, you know, all the interest is, uh, even for those that, that, that want to sell their, their goods, uh, they want to be in that area, and yet outside the area where there's less traffic, it's going to be harder to, to compete and get business, uh, you have a 10-foot rule. That doesn't add up. Could somebody speak to that? From DCRI's point of view, in the MRV locations, we have the ability to assist because those are locations that we work to establish with line queue monitors, um, deploy staff to ensure that pedestrians can access the sidewalk um, in the MRV locations, which will be designated. Um, outside of the MRV locations, the trucks have the ability to go all over the city in various locations where these types of uh, safeguards may not be as easily implemented as far as line queue monitors um, or staff deployment to maintain a pedestrian well if you had the if you had the choice of getting your getting these uh, regulations approved uh, if the 10-foot rule was eliminated which what would be your choice um, and let me ask out of mr. Majette and mr. Bellamy yeah. yes one of the things that we look for in the 10-foot rule I, I think um, councilman Graham uh, noted the sidewalk cafe at the time when we started looking at the public space and because of the various users we were trying to we try to in each case identify a clear zone that pedestrians may be with a, a baby carriage or a um, um, person with disability would be able to move through that section so in the DM, in the the zone that we identified, the 180 spaces, um, the DDoS staff actually went out and looked at these locations and predetermined the, the clear zone at those 180 spaces. So in creating those zones, um, we did do due diligence to go look at. But if there was a move by vendor, uh, what this new regulation gives them the opportunity uh, to go out and identify potential space that they may want to use using those standards and when they make permits we would then go and look and make sure that they it has the the, the clear space okay well mr Bennett, I'm, 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 a, I'm a bit confused because you you said in the mrv area that there's clear space but we already know that the 10-foot rule does not apply in the mrv correct but what we're saying in that Space and those locations that's shown on the map. Staff has gone and looked at those locations, and that's why they're identified on the map. Okay. Well, uh, my time is just about up. Can you uh, at least uh, designate and submit to the committee those of those 180 locations, uh, which ones violate the 10-foot rule? Uh, yes, sir. Pursuant to your regulations. Now, uh, my other question is, what, what is the rationale for uh, the 500 feet uh, uh, rule that if you're in the MRV location, then anyone outside of that is subject to the 500 feet rule? And, and I do note that, Mr. Majette, you said for the record that uh, basically uh, f folks that operate, say, five feet outside the MRV can, zone can, uh, would benefit from the MRV zone because they'll be in close proximity and not paying the monthly fees and, and, and things things of, of that nature. Uh, but other than that, if if the food truck industry isn't complaining about it, then why should we be? If the food truck industry is not yeah, complaining? If, if they're not complaining about uh, the fact that their folks in, within the MRV has to pay the fees mm. and then outside the MRV uh, th th they're not complaining that, hey, well, this person may operate five feet outside the MRV, so why are we complaining? I mean, you, you stated all the reasons why the 500-foot rule exists, but you were given reasons for basically the food truck industry. What, what, are, the, what are the government's reasons for wanting to have the 500-foot rule? Well, because the person who didn't win the lottery and, and wasn't specifically assigned to the MRV location 
would have an unfair advantage over the person who paid the fee. So the person who didn't get that location in the MRV zone, let's say he's right outside the zone and starts vending, he's at a he, get, he has an advantage, an unfair advantage over the person who paid the fee and was specifically assigned to the MRV zone. But that's that's a, a food truck argument. I mean, what, what's the government's argument? I mean, you're making the case for someone that's that's actually utilizing the, the truck, and if they're not making that 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 argument, then why should we be making the argument? So, other than that particular mm -hmm. argument, yeah. why do we have a 500 foot rule? Councilmember Orange, um, it's been determined um, through history uh, that the mobile vending population is very creative when it comes to parking. Uh, Tactics, um, and we feel, um, and it's it's been somewhat confirmed through current um, parking situation that the parking vendors, the problems that are in the MRV locations now, would be relocated just outside of the MRV locations to adjacent streets or uh, near streets in the vicinity, um, without some sort of distance requirement to ensure that because the areas of the MRV locations are established um, as popular food truck areas. So for example, in the Metro Center area, uh, Trucks Park currently on 12th Street, all of the issues regarding parking and traffic control would then be just relocated to G Street corridor, still uh, not addressing the public safety and public space concerns uh, that the vendors contribute to on 12th Street. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll follow up on my next one. Uh, Mr. Grosso? Thank you, um, and good afternoon. Absolutely. Thanks for coming down on this. Um, I also have some questions around just uh, the issues around ambiguity in regulations. You know, every every regulation can't be completely strict and say this is exactly what we're going to do. Um, uh, but there needs to be some certainty when you're doing business and some certainty around regulations that give you some comfort that when you engage in an activity, you are within compliance. Um, uh, so can you just talk a little bit about First, your philosophy on that, and I think Mr. Bellamy and, and Mr. Majette, if you guys could, could reflect on that for just one second, around what does it mean to leave space? My fear is that, and let me just give you an example so you can reflect on it. Let's say uh, we, we put these uh, regs into place and there's this clear ambiguity um, in them, and then we're moving forward in three or four years and you have a uh, fairly, uh, well, a new administration, a new directors in your seats, um, and then you have a wild food truck situation where somebody's doing stuff in their food truck that nobody supports. Uh, the public gets wind of this. You know, I won't do examples of what it could be, but you can imagine. Mm -hmm. The public gets wind of this. The new director then is faced with pressure from the public to engage um, in some stronger enforcement on these things. The ambiguity in this um, leads, I think, people to be fearful that then everything will be clamped down and you'll get down to the minimums and what was growing and good and interesting is then punished based on one bad actor. Um, and I think, you know, there's examples in history when this happened. Can you just reflect on how does that not happen? Well, I think we talked about uh, interpret, interpreting the regulations. The, uh, usually the agency that enforces the regulations is given deference into, in terms of how it, it, it interprets the regulations. I think if we had a history of implementing the regulations, the food industry knows what it is, the public knows what it is, the agency knows what it is, and a new director comes in and wants to change all that, I don't think that could happen without actually amending the regulations. But now, the if there's, now, if there's ambiguity there to begin with, and your interpretation is, for example, three is the number of minimum, you know, the minimum number in your mind. Right. So your interpretation and what I've heard from your staffs is that uh, that could be as many as 20 or so, right? And that, that's just to give a floor of where we're trying to work from. Your interpretation might be what your staff is saying today, 20 or 25 is possible. But that wouldn't change legislative. You wouldn't need to change the regulations down in five years, 10 years when you have a weird situation mm -hmm. for somebody to then say, well, actually, no, it's three, and put out of business half of the industry. Right. Well, if the, if the government's, uh, if the agency's interpretation of that statute is X, it would be hard for a new director to come in and say it's now why, because that's, the, that's become the established interpretation of that statute, and you just can't arbitrarily and capriciously change the agency's interpretation that's of that statute. Point. Yeah. So what, what about uh, you, Mr. Bellamy? What is your interpretation of this? I, I, I agree with uh, Director uh, Majette. It sets a minimum and, and not a 
the minimum is established. If you use that example as three, we know that that's the minimum. It does not say that that's the, the, the maximum, but that is the minimum. The other piece that I think is important is, is that what we're attempting to do is to allow the, the balance the balance on the, the public space of the parking area through this regulation. So it does allow um, uh, flexibility and balance to make sure that whatever business come in that space that may change the, the use in five years, it still allow balance for the use of that public space. Okay, so um, you can understand my problem here with this. You know, I, you know, I don't know what the magic number is. I don't really you know, pretend to be the expert in this. I'm assuming that when you guys wrote these and when you studied these that you are the experts on this. Unfortunately, sometimes experts in the government don't always align with usage and with the people that are out there using it. So you can understand with the uproar that we've gotten over this that clearly there is a disconnect between the people that are actually doing it and the people that are trying to write these regs. Um, my fear is that we get too far down the line here and we have this kind of rigid or ambiguous, whichever side, that you'll have a bad interpretation and then ultimately it could be changed on a whim and then you stymie the, the, the potential for positive business entrepreneurs. Um, I want to ask a question about the, the 10 foot rule. I, you know, I've walked around this city a lot. I've been impeded by people in line going to a food truck. It is just a reality. If you go down there and you see people waiting in line, um, I do not believe, though, that setting a 10-foot hardcore rule like this is going to solve that problem. I think what solves that problem is um, the, the people that are engaged in these lines learning how to line up properly, the people that are selling food to them, teaching them how to do that, and then ultimately the government saying, okay, this is how we're going to do it from now on. Um, so I guess if you could just answer me a couple questions on this 10-foot rule. Where has this been done before? In what jurisdiction, in what city, in what state, in what country have we established a 10-foot rule for vending from a sidewalk to um, wherever this goes? Mr. Bellamy? I got Sam Zimbabwe. He's going to answer this question. Sam Zimbabwe, Associate Director for Policy and Planning at, at DDOT. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if any other jurisdiction has set the precise 10-foot uh, there, are, there are some, and we have a table here included with okay. the testimony. Okay, has, okay. That, thank you. That has, 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 that's all I wanted to know. Has, has DCRA or DDOT ever enforced a rule like this, where you went out and you said, with your tape measure, this ain't going to work, this is going to work on the fly? On um, a food truck? So, on anything. So um, on our sidewalk cafe, and on, on many of our regulations, and including the, the sidewalk uh, vendors that are covered by these regulations, there is a 10-foot rule. The difference here is that there is, with, with those uses of public space, there is a permit application for a specific location where we have set regulations. The, the applicant determines, you know, d decides they are in compliance with those regulations, submits a permit application. There's a site visit. There's a, a m ensuring that, that the location is in compliance with the regulations. Okay. That would obviously be a very onerous process for any food truck to uh, to establish a location outside of one of these mobile vending locations. Uh, we don't want to create that burden on people, but we do want to create something that's consistent with our other treatments of public space. So it's sort of like a, a self a self assessment of is this place a reasonable place to, right. to to do this that would be consistent with our other approaches to sidewalk vending, sidewalk so currently cafe. when like somebody that. wants a public space permit for an outdoor, outdoor cafe, there's a 10-foot rule that says that you can only go up to a certain spot, but then that's fairly permanent structure there. Right. And there's and discretion, so and, the, and, the, and it could be that there's a public time. space committee that that, you know, there's, there's some discretion in there that, that can reduce that in a place that doesn't have heavy pedestrian traffic, that, that oh, is I a little see, bit, that, you know, where, where there's a reason to do so. But that's it, impossible to do an, an on-the-fly, you know, so pull up and right. conduct business. So yeah. your concept then is to create a, a pre-approved, so to speak, spots around the city. Right. And the question then becomes, is my map the right one or your map the right one? Um, you came out with a map. Uh, basically yesterday, the day before, saying here's what we think, it's 150 or 180 spots. Um, other folks have put out maps that they think is different. Um, there, I think, I think it really begs the question then, uh, why is there ambiguity in that? Why do some people feel like it's one thing and other people feel it's another thing? Maybe because it's new. 
Uh, maybe it's the time we need is to really go out there with the with the industry and walk the streets and say this is exactly where you can be and where you can't be. Maybe that's necessary to invest that time. But also, I wonder one last question on this: the, the what do you do if things change? You know, you talk about a a, a flower box, a m parking meter are not really involved in this, but yet then something else is. How do you embrace? You know, how do you change so you know like quickly? So. For example, I can picture somebody out there being enforced upon when they've parked somewhere, and then you guys say that's not a legitimate spot, but they say, hey, I've done this legitimately in accordance with the 10-foot rule. What do you do? How do, do we go to court over this stuff? Or how do we figure this out in a way that continues to encourage people to sell their stuff where people want their stuff? Has this been contemplated? Um, well. If there's um, a challenge, they have recourse with our Office of Administrative Hearing. Mm. So it would take a while. Well, I mean, it could take a while. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't mind it taking a while. I'm just saying. It doesn't change like that. It's not like somebody could be like, yes, yeah, sweet, they removed that. Or, for example, in the wintertime, restaurants, well, I guess you don't really do as much in the Well, maybe you do. In the wintertime, restaurants don't have outdoor cafes, right? So that would change that rule pretty fluidly right then. I mean, you would be no. like, okay, they moved all their stuff inside. They're not eating outside. That 10 foot now is expanded, you know, allowed us to be there. That could possibly yeah. happen, especially, well, this is a good good climate. I mean, you could do food trucks all year. Right? Yeah, one, one of the things that we find kind of interesting is, is that the inspectors that go out and, and enforce actually work with the vendors. If we look at the, the sidewalk cafes, that's one that we get a lot of questions on. We'll actually send inspectors out there to measure and work with the business on it. We don't just come out there and write a citation. We do a period of cure. Okay. And I just have one more thought before the end of my round, if I might, Mr. Orange, Chairman Orange. Um, I'm very disturbed by the comments that you made in your, in your and I don't know why it's just, well, <laughs> It seems like you weren't enforcing the rule around ice cream truck stuff, and now you're saying that if we don't pass this, you're going to enforce it. It seems like a pretty direct kind of, you know, you better do this or else situation, and I don't appreciate that very much. I, and I know that you're not intending that, but it sounds that way to me. And um, I, I would argue that if you all of a sudden started enforcing the rules that you weren't enforcing before, that there would be a bigger firestorm in this city than you've ever seen before, and that we really shouldn't go down that path with this and that instead we should continue to try to be at the table continue to try to work this through recognizing that there may need to be a disapproval by the council here but that that shouldn't necessarily trigger you going out there you know with uh, the paddy wagon and arresting all of these food truck operators and that's just not the way we're going to do business so I, I'm, I'm afraid that you know I'm being kind of direct that's unfortunately the way I am but you know I just don't see that as a solution so I, my round is over I'm, I'm happy if it's okay to hear a response if that's okay with the chairman but yeah. I just want to put that on the record well the, the intent wasn't meant as a threat by no means the intent was in fact some of the complaints we get are from the council members why aren't you enforcing the law citizens complain brick and mortar restaurants complain they sent uh, emails to council members and the council members ask us why aren't you enforcing the law our response is we're drafting regulations uh, we want to be fair there's a big need and demand for the food truck so we don't want to hurt their business until we can get regulations. So it's certainly not meant as, an, as, as a threat at all. It was actually in, in response to the numerous complaints we get as to why we are not enforcing the law. So that's, that, that, that was my... And for the record, I mean, I think your answer to why you weren't doing it was good. Uh, but I don't think that time is over yet. We're still in deliberation, right? I mean, no, you said we were waiting for something to come out. Well, absolutely. I say... Let's hold on here. We might have to disapprove these in order to make them better, and so let's just continue to work and stay at the table to get that to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Grant. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think the starting point on this for me is to just determine what is the fundamental purpose that we're trying to achieve. And I do want to acknowledge, Mr. Majette, you know this as well as anyone. Mr. Bellamy, you know this as well as anyone. This is the longest running movie in the D.C. Council. I mean, when, when I was chairman of this committee, I don't know how many years ago it was, this was a red-hot issue then. It's a red-hot issue today. I mean, we, we did some things. We did remove the moratorium because for years we had a moratorium in any new vending licenses. 
But we've had a real struggle in terms of getting, getting our arms around this issue. In part, I think, because of the complexity of the interests. And, but also in part because I think that uh, it's just, you know, very much different today than it was then. You know, me referring to 2004, this is not 2004, this is 2013, and there's a whole new vital contributing industry that has occurred and is demanding the opportunity to vend. And so we didn't have this in 2004. We didn't have no vending trucks in 2004. We had vending trucks, but they were all in the mall, and they were all just selling hot dogs and mustard. Uh, I don't have anything against hot dogs and mustard. I don't eat hot dogs, but you know, I'm sure some of you do. I, I can just tell. But anyway, <laughs> you, you, begin, you begin by, no, I encourage people to not eat any meat or poultry, but that's another matter. You begin with this statement in your testimony, and, and Director Majed, I really feel for you once again on this, and, and I really do, so don't think I'm being unsympathetic when I ask these questions. But you begin by saying, we believe an enactment of these proposed regulations will allow for an increase in new vending businesses. New vending businesses increase, and will result in increased sales tax revenue from this potential growth industry. Do you have any data to support those conclusions? I don't have any data, but I, I can tell you from potential businesses who want to do a vending business, a mobile vending business, but are afraid to do so because there are no regulations and they're afraid that we're going to enforce the ice cream truck rule. So they're waiting, they're, they're waiting to start the business once the regulations have been passed. I don't have any data in terms of how many more trucks would come into play and how much revenue that would bring. See, I think having been on this council and been involved in business regulation, uh, for my entire current tenure on the council, mm -hmm. is that one of the things that you hear again and again and again from the business segment, and this includes the Chamber of Commerce and others and the Restaurant Association, is there's an effort to determine what is the impact going to be on our business. Mm -hmm. And it's a very fair question. And sometimes um, uh, the result is something I disagree with, but it's a very fair question to ask. And why is it that you have not conducted a real impact statement, a real impact analysis on how this will affect this, this burgeoning new uh, enterprise? And you should have done that. You made a study on how the mobile vendors would impact the brick and mortar business? No, well, although that could very definitely be part of it, but we, we know a good deal more about that. I mean, that's the classic case, you know. We've talked about many, many times where somebody is selling CDs in front of a CD shop and mm. they're brick and mortar, they're paying electric bills, they're paying mortgages or rents mm. or whatever. Uh, that's the classic case. But I think since you have an emerging enterprise mm. with a lot of vitality, as I said earlier, it would seem to me that it is the duty of this government to determine how a particular set of rules will impact them, whether it be adverse, neutral, or positive. And a lot of people in this room believe, and, and it's hard not to believe from these proposed rules, that, that this is meant as a restriction, that one of the purposes that you all had in mind was res to restrict this new industry mm -hmm. in some fashion. But yet you don't, you don't list that as one of your objectives. Well, because I wasn't one of them. An objective wasn't to restrict, it was to regulate and to level the playing fields. Everybody was playing by the same rules. Right, but, but, Nick. You know, <laughs> you can, if I call you Nick, you can certainly call me Jim, everybody else does. But, you know, clearly the, the, the thrust of, of some of these rules is to, is to limit or eliminate food vending trucks in certain areas. I mean, let me say, I don't know how many Adams Morgan people I have here today, but we know in the rules there's no vending food trucks in Adams Morgan. We note in the rules that there's no vending food trucks west of 7th Street on U Street. Mm -hmm. Now, to those businesses, Ben's Chili Bowl comes to mind. I don't think they would want someone selling chili dogs in front of their establishment. But this whole swath of Ward 1, you know, our, our enterprise zone, our business area, is not included. And so that would suggest to me that that's a restriction. Whatever your side, I mean, in, in New Street, there's not a 10-foot sidewalk area, probably in most areas, but in Adams Morgan there is. But it suggests to me that there is an attention to limit the number of businesses. Now, 
There may be a justification for that, but I think the first step is to say, yes, we mean to not just regulate, we mean to restrict business operations in certain ways. And here's why we want to do it. But I'm not, I'm not finding that. And, and, and going back to my initial point, um, the new vending businesses increase and the increased sales tax revenue. I think it's a fair question, Directors Bellamy and Majette, to, for me to ask, where is the data to support this conclusion? Because it's central to what you're saying. It's on page three of your testimony, right up at page two really, of your testimony, right up front. Mm. And do you have any analysis that would support these two conclusions? Well, the additional sales tax came directly from the Office of Tax and Revenue. And what about the notion that your rules are going to increase vending? Well, because I, as I indicated, and, and I've, I've spoken to a lot of businesses at various forms and so forth, and they're, they're people who want to start a mobile vending business, but they're afraid to do so because of the current regulations or lack of current regulations. They're not sure that if they get a license today and you know next week they're told they can't vend at all, so they're waiting for these regulations. And isn't that the nature of the lottery you're proposing? I mean, Mr. Majet, you're an expert in business enterprise. If you were operating a business, would you want it to be dependent on a lottery as to whether you could come or go? Well, I, would, I may not want to be dependent on a lottery, but that's the way the jurisdiction set up its regulations. I'd have to live by that. Would you be attracted to a business situation where your ability to do business depended on the outcome of what would be called the game of chance? If it were this kind of business, I wouldn't have a problem with that. You wouldn't? No. Well, I think others do, and and, and I, I think that's going to come out in the course of the day. Um, the other thing is that is that uh, businesses do. I think uh, Mr. Grosso made this point very well. You know, the stability in business is very, very important. Every business enterprise wants to know, you know, that they can count on a particular. And, and you know, I have vendors, as you know, on Columbia Road. Ivory is there, right outside the Safeway. He has been there on Columbia Road, I don't know, as long as I can remember. And that particular location means a lot to his business. Mm -hmm. You know, if he had to move about, I, I think if Ivory was coming here today to testify, he'd say he couldn't do it. And so we all know, and you know very well, and Mr. Bellamy knows, the importance of having a definite location where you can cultivate customers, cultivate a particular demand for service or food, and they come there because they know you're going to be there. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I, I do agree with uh, Council Member Grosso that the uh, stability is a, little, is a big question here for this industry. But I think, I think the other thing, and my major point, is I think there's a determination, there's an effort here to restrict the businesses from operating. I think that's very clear in terms of the downtown, the various restrictions in downtown. We're going to see maps that indicate that. Once again, you know, remember this is the this is where we were in 2004. So there's some similarities, because mm -hmm. then we had a, simply a, a, we prohibited new vending licenses, mm -hmm. and then we permitted them in this little tiny area. Remember that mm -hmm. we prohib permitted them in this little tiny area, but only there. And so, you know, the, a theme that I'm well aware of in the brief history of this issue has been to limit, has been to say we are going to protect existing business by keeping these businesses out of the scene. Good. Is, has there been any, you know, going back to that old issue that we've always had, there's nothing in these regs relating to the issue of what you sell in front of what kind of business, is there? Yes, there is. What, may, what is it, please? Uh, well, well, there are different categories of licenses. Some allow just for merchandise, some allow for just food. We have different classes of licenses. You know as well as I do that the major objection is don't come and sell CDs in front of my CD shop. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know, do they sell CDs anymore? <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. Erase that. Don't come and sell chili dogs in front of my Ben's right. Chili Bowl. Right. You know, is, is, there anything, is there anything there <laughs> in the regs that addresses that issue? Uh, no, sir. Yeah. There's nothing specifically that addresses that, uh, Council Member Graham. But um, to the previous issue, there are many mobile roadway vendors who do operate in Ward 1, and they will be able to continue to operate in Ward 1. Um, through the list of proposed MRV locations, there is an, an established zone, um, as you described. Um, right, but I, I don't areas. see, I mean, I see the list of the locations in what you call the mid-city area. 
and uh, I see them in Mount Pleasant from Irving to Park Road. I see them on 7th Street from Florida to T, 14th Street from Columbia to Meridian Place. Can I, can, uh, I, can I clarify something about the, the regulations? 6th Street from Fairmont to College, which is at Howard. 14th Street to S, Columbia Road from Belmont to Mozart, Georgia Avenue from Euclid to Rock Creek, and Rhode Island Avenue from T Street to First Street. So I don't can, can I clarify something? So the, the, first of all, there's nothing that would prohibit us from establishing additional mobile roadway vending zones outside of where we have already determined them to be. We, we would, would be able to do that in any of those locations or other places where there would be a demand for that. The second is that the the, the intent of the regulations is to allow mobile roadway vending outside of the mobile roadway vending zones, but outside of a radius. So any place that's outside of 500 feet, and, and the map that's with the testimony shows what the 500 foot radius is around the existing zones, any place else, as long as it, there's the 10 foot sidewalk, and, and many places outside of the, the downtown do, do meet that as well, uh, would, be, would be able for people to, to to vend as well. Uh, my time is up, but that means, but if you establish them as such, no. in, in New well, any place outside of, an, of a mobile roadway vending zone, outside of that 500 foot radius, anybody could vend as, as long as they meet the, the requirements of the regulation. So what is this, uh, so, so these listings under mid-city area are zones? Uh, Council Member Graham, those are sidewalk vending locations. Um, the description of the mid-city area as defined in that section um, is a reference to sidewalk vending locations as opposed to the mobile vending, mobile roadway. Okay, vending. so permit me, Mr. Chairman, just one fast question. So tell me what the zone for mobile vending is in Ward 1. Uh, so mobile vendors in Ward 1 will be authorized to vend um, in areas where there are parking meters, parking block boxes. They will be restricted from vending on streets where there are residential parking restrictions or RPP passes or, or those are required. So they'll be able to vend on U Street as they currently do. They'll be able to vend um, in areas if, where... If there is a 10-foot unobstructed if sidewalk. If there is a 10-foot unobstructed sidewalk. And yes, that, that 10 feet includes signs, lights, meters, and it, so forth. That's calculated as part of the 10 feet? No, sir. No. Meters are not obstructions. Okay, so light poles and that light and that is no. no no so if you have a 10-foot sidewalk in ward one you can vend there there's, if, you're if there's a legal right. parking space there's a legal parking. if there's a legal parking space for the meter yes or illegal otherwise that's correct okay thank you that's very different thank you okay um let me now look at this in, in the light that's most favorable to, to the government, because I, I, I do get what you have here, and, and I do think that you need, you need to be commended for what you've brought forth. And I, but I do think that there's, as I said before, there's, uh, there's room for finding common ground. Now, uh, if we're saying that the population of, of the food truck industry right now in the District of Columbia is about 200 trucks. Okay. And you've identified 180 locations in the, the downtown central, central business district. That's approximately 95% of the people are going to be able to have a prime location uh, uh, you know, every single day. And that doesn't even talk about what's outside the MR. Correct. Okay. So, you know, that really is, I think, a, a, a big feather in your cap. In addition to that, your methodology is, is, isn't a methodology that you just came up with. If you look at how the government has been approaching vending, especially on the mall, and you've indicated was 186 spots, uh, 186 roadway vendors who participate in monthly lotteries for 76 spaces. So you're basing what you're, what you're basing these regulations on is on past data and the way the District of Columbia has approached this. Okay. That's correct. All right. So, uh, and then, uh, as indicated, based on, on Mr. Povich's statement, you know, he, he's saying, and he's going to come up and just speak for himself, but what the Post is saying, he's saying, is our major concern is that you put this 180 on paper in the actual regulations. So, to me, that is the basis for us closing out this issue, uh, and, and we'll have to see. Now, uh, I'm still concerned about the... Uh, the, the ten foot rule, and I think there can be some uh, uh, some leeway there. And then the, the five hundred foot rule. Uh, 
you know, maybe it could be 100 feet. I, you know, I, I don't know, but it seems to me that there has been a tremendous amount of work that has gone into this, and I'd hate to see us throw the baby out with the bathwater. But at the same time, I do believe that it needs to be tweaked. And um, so as, as we move forward, th there are a couple of things here that, that I am interested in. Uh, one, as Councilman Graham has indicated, the, uh, the annual sales tax revenue. Mm -hmm. And if there's 200 trucks, I mean, I just OTR can run these numbers and see what the sales tax revenue, mm -hmm. uh, projected sales tax revenue would be. In addition, I thought I read that every person that works on the truck has to get a, uh, has to get a license from the government. Yes, sir. That's the current structure. Okay. That's well, well, the current structure is there must be one licensed person on the truck at all times. Right. There's one license uh, for the truck, but it's also my understanding that whoever works on the truck as an employee has to have some type of, uh, right. of certification from, from you as well. At least, one of, at least one individual on the mobile vending unit is required to have a vending employee employee badge um, and the requirements for that badge are the Department of Health food handler certificate so are you, so then are you saying that every employee does not have to have that no sir one per one per vehicle okay one per okay because that's not what's being reported so I, helpers would not have to have those helpers would not have would to not have. have to have okay so as long as there's one person with the food handler certificate and a vending license on the premises okay well now are, are, the, are the helpers are they subject to employment taxes I mean, they're, they're, they're employees. And well, it depends they're on, exactly. I mean, if, if they're an employee, they're subject to all the rules regarding employees. If they're independent contractors, they're subject to those rules. We, we, we don't uh, regulate that part of it. You don't regulate that part of it, but it's a crucial part as to uh, who is being employed. And because, you know, we need to run projections on that as well. Uh, uh, you know, to see what type of employment taxes are, are, are being generated. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if at least one person is required to have that certification that you're talking about, and you're saying there's 200 trucks, we know there's at least 200 employees. And, but, and but, but if there are 200 employees, and I, I think the, the taxes would be the same. If it's an employee who's, who's paying part of their Social Security and the employer's paying the other, then I, I think it's about 14%. And the employee treated as an independent contractor, they have to pay their own Social Security, which is still going to be about 14 percent. So I don't think that revenue would be. But in order to be treated as an independent uh, contractor, you have to be able to control what you do. And if I own the truck and I'm, and I'm controlling what you do, then it's going to be hard to get the classification as an independent contractor. Well, that's true. But, but yeah. I think the revenue is going to be the same. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Okay. But I'm just saying that you need to run these numbers uh, so we can actually see what we're talking about in terms of, of the revenue to the city. And, and in terms of, of the 180 locations, um, you know, if, if that is real, and I have no reason to, to doubt at this point until we hear other testimony that that is not real, and you have your um, map here that, 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 that indicates that, I mean, I would be surprised if this wasn't, you know, fairly accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, once again, I'm still saying that that is a good basis for moving forward. And now it just really, to, for, from, from my point of view, we're now looking at this 10-foot rule and this 500-feet rule. Mm -hmm. And if we can some kind of way, you know, work that out, then that might be a basis for us, us to go forward. Now, you know, the options that, 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 that I have as chairman of the committee is, uh, you know, I pull the committee together, get them to vote the, well, I won't say get them to vote the rules down, but if they were decided to vote uh, against these proposed regulations, and then we come up with a committee report. However, the committee report has recommendations to the executive, and these recommendations have been worked out with, with the executive and worked out with the food truck industry. Get that to the full council for a vote, then it appears to me your options as the executive would be uh, to now modify your, your regulations and get them back to us as soon as possible when we pass this and we move on. You know, but I just think that we need to come out of here with a game plan or else we're going to be back to square one and all this good work is going to be, you know, for naught. Uh, you know, this has been going on for quite some time. And what I'm interested in is coming to a conclusion, coming to something that, that we can really, uh, uh, you know, get approved prior to the end of this calendar year. Uh, so I, I would hope that, you know, even as, as you look at this and, and what's coming out of this hearing, that you look long and hard 
uh, as to whether or not you know the government should be you know be providing some wiggle room. And, and, it's, and as hard as we're coming at you, this is, this is as hard we're going to come at the food truck industry as, as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and based on what I've been reading, I'm not so sure that the brick and mortar restaurants are in agreement with you with these 180 locations. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, there's there's some concerns there as well. And especially in, in reading the restaurant association's letter, there, there, there are two points. One is that the 10 foot rule also applies to sidewalk cafes. And then two, that this committee should look at surrounding jurisdictions. What comes to mind, I think one of these jurisdictions has a 1,000 foot rule. And, and another one, you know, I mean, basically because the, the guy in Chicago was part of, was the head of the restaurant association, he doesn't even allow you to come into the area at all. So, I mean, so we are looking at all the information, but I would just caution everyone that's involved in this process to really see where you are in this process and whether or not we can fashion some type of compromise that we can all move forward. But, the, uh, you know, just seems to me if there are 200 trucks that are operating right now, you're offering 180 spaces, and then I think your testimony on average is 100 trucks are operating on a daily basis, I mean, that's, 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 that's pretty good when you look at this as opposed to other jurisdictions and how they're operating. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to continue to lean on you hard uh, to even after this day is over to get with the food truck industry and really push. And one thing I, I keep mentioning Mr. Povich's name uh, because I see him around and also I'm talking to him because I know he's an attorney as well. And so he knows about, you know, settlements. Uh, I, I would say that uh, his point was uh, he, he takes issue with the fact that you issued these regulations and sent them to the council at the same time, which did not provide them an opportunity to sit down and go over these uh, regulations with you. So you guys could continue the dialogue before they were actually sent to the council. So a lot of this could have been worked out. But now that it's before the council, it's up to us to try to work it out as, as well. But I think you can see from you know, colleagues that you've heard from today that it doesn't seem like they're at least at this point ready to move these these regulations on and then he me as the you know the I'm trying to balance it all for, for everyone. So that's the point that that I really want to uh, push. Um, see there was another question I had oh what we didn't talk about is you also have opened up the mall. And um, from what I've gathered the uh, at least right now the food truck industry uh, is not really commenting on on that area or that opportunity for business. They have not said that, you know, we, we uh, thank you for that opportunity, but you can actually be down on the mall. Now, I do realize that's, what is it, $450 a month to operate? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, and that's on a monthly basis, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. All right, so I guess you really need to be generating some revenue in order just to handle that $450 a month and mm -hmm. everything else that goes with uh, you know, operating business. But how many spaces does that create for you? The opportunity for 76 spaces um, around the National Mall and the Ellipse, sir. Okay. So now the council and the government is going to start hearing from those 186 about you opening up the market to the food truck industry, which brings another 200, a possible 200, which gets us up to 386 people that are now participating in a lottery for 76 spots. Uh, right? So yeah, if, I mean, that's the bottom line. Food, if all of the food trucks participated, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, we just want to look at those worst case scenarios, uh, because every for every you know for every issue that we solve, there's always some other issues that come about. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to look at that in that vein as well. Are there any other opportunities uh, 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 for the food truck industry? So we have the MR the, the MRVs, we have outside the MRV, and then we have the uh, the mall opportunities. So it does appear as though there are a there is enough business for the industry to, to operate in the District of Columbia, well, along with private space as well, off street private space, off street private space. And, and there's also opportunities uh, throughout some of the uh, neighborhoods uh, areas for mobile vendors, um, and in, in addition, the regulations allow for Class B and Class D mobile vendors, who would be merchandise providers or service providers. Um, we filled a lot of calls and inquiries from street boutiques who would like to operate, um, and these regulations allow the district to be innovative in that sense to expand the mobile vending universe to include people who are offering more than just food. They're 
offering clothing, um, as well as some service providers who've expressed interest in obtaining licensure. Okay, and also these regulations guarantee one to operate for four hours, so you don't have to feed the meter. And so you, once you get your your permit, you're you're able to operate for four hours unobstructed from ten thirty. A.M. to 2.30, and that's only in the MRV. If you're outside the MRV, there's no time constraints, right? Well, there's the, the two-hour requirement um, or, or the whatever the parking meter requirement is, whether it's one hour or two hours, uh, to obey those parking restrictions. Okay. So that there could possibly be some flexibility in that area? It's always a possibility. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll answer that myself. It's always a possibility. Okay, now what about uh, in terms of, of uh, health inspections, anything, uh, do we have any issues there? Currently, uh, as Mr. Director Majette stated, uh, food trucks are inspected by the Department of Health prior to operation. Um, the Department of Health is, is also represented here today. Um, they've given some input as far as these regulations are concerned. Um, one provision of these regulations which will improve the Department of Health's um, inspection procedure as related to me is that they won't be required to inspect the truck repeatedly um, as opposed to just inspecting the truck on one occasion and then for each additional employee that employee will be issued a food protection manager card and be able to vend on that truck as opposed to the current state where there, the truck is required to be inspected over and over, uh, or could be required to be inspected over and over. Okay, now, now that goes back to, goes back to my uh, the question I asked you initially, and that is about the people that are working on the truck. So if you are working on the truck, it, each, everyone that works on that truck has to make contact with the government because now you said they have to have a food handler's permit, right? Well, so so the person has to make contact with the government in one way or another. Well, it's, it's one individual per truck for for that. For even for the the, the food handling permit. Yeah. Just yes, sure sir. about that. Yes, sir. All right. It's like a restaurant. They, there's only one okay. uh, person who has a okay. have, keep food handling on that because that that's not what's been reported to me. But uh, okay. you're saying that's not the case. Okay. All right. Uh, then what about for DPW? Are there any DPW issues? Department of Public Works. I mean the trash <laughs> issues. Are there any issues? Yeah. Director Howell, Ms. Hill. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, the, the, generally, the bids. Yeah, oh yeah, William Howland, uh, Director of the Department of Public Works. Um, generally, the bids deal with those issues with uh, trash in those areas. Um, and so it's not so much of a, a DPW issue. I would say that the biggest issue for us is um, the food, well, the vendor staying beyond the parking limits that are established. Typically, they're two-hour limits, and that's why we sort of support the, the regulations of having these, these zones that sort of addresses that ambiguity of uh, who can stay beyond the, the time period. My biggest concern is um, when we establish these zones, the fine needs to be sufficiently high enough for those vendors that don't belong in the zone. So that you're, you're in, we have a zone A, you're not scheduled to be there today, and now you're there. And what is, what is the vendor that's supposed to be there, what is he to do? And uh, we need to make it so that the, there is no benefit for sort of mooching on someone else. Um, and then um, what we do with those zones prior, what's the parking regulations prior to that zone becoming a was an MRV, MRV. that uh, we don't try to limit what parking happens there because uh, I don't have sufficient tow trucks to move the vehicles. The biggest issue is someone doesn't belong there. The only only remedy is to move the vehicle out of there, and I've got to tow it out of there. But but uh, the trash issue is not that, that not that much of an issue for us. All right, thank you, Mr. Grussell. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Allen. I um. I'd say picking up trash is always your issue, but I understand that the bids help you out. Um, you know, I, I have a different kind of inquiry here, and you could stay at the table. I think it demonstrates my question. When I was reading the regs, the thing that struck me uh, most um, kind of starkly was that the number of district agencies that are involved in this situation. And, the, you know, and I think that might be just the nature of the business, that you have to have all these folks. And I'm a little concerned about kind of um, – well, 
you know what it means when we're the least friendly business place in the country. It's partly because of the fact that we don't have good coordination um, when it comes to businesses touching our government and trying to do business. And that's true for every type of business. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could reflect. I think there's at least five, maybe more agencies that are engaged in this. Um, the regs say that DCRA is the lead, um, but yet DCRA is going to have to – how are we going to handle this? Can you just talk about that some, maybe, Director Majette? I mean, in your oversight hearing and budget hearings, you talked about creating a system where you guys would be the intake for licensing and for pro projects and construction projects, and then you'd ping out for clean hands and all those other things and come back to you and you would coordinate that. Mm -hmm. Is that what's happening here? Yes. Uh, also, uh, as, as I testified at our budget hearing, the mayor uh, established a business reform regulatory task force, and one of the things we're looking at is creating a portal where a person can go online and access every agency in one portal to make it easier to get the permits and all that. But we're kind of coordinating the effort now. So you mentioned clean hands, which is obtained from the Office of Tax and Revenue. We're trying to get that online so the person doesn't have to go to Tax and Revenue. We'll have limited access to their database. Um, but right now, we're coordinating all the agency, and we're responsible for enforcement. It's, it's not unlike a, a, a brick and mortar uh, business that also uh, it, it has to um, go through several agencies for permitting, inspections, and licenses, and so forth. Yeah, I mean that they're they're who I think about when I think about the difficulty in doing this, and the, mm. my concern rises from them and from other small businesses that are dealing mm. with these, and big businesses that are dealing with these issues. And um, I guess my fear is that. Whenever I have the opportunity to approve or, or not approve something when we're creating another bureaucratic structure, uh, I like to ask the question, what are you doing to make it so that it's easier and not harder on businesses to set up here and to operate here? Um, and I'm not convinced that these make it any easier. I think they probably at best hold the status quo, which is a fairness argument, I think, when it comes to the rest of the business community. But wouldn't it be great if we could move our city forward as well in trying to make it easier? What percentage of this work? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say we're doing that with the mayor's task force. In, in fact, at the last meeting, um, uh, I mentioned your comment that while wait until the task force um, suggests things, go ahead and do it now. Right. So what we're going to do is for recommendations that we can implement immediately, we'll do that rather than waiting for the task force to end and submit a report to the mayor. So we're going to implement the good ideas that we can go forward with now and then other ideas that require policy changes or legislation will have to submit to That's the mayor great. for approval. Well, I appreciate that, and I think the business community will also appreciate those mm -hmm. efforts. Just on a kind of a, you may not know off the top of your head, but it just maybe you can guess if, if not. the In these regulations, what percentage of the touches with or what number of the touches with the government are going to be able to be done online? You got health, you got, you know, you're licensing, you got public space, you got probably tax and revenue, regular business license, probably a basic business, 90% of it, 10% of it? Like, how much do these folks have to go in and talk to you in person? Our, uh, currently, um, Councilmember Russell, the application process starts and ends with DCRA. Um, under the proposed regulations, uh, that will be the same. All of the contact, the vendors will not have contact directly with DDOT as they're approved for site permits. That's funneled through DCRA. Um, the scheduling for inspections with Department of Health and Fire and EMS, that's also scheduled through DCRA. Um, and it's a joint inspection that's all done at one time. We're working to get all of our processes online. Uh, preventing applications as they are for BBLs and corporation registrations, um, and that's an initiative um, that, that hopefully That's great. That's really good to hear, and I encourage you to do that. The, the, um, my, my, I have a couple more thoughts. The, the, the lottery here, you know, or the selection, you know, device that's used to assign these spaces, and uh, we went through it in depth in my office. Um, it's, it's fairly complex and confusing. The one thing I do take heart in is that You've done it before. You've used it before, at least in a limited basis. I'm not sure that'll work. I'm not sure it satisfies everybody. Um, but I'm not going to take issue with it today because I think that there is room to still work on it. Um, and that I encourage you as we move forward, whether we approve or disapprove, to get the folks back in the room as soon as possible so that people can have an input on that. Uh, now, I'm not um, – I, I think it's appropriate for the government to – to regulate government space, and this public space is that. And so although I appreciate 
the association and other folks' interest in regulating themselves and managing the lottery themselves, it's not something that I think is uh, necessarily appropriate mm -hmm. place to do it. That said, though, it has to be done in a way that everyone is comfortable with and has faith in and believes in, or else it has no credibility and then it's just blown to bits. And so you don't want that. So let's make sure we can get to that point. My last thought, and, I'm, and then I'm, I don't have any more questions for you guys, but I do want to make and put on the record, as I've done before, um, I like to eat in restaurants. Um, I like to uh, sit down. I like to be served. Um, and I am a big supporter of our restaurant industry. I am really disappointed that this is a dis dis debate that has gotten to the point where it's restaurants versus food trucks and, and whatnot, because um, that's not where we are and, and not where we should go. Uh, ultimately, everyone can coexist here. Uh, everyone should have the opportunity to coexist here. And I think that the work that's been done on these regs is working us towards that spot. Um, just because I don't approve of them in this form does not mean that we won't move forward and get to a point where everyone can coexist. Uh, so, um, but I like to put on the record every time that I have eaten at food trucks and the food is good and it's fun but I don't wait in line uh, for much and I certainly like to be served so for that reason I go to restaurants and the restaurants in DC are fabulous and um, when I was growing up here we didn't have these options we didn't have food trucks we didn't have a lot of restaurants um, and so I love to see our city growing in this way and I think all we can do now is make sure the government gets out of the way as best we can uh, and let this world you know and let this uh, kind of uh, entrepreneurship continue to grow. So thank you very much, Chairman Warren. All right, thank you very much for your testimony. It's my understanding uh, you're going to be around for the rest of the day and, uh, uh, and at the end if we have uh, further questions. Yeah. Exactly. I was going to go patronize a food truck and then I was going to come back. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Was some lunch. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, next we'll have uh, Brenda Sales, Doug Povich, Hong Lee, and uh, also let me bring up uh, is it Che Rudel Tabalusa? Okay, we'll begin with uh, Ms. Sales. Good afternoon. My name is Brenda Sales, and I'm known as uh, an RFK uh, vendor, and um, those are vendors that were supposedly uh, transferred from RFK to the National Ballpark uh, with assigned spaces. However, since um, the transition there, we've um, encountered several uh, problems. I'm speaking on behalf of most of the RFK uh, vendors. Uh, some of them say that they have not received spaces in uh, the last couple of years. Some of them say they've only had one site assignment or two site assignments within the last couple of years. And I looked at the site assignments uh, for this year for March in April or April and May and in April out of the 14 spaces there were only 
six assigned to RFK vendors, and out of the spaces for May, only seven were assigned to RFK vendors. Uh, the reason I'm bringing up that point is because uh, lotteries sometimes work for some people and sometimes they don't. We were promised site assignments uh, uh, while we were at RFK uh, when we were transitioned. Most of us had neighborhood and central vending licenses, but we never received any site assignments. And um, we still do not have site assignments. However, when they have the lottery, the lotteries uh, are comprised of people that do have uh, permanent site assignments that can leave their regular spaces uh, that they work during the day and come over to the national ballpark, whereas people that don't have site assignments, uh, which include all of the RFK vendors, uh, a lot of times they don't get to vend for months. Uh, personally, that has not been my problem, but uh, several of the other vendors say that um, they're very concerned about um, lotteries and, and having to participate in them against people in particular that um, uh, have been encouraged to come over and to compete uh, against the licensed vendors and now they're giving out special event uh, stadium permits which uh, vendors can just go and sign those even though that there, there is a moratorium on um, the issuance of vending licenses except to the food trucks at this time. And I really wanted to bring out that uh, since you all did spend a considerable amount of time talking about lotteries. Also at um, the ballpark we have limited hours of operation which are different than any of the other operation hours of operations for the city. Uh, we are the only vendors in the city that have to pay uh, site permits. Currently we pay $130.30 per month for these site permits, even though most of our operations are substantially smaller than these um, food trucks and roadway uh, vehicles that you're all talking about, putting in lotteries, that uh, their indebtedness to the city will be considerably less than what the current um, uh, sidewalk vendors are paying. Uh, on a personal note, as a sole proprietor, I'm very concerned with um, these larger businesses being able to uh, use employees uh, that are not uh, fully licensed as a uh, street vendor, that they can have them operating stands or trucks or carts. Uh, and this has been the case uh, since this uh, helper or employee situation started that uh, oftentimes the actual vendor, licensed vendor, is away from the stand or don't even work that day and have their employee or helper operate those stands with those uh, limited licenses that don't have any real personal responsibility to the city. The vendor or the corporation is the person that has the obligation to the city as opposed to independent vendors or sole proprietors. And I really just wanted to stress the fact that I think there should be fair and equitable treatment for all vendors or people that want to vend or sell on public space. All right, thank you very much uh, for your testimony, Ms. Sells. Uh, Mr. Povich? Povich? Yes. Thank you, Chairman Orange, uh, Councilmember Grasso, for the opportunity to speak here. Also, thank you, Directors Majette um, and um, Bellamy for the hard work that you're doing uh, to help push these regulations through. We, we truly appreciate it. Um, my name is Doug Perwich. I guess I'm infamous now from the Washington Post article. Um, I'm the chairman of the Food Truck Association of Metropolitan Washington. I'm co-owner of the Red Hook Lobster Pound <coughs> excuse me, Food Truck, and um, I'm also a fifth generation native Washingtonian. The Food Truck Association was formed about two years ago with 17 truck members, and we're now up to about 60, 10 of which are out of DC. Um, 
we employ over 450 employees. Uh, Office of Tax and Revenue has indicated that we would generate approximately $3.4 million in sales tax revenue over four years. Um, but it's important, I think, to note that we, are, we represent less than a third of all of the food trucks that are operating in D.C. Um, in order to become a member, you have to sign on to a code of conduct that we uh, enforce. It includes things such as serving all parts of the city, um, leaving a location cleaner than when we arrived, uh, not playing music too loudly, uh, endeavoring not to park in front of a restaurant that serves the same food, uh, contributing back to the community. Um, the existing regulations that we have now are not ideal, um, but they do allow something that's critical, and that is mobility. Any legal parking space, essentially, we can park in. Uh, we can, that allows us to meet demand where it exists. It allows us to travel the city to activate spaces where there are food deserts. Um, this has contributed to making D.C. one of the best food truck uh, jurisdictions in the country, and we have experts later on that will address that. Um, it's not to say, however, that there aren't issues. Fortunately, by my count, it's a very short list of issues that have come up. There's, there's only four. Head and shoulders above all of them is the roadway and parking congestion issue in the most popular vending locations. Similarly, um, or not similarly, there are two others that are, that are less important or less critical, and that is the sidewalk congestion in the most popular areas and also trash collection in the most popular areas. Um, not to say they aren't important, they're just uh, not on the scale of the, uh, roadway vending and uh, roadway and parking congestion. The final one is the need to compensate the city for its use, our use of the public space. And fortunately, the fourth one is done. It's in the proposed regulations. We're fine with it. We have always agreed that we should pay our fair share of the burden that we place on the city's infrastructure. So the first three that I mentioned have the same thing in common. They are in the most popular vending locations in the city. This is where the issues arise. Um, for the first one, we think a properly devised mobile roadway vending-based uh, regulatory regime that manages problems where they exist and when they exist and that may pop up in the future um, but leaves the rest of the city open is the way to go. Uh, numbers two and three, sidewalk congestion and trash, we think are very easily managed. Don't really need a whole lot of regulation there. Uh, we, and we propose things such as the vending improvement detail that you mentioned to address that. So what happens in the proposed regulations to address these four issues? Um, first, with respect to the parking and uh, roadway and congestion issues, the proposed regulations establish an MRV regime um, where it's appropriate, which is good, great, but it does it on a citywide basis in, in the 23 general areas that are identified um, on the map. Uh, Director Majette's map, without any objective criteria set forth in the rules about when, where, and how many spaces will be created. That's bad from our perspective. Uh, if you put the objective criteria uh, into the rules, we're good. We're not saying you have to identify that there's going to be 180 spaces, just the criteria used to get to those spaces. Um, the other piece of that and related is this monthly lottery concept. It, the problem is it's listed in the rules as the only mechanism by which DCRA can assign spaces on, uh, in the MRBs. It requires businesses to rely on a game of chance. If you don't win, you're out um, of the most popular areas. Uh, that is obviously is bad for our, from our perspective. You're, and you'll hear an expert on this subject as well. Uh, we prefer to make a rotation where trucks have a more uh, equitable chance of or opportunity to vend in these areas. And I appreciate that with what we're learning in the last day or so, there, there may be some um, flexibility in terms of what DCRA has, is coming up with to accommodate that. We just don't, we're not sure because we don't fully understand it yet. Um, the last piece, uh, or, or the, the third piece, is this 500 foot buffer area around the MRVs. We don't really understand what should, those four problems that I identified this is trying to solve. Um, it protects lottery winners, I guess, um, which we don't think is a good idea. It's not necessary. It would, at 500 feet, cut off eight square blocks of vending around an MRV, um, and uh, we're concerned that uh, that is um, uh, too onerous. Um, if there is a problem that, that come, pops up adjacent to an MRV, just create another MRV there and solve it that way. Finally, the piece de resistance, if you will, is the 10-foot sidewalk restriction that we've all been discussing. Um, designed, obviously, to deal with sidewalk congestion. The problem is that 
it's coming at it, at it from uh, the wrong assumption. The assumption is that we are placing obstructions on the sidewalk in the same way that a sidewalk cafe, for example, places tables and chairs and railings. We place absolutely no permanent obstruction on the sidewalk. The only people, the only thing on the sidewalk that we put there are our customers. They are mobile. They move out of the way. So, um, so even though um, th this 10-foot sidewalk restriction is designed to control sidewalk congestion, uh, we think that's an easily managed uh, problem. It does this even though, as I said, there's no obstructions placed on the sidewalk. It's not needed um, outside of the MRB areas because there are no lines. There's, there's no demand. There's no problem bending outside the MRB areas. Um, this one-size-fits-all approach is not tailored to specific problems, then, and we believe that it should be stricken from the regulations altogether. Um, so if you take together the 500-foot restriction, the 10-foot sidewalk restriction, those would effectively eliminate mobility from our perspective, which is the core business model, um, by simply reducing the number of spaces that are available now. You have, and this is simple math, you have a, a number of trucks now, you have perhaps a growing number of trucks, and you have a shrinking number of spaces where we will be able to vend. Um, that to us indicates that you're going to either have to move out of the city to vend or you're going to go out of business. Um, it's perhaps not intentional, but Based on what we've studied, that would be the effect of it when you read the plain words and apply the plain words of the statute. Um, people have said that we're exaggerating, uh, that our maps are wrong. Um, we're not. We know. We measured the streets. And we, and we did this by the letter of the regulations. Um, it's the same thing that uh, DDOT did back in October when they pointed us to the public realm design manual that said, uh, park, uh, it said, Lamp posts and these uh, light, uh, sign posts are all obstructions. And so um, now, apparently, they're coming back and saying, well, at least parking meters are not obstructions. I guess that's good. We're happy to hear that. But this is the type of um, uh, interpretation, flexibility that, w that scares us, frankly. Um, so uh, you'll hear a lot more about that on our third panel. In closing, um, there are four things uh, that I'd like to uh, stress. One is, the first is that we need less ambiguity about how the rules will be interpreted. Put the process in the rules. We saw a presentation that shows the MRBs, the map shows the MRBs, where they're going to be and how many spaces they're going to be. DCRA and DDOT obviously went through some process to arrive at those. Uh, ask them how they did that, how they, did, how they came up with those um, determinations. And then, um, so that we know looking at it, we get certainty how uh, a vendor can look at it and say, okay, in this area there's going to be an MRV because these types of situations are happening. More certainty and less ambiguity allows businesses to plan and grow. Uh, second is the 10-foot sidewalk res restriction, as I said, has to go. It has no place here. The 500-foot buffer area also should be eliminated or replaced with something less draconian. Um, I do want to correct one thing uh, that Director Majette uh, and Mr. Parker said regarding this requirement to license every employee. Uh, we think that Section 564.1 of the proposed regulations, in fact, does require every employee to have an ID badge, and we don't see the need for that um, as long as one person you know, on the vehicle is a um, certified food handler. The other employees, some of whom will never even get onto a truck, are just working back in our kitchens, um, would, would, under this regulation, we believe, have to have an ID badge. Mm -hmm. um, so we are, we are committed to working out um, these last few items quickly. We're frustrated, as everyone is, that the process um, doesn't appear to allow, allow revisions. Um, we're, we're frustrated a bit with these 11th hour um, information that we're getting. We're, we're glad that, it's, that people are working and that, that uh, it, it, we just think that these are some of the things that probably should be in the rules um, so that everybody's understand. Um, so we would urge you to reject the regulations, uh, give DCRA specific guidance about how to proceed, and quickly adopt uh, new revised regulations. We believe firmly that we can work with interested stakeholders to arrive at that. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, testimony. Mr. Lee? Good afternoon. My name is Andy Lee. Uh, I'm representing Korean mobile roadway vendors. Today, I would like to comment on the Section 549, which prohibits their commercial advertisement on vendors' equipment. 
for Section 549 Design Standard Advertising, it prohibits advertisement other than name of the vending businesses and its service. However, the vending equipment is a private property owned by each individual licensed vendor. We do not understand why only the vendors are prohibited to place commercial advertisement on their personal properties while others are allowed to do that. We find no regulation set by DCRA or DDOT prohibiting commercial advertisement on pedicabs, taxi, or mobile billboard truck operating in the district. We believe advertisement on vending equipment should not be regulated as long as it meets following guidelines or standards. First, no freestanding advertisement shall be allowed. Second, advertisement shall be posted on the equipment possessed by vendors. Third, advertisement shall be professionally printed. The last, the content of advertisement shall be for appropriate commercial interest or for public service announcement. Currently, a number of roadway venue trailers have been carrying rigorous advertising, advertisement for past decade. They have been, they have been posted since 2002 and we have not received any complaints from general public. When we started the operation in 2002, it was highly re encouraged and recommended by the former vending coordinator, Mr. Richard Harris, who was unfortunately passed away. So therefore, we respectfully request Council of the District of Columbia to revise the Section 549 Advertising Standard to facilitate a more business-friendly way. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I know I'm pronouncing this wrong, but uh, Mr. Che Rudel Tabuso? Almost, sir. Okay. Uh, Rudel Tabasola. Tabasola. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and I have a PowerPoint. Are you, are you guys able to see that? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Council. Thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to speak here today. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, my name is Che Riddell Tapasola. I uh, come on the barbecue bus with my husband, and I'm also the political director of the Food Truck Association of Metropolitan Washington. Um, I want to be sensitive to time. I'll, we've covered a lot of things, um, and Doug did a lot. Whenever we have the opportunity to introduce food trucks to, to somebody, I, I like to talk about food trucks being a great use of, of public space. Um, by serving the densest areas of downtown, food trucks are helping to reduce the need to drive for lunch um, and travel and help actually alleviate overall city congestion. Um, food trucks also serve a number of areas with few brick and mortar restaurants, and we point to um, examples of that like 21st in Virginia and LaFont Plaza. Um, and, and food trucks activate underutilized uh, areas and create new revenues for the city and increase foot traffic for surrounding businesses. Uh, currently, the Food Truck Association is doing a Books and Bites program with MLK Library <coughs> on 9th Street uh, in an attempt to draw new, uh, uh, new energy and some vibrancy to that block in Chinatown. Um, the highlights of the current food truck regulations. Um, uh, you know, I think it's a myth that food trucks are subject to no regulations. Um, in fact, food trucks are inspected uh, at least twice a year uh, by the Department of Health and uh, as opposed to a brick-and-mortar restaurant, which is only inspected once. The uh, food trucks must park 100 feet from a traffic circle, uh, 40 feet from an intersection. Um, all food trucks operate from a brick-and-mortar kitchen uh, where we pay all the associated fees um, and taxes there. Um, the highlights of the proposed new regulations, like Doug said, uh, we support much of this, and, and it's a good place to start. Um, however, some of the proposed regulations have little to do with public health and safety and, and restrict competition and consumer choice, and we've talked about that considerably already. Um, I'll talk about one point in particular, um, and that is prohibiting food trucks where there is less than 10 feet of unobstructed sidewalk. Um, First, it bans food trucks from most of downtown, and we'll show you on that map. Uh, trees, uh, trees, uh, street light poles, parking meters, and other objects are considered obstructions. Um, and, and, and at an October 15, 2012 meeting with DDOT, it was DDOT officials who instructed us that it was the farthest obstruction on the block that counted toward its entire block's unobstructed space. Um, and I'm also coming up from here the DDOT public road design manual. Um, that says that for the purposes of determining clear sidewalk space, 
Trees, streetlight poles, sign poles, fire hydrants, and other objects located on the surface space shall be considered as obstructions. And so while I was encouraged by some of the comments I heard this morning, um, I think a theme this morning is ambiguity and the need for more detail and, and clarification um, in the regulations. Uh, our objective is to comply with the rules, and it's very difficult um, if we don't know what the rules are asking us to do. Um, and I think whenever, especially when there's such a broad discretion for reinterpretation of the rules at a later time. Um, as Doug had said, unlike uh, sidewalk vendors and sidewalk cafes, we create no permanent or semi-permanent obstructions to the sidewalk. Um, and one thing is that restaurants commonly receive waivers to open sidewalk cafes with less than 10 feet of unobstructed sidewalk. Um, here we just took examples of four, uh, photos of, of four sidewalk cafes on the former block of 7th Street. That's actually five feet and three and a quarter inches of unobstructed sidewalk on New York Avenue that uh, unobstructed sidewalk width actually comes down to three feet and three quarter inches. On the 1600 block of I Street, that unobstructed sidewalk comes down to four feet and three quarter inches. And on the 1800 block of Bell Street, that unobstructed sidewalk comes down to five feet uh, and a, uh, five and a half feet. Um, and and I, so it's frustrating because, you know, why is this being imposed on one industry over another when another industry does have some flexibility in how those rules um, are implemented. We'll talk a lot today about lottery assigned locations. Um, and then we talk a little bit about the map and the methodology. Um, what I wanted to do was say, if these regs passed, what would they look like? Um, we measured maps over two weekends. We quality data checked the map uh, over the following two weekends. Um, I used to be a research manager over at HRC. I'm very sensitive to the need that you have good, strong data. Um, I have a master's degree uh, from the University of Brussels at Kent. Um, and actually I'm a qu uh, trained qualitative and quantitative researcher, so I take this stuff very seriously. Um, the maps are based on a strict interpretation of what's in the proposed regulations, and I think the reason that they're all alternative ideas of what the map means is because of the degree of ambiguity in the rules. And the degree of ambiguity alone is the reason why these rules should fail. Um, the maps that we submit, we submitted the first two of these maps on April 8th, um, the one thing that we want to make um, clear is that the current parking restrictions and streetscape features already have a lot of uh, prohibitions for food trucks. There are a number of things that compete for the use of public space, things like bike lanes, metro bus zones, government and diplomat, diplomat parking, hotel entrances, taxi stands, um, car sharing, and one-way streets. Because the way a food truck operates, our service window is on the passenger side. So there's a number of one-way streets where we could actually not vend on one entire side of the street just because of the way the trucks um, are built. The first map I'll show you is given all the current parking restrictions and streetscape features that I just mentioned, the current restrictions uh, prohibit food trucks from vending in many areas of downtown. Um, and the black indicates that. And then you drop in the 10-foot unobstructed sidewalk as it, uh, the 10-foot unobstructed sidewalk rule as it was explained to us by DDOT in October. Um, and you can see that uh, 10 feet of unobstructed sidewalk is a premium um, in the District of Columbia. The proposed regulations lay out a minimum of three lottery signed locations uh, for food trucks per MRV location. Um, and that is what we based our, our data on. We, we have to. Um, we have to evaluate this policy based on what's in the four corners of this document, um, not assurances or other people's good intentions. Um, I don't think anybody would be asked to, to sort of write a blank check to somebody and saying, okay, um, here you go. And then when you drop in the 500 foot radius, then you could see um, that uh, we have very few options if the regulations pass that this is where we would be allowed to currently vend. Um, and as you've pointed out, um, there is no maximum, there is no minimum number of those trucks within those locations. As a small business owner, it's 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 terrifying, um, and all we want is clarity and direction so that we can plan and, and conduct our business and at least that we know what we need to do to comply with the regulations. I've talked a lot about the impact of these regulations, um, and we'll hear more about lottery uh, later today. We're, you know, we are calling, and as I think other folks here are too today, that these reg regulations need some work. Um, and we are, we are calling for that. And I, I want to echo uh, Doug's statement. We are confident 
uh, that the Food Truck Association and the other stakeholders at the table and the community can work together um, and really get through. Right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you uh, very much for your testimony. Um, Ms. Sales, um, I'm going to have, um, you know, basically uh, you get with the DCRA and so they can really look into um, your issue because your issue is more, as you indicate, you're an RFK vendor that has moved to the ballpark. You promised certain things and you don't think those promises have been lived up to. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and clearly uh, I get what you said about site assignments and uh, limiting operations and, and things of that nature. So. Uh, Mr. Majette is still here. His team is still here. So perhaps we can look, take a look at that and whatever the law uh, has, is, is requiring or whatever the law has promised you, then, you know, I'm a firm believer that you should get what's been, been promised pursuant to the law. So um, I'm just, and he's there right there. I have him uh, meet with you to uh, see if we can come to some resolution on your issues. Okay. Uh, I've met. Uh, personally with Mr. Majette and I have a great deal of respect for him. I mean, he's very considerate and um, he has, um, even with me personally, has gone out of his way to um, help me with the situation. And uh, it's not that DCRA is not aware of some of the issues that um, the vendors are um, speaking about because I've also met with Mr. Parker and um, with Mr. <laughs> Eric Rogers, I'm sorry, uh, getting old. But, um, and, and all of them, you know, have expressed a sincere interest in, in, in what the, the plight of the RFK vendors have been. But for whatever reason, some of these vendors, um, time and time again, say, I, one vendor in particular said he hasn't had a space at all this year that was an RFK vendor. And then other vendors are telling DCRA representatives that don't know any better that, uh, yeah, I'm an RFK vendor and have their names listed uh, as a vendor with preference. And so there's a lot of things that are going on that um, Mr. Majette and some of the other officials really probably don't even have time to deal with on a daily basis, but um, we have addressed those issues with them. Okay, well, he's the person to, to address the issues with. and. Uh you know, if, if one was an RFK vendor, I'm assuming that we can examine that and, and establish who was an RFK vendor. And then uh, and, and when it was transferred over to the National Ballpark, once again, I believe that you should be able to establish who is a vendor and who and what folks are, are entitled to. So uh, once again, I'm going to direct you to, to meet with him and then uh, whatever drives comes out of that meeting that you send it to the committee so we can take a look at it as, as well. But, you know, um, I'm just of the firm belief it is what it is. Either you were RFK vendor or you were not. And there should be a list. That should be the starting point. And now if, that, if, if the law or whatever agreements were reached that transfers that status from RFK to Nationals Park, then that should be easily to, to ascertain. So we'll, you know, provide, um, you know, a little bit more oversight over it. We haven't been involved in that issue. But I, to me, based on what you have presented here today, I, I don't think that this is something that's uh, insurmountable that we cannot, you know, um, get to a solution on that. Uh, okay. So that's that's what I would uh, recommend in, in that case. Um, Mr. Lee, I, I'm I'm very in, uh, intrigued by what you brought to the uh, to the attention of, of the committee here today. Uh, we had not focused on that. Yes, sir. I don't know, um, you know, why that particular uh, provision would uh, exist as something that we would have to uh, look into. Obviously, if you were able to advertise, there would have to be standards. Uh, and um, so I, I can just say that we will take that up with the, with the departments as, as well. Uh, you are right. You can walk into certain establishments, and they do get, get to advertise. So, um, uh, and I believe even the taxi cabs, they get to advertise. So uh, I don't know why this particular industry would be um, – would be singled out to not be able to advertise, but I do know that there are advertising standards yes, uh, that would have to be put in put in place to make sure that you know it's it's uh, pursuant to the rules and regulations of the District of Columbia. So that's that's another issue that the committee is taking a note of, and I want to thank you for bringing that uh, to the forefront. But the thing is, the vending equipment are owned by individual vendors, and it is. Construct, 
considered as a private and private properties. And then we do not, and while others, other means of transportation or the venues are allowed to do the advertising, commercial advertisement, why only the specific vendors are not allowed to do their commercial advertisement on their personal properties? First, second thing is, you may have seen the Wigglies advertisement running around in the Washington DC area, especially in the National Mall. And those advertisements were placed in back in 2002, and back then time, we were encouraged and uh, we were encouraged by a vending coordinator at that time. And we did, we haven't had any uh, public complaints for 10 years. And it, but the, with the 2009, this current uh, vending regulations, it specifically prohibits uh, the commercial advertisement. And we'd like to know if it can be amended or revised to more business friendly way. So that, because like it, currently, the vendors are paying, the roadway, roadway vendors are paying parking fees and then really implementing public parking space fee. Mm -hmm. It will be around like $900 per month. We are trying to revive this operation to pay for, the, pay for their monthly expenses and other expenses. Well, like I said, uh, you know, you've brought that to, to our attention. We, we will look at it. I don't, as of right now, I can't, you know, um, come up with a reason why you should not be able to, to advertise other than I do think that, you know, there has to be certain standards to put, put in place. And I do know that others are able to advertise. So we will certainly uh, look into that issue. Thank you, sir. Okay. You know, uh, Mr. Povich and Mr. Say it again. <laughs> Tapasola? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Um, I would think just for, for the both of you, I think this is a, a golden opportunity to, to come to a, a, an agreement. Uh, looked at your, your PowerPoint presentation. Um, it, it was good. And based on the information that you had at the time, now we have new information. And I think that we need to, you know, just uh, make sure that um, – what the government is presenting today in terms of those 180 locations, that those 180 locations are real. And, and I think that's an opportunity for, um, for the, the industry to get together with the government and go over those 180 locations and make sure they are real locations and that we can build uh, you know, a, 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 a working framework around that. I think this is going to be the, the best opportunity because using your argument, uh, that it, you know, if it's not put in writing, if it doesn't come together now, it can be changed later. Well, um, we should be clear. There's an election next year, so you can have mm -hmm. a different administration that uh, that just wants to do away with this all, all together. Right now, at least we have an administration that's in place. We may clearly, repeatedly have indicated in their testimony that Mayor Gray wants the uh, food truck industry to be here, to prosper here, and grow here. And I think we should use that as a basis of trying to move forward. You also have a committee here that's willing to get involved in this process to push uh, uh, to a final resolution. So I think that you know we should utilize all these uh, favorable uh, uh, positions that we have here today to come to a, to, to a good solution. And I have taken down the uh, four points that you have uh, uh, put here, uh, less ambiguity, let's be certain and clearly you know, as chair of the Committee on Business, Consumer Regulatory Affairs, and having had small local business development, you know, that's the, that's the key to any business is having certainty. So we are in agreement with that. So I think we can uh, build around that. Uh, the 10 the foot rule, for me, now that, you know, it's been determined that the 10 foot rule does not exist in the MRV, then I don't understand why it should exist outside the, the MRV, or whether or not that should be reduced to five feet. We now have different definition of what constitutes 10 feet. So let's tie them down on, on that. The 500 foot rule, you said it was, uh, was it, eight square blocks. I do believe that there should be some buffer, but I'm not sure that it should be 500 feet. Maybe it should be one square block. Uh, but these are areas where we are limiting it down to where we can uh, uh, really fashion uh, a desirable uh, compromise. 
um, like you, uh, as it relates to the ID badge, I was pretty clear that everyone has to have a, a ID badge. Now, I'm not so sure against that because from a government uh, perspective, we do want to know who's actually working, uh, who's actually subject to, to taxation, but I don't think that that's a, a, a deal breaker. Uh, so uh, I just think we're at a point where uh, if both sides can really continue working together and talking together and tie down some of these points and get certainty that the council can come up with a, a way that we can get put all this all this to bed. Your thoughts? Um, yeah, I would agree that uh, we're poised to, to work with everybody to get this thing pushed through. Um, a couple of points. One is on the ID badges. Um, I, I have to respectfully disagree that it's not a big deal um, because it, the way it's written now in the regulation is it's contrary to what I believe DCRA itself believes it should say. Um, I think they would agree that there should only be one um, licensee or one uh, employee on the truck who has the um, mobile food handling certificate. It's like a manager in a restaurant. Not every restaurant employee has a, an ID badge, if you will. So um, as I mentioned in my testimony, we have uh, people in our kitchens that never, ever get out on a truck. Um, it would be, I think, onerous to require them to um, go down and, and get those certificates and pay for, and, and pay for those badges. Um, the second piece is that I, I just want to be... Before you move sorry. on to that, I just want for those that are watching this hearing, uh, the section you're talking about is... 564.4 and it reads no individual may act as an employee of a vendor unless that individual holds a valid vendor employee identification badge issued by the DCRA director. Right. Maybe there's some fuzziness there, I'm not sure. Um, well, this is, this is time for us to get rid of the fuzziness. <laughs> right. keep, keep bringing those issues out. <laughs> right. Um, the second piece is I just want to make sure that um, when I see this map of 180 spaces in 20 or 17 locations, it, it frankly scares me a little bit because I think we have a somewhat of a misunderstanding or, or just at least a disagreement about our approach, our preferred approach to this. And it's not to um, – our sense is that the, the goal here is to create enough spaces so that in a lottery system you have more winners than losers. Um, and then if you get more trucks, then you would be compelled to create more spaces for those trucks so that everybody has a good chance of vending. Where I'm coming at this is a lot of these locations are not going to be good vending locations. Um, we know of the ones that are good vending locations now. Um, there's, a, there's probably eight or so listed on here. Um, and we are absolutely in support of a MRV type of system set up there, preferably not with a lottery, preferably with a different assignment system. But our approach is deal with the areas where there are problems now and that and, and put in the rules a process whereby uh, if another problem area comes up, you can just jump in and create another MRV location in that area. In other words, it's very dynamic. It's not based on the city or even the city and us deciding where we think these other locations should be. I can tell you, frankly, I have, I've been in this business for two and a half years. I couldn't tell you when, where a good vending location is and, and where it isn't if it hasn't already been created. I'm just not that good at predicting it, and I'm afraid that even you know, with the city and us working together, we wouldn't be able to do a good job of it. If that happens, then you're in a situation where the city has spent money, they've put up signs, they've created these zones, and nobody's going to them. And people are driving by going, you know, that's reserved for food trucks, and there's never a food truck there. I wish I could park there. So we just think it needs to be measured approach based on problems as they arise. Well, Mr. Porch, I, I would have to say that I, I mean, we do have to give the government some deference. I mean, mm -hmm. the government is here and, and regulates the, the District of, of Columbia. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that the government, what the government is doing is addressing the, the hearing now. Uh, uh, now, when you look at, say, taxi cabs, for, for example, you know, there's a limit on the amount of taxi cabs that can be in D.C. There's a limit of the amount of taxi cabs that can be in New York. And so right now, what we're looking at is there's approximately 200 trucks. And, you know, I think the government has a right to say there can only be 250, and that's, that's it. That's going to be our food truck industry. 
And uh, so I, I would just think at, at this point, the, the fact of the matter is the issues are being addressed, and we have a golden opportunity to look at it now. Uh, and you're right, probably you know, from your perspective, you may say, hey, those 180, those, those are not the legitimate 180. But still, does it get you to where you need to be you know, now? And it's up to the, the government, really, to look at, at f future growth. But we're trying to address this, 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 this issue now. And then also, the government has ascertained that the future growth for your industry could possibly be on the mall. Uh, now, however, that, that could generate some other issues, as I indicated before. Now you have individuals that have to be a part of that lottery. Uh, now, to come in and say, well, we don't like the lottery, but at the same time, this is, has been the government's uh, uh, mode of operation for some time before there was food trucks. This is what they've been utilizing. So it's hard to say, throw your lottery system out when this is what the government is used to, this is what the government has an expertise at. And uh, so that's what I'm saying. There's going to have to be some give and take here on how we operate you know, in the city. Now, I, I did write down, however, I, I think you do bring a, a great point. And when you were speaking, I was thinking uh, maybe uh, you have the lottery, but the DCRA has discretion uh, to maybe look at rotations or something like that. So there's always an opportunity for them to uh, modify what is taking place. But I would hate to say that they have to throw out their entire lottery system and come up with another system, and it doesn't fit their overall uh, methodology and, that, and that's why I'm saying that I think that we all have to go into this you know with our eyes open and looking at you know this is where we are and how do we fashion something uh, that works but at the end of the day no one's going to get exactly what, what they want uh, if we were able to uh, eliminate this 10 feet rule and, and reduce this 500 foot buffer I think you know from your perspective that you can walk out of here declaring victory. Uh, and, and, and But at the same time, the government can walk out of here declaring victory as well. So we're looking for everyone to be able, at the end of the day, to declare victory. The consumer is, 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 is the ultimate uh, ones because they're the one that's really driving this. And, uh, and, and I think a key thing that you said earlier uh, that I believe will exist is that you still have mobility may not be all the mobility that you want, but as an industry, your industry still has, has mobility. So once again, I would just say, let's keep on pushing and uh, let's tie the government down. I'm going to tell you, you're working this government. <laughs> you're, you're working them. They, they come in here and they know that you know they're now before the council and whatever they're putting on the table now, they're going to have to live with. And, and we, we're going to dot the I's and, and cross the T's on this along with you. So we're there. And I, I don't think we're that far away. Uh, so in that vein, I'm going to keep pushing in, in that vein. Uh, Mr. Russell? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I couldn't have said it better myself. I appreciate your line of questioning, and, and I appreciate you all coming to testify. I've met with you, and I understand your issues. And, um, I think it would be prudent of us to dig into the RFK versus Nationals issue that you raised today. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. um, and your ability to advertise on your, you know, on your space is your space. You should be able to advertise there. So I'm curious how that'll work out. So um, I don't have any further questions. Uh, you know, I think um, the way you laid it out is appropriate. That we're in a spot here where we can actually uh, perhaps get to a final point and move forward. Uh, there needs to be uh, flexibility, but there also needs to be regulation. So let's figure it out. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we'll hear from uh, Kathy Hollinger, Hollis Silverman, Gavin Coleman, and Andrew Klein. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, Greg Caston is going to sit in for Hollis Silverman because she had to leave. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Orange, Councilmember Grasso, members of the committee and committee staff for calling this roundtable today. I am Kathy Hollinger. 
I am the president of the Restaurant Association Metropolitan Washington. Established in 1920, REMW was formed to unite restaurant tours and food service industry professionals of the Washington area. Today, REMW has more than 700 members in Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia and Maryland, and serves as the voice of establishments ranging from casual eateries to internationally acclaimed fine dining restaurants. REMW represents an industry that brings in over $2.6 billion to the district, collects $260 million in taxes for the city's coffers, and has over 49,000 employees. Last week, REMW distributed a release with the sole, of, sole intent of bringing some clarity to the issue of mobile vending regulation in the District of Columbia. Unfortunately, clarity has been sorely missing with respect to this issue and misinformation the norm. This morning, um, DCRA and DDOT provided more of that clarity. RMW's position on the proposed regulations has been obscured, misinterpreted, misquoted, and mischaracterized frequently and unabashedly. We do want to take this opportunity to set the record straight that we do support the right of vendors, including food trucks, to continue in business and to compete fairly in the marketplace. We do believe, however, that food trucks, like all businesses which operate in the district, should be subject to reasonable regulation to assure public health and safety. Our friends in the food truck industry apparently agree with this position. Where we seem to diverge with food truck operators is with our support of the notion that the location of food trucks should be managed and regulated. The district, along with cities across the country, is grappling with the integration of an exciting emerging, emerging industry into the existing landscape of public space. One need only look across the country to see healthy, thriving food truck industries which operate under regulations that designate locations either as specific spots per truck, approved vending cluster areas, or distance to business limits. Some limit a food truck by time, 30 minutes per stop in one city, and one imposes a cap on the number of licenses. Obvious in these approaches to regulation is the inherent interest by communities and municipalities to craft regulations that fit their city's landscapes and foster healthy and reasonable growth in their food truck fleets while at the same time protecting the interests and safety of all who use the public space. Unfortunately, many have maligned REMW with the charge that REMW's concern about food truck is all about competition. Frankly, it is about competition, but competition for the use of public space. Food trucks in the District of Columbia, unlike other cities such as Austin, Texas, which restrict trucks to private property, operate on public space. In doing so, they compete with all other uses of public space, including our member restaurants and their patrons. Currently, all aspects of public space use are managed and regulated. The location of parking spaces, tree boxes, bus stops, sidewalk cafes, valet parking zones, bike lanes, and bike racks are all carefully considered, and their impact on other demands and uses of public space evaluated. As one of the most heavily regulated industries in the district, the restaurant community is not inclined to wish the type of regulatory burdens that we live with day by day on anyone. But the public space is a precious commodity and jealously guarded by the various agencies entrusted with its use and care. There is no clearer evidence of this than what it takes for a restaurant to open a sidewalk cafe. There are no less than 18 reviews before a sidewalk cafe permit is issued. From aesthetics and neighborhood integration, to utility access and ADA compliance, to fire and health safety concerns, our members' sidewalk cafe locations are scrutinized. The proposed vending regs do not come close to imposing the level of scrutiny or difficulty in designating vending locations for the same public space areas, sidewalks. 
What the proposed regulations do is outline the limitations that we all deal with on the sidewalks of the city and build the framework for assigning designated spots and delineating where it is practical and safe for mobile vendors to operate without unduly interfering with the use of public space by others. That's really it. That is the single most important goal of these regulations, building the framework for a fair, reasonable, and safe alternative to the unregulated environment we have now. What we seek and what we believe the current proposed regulations provide is a reasonable framework for managing the locations for trucks so that their operations are not unfairly disruptive to other users of public space, including our members and their patrons. We agree that the regulations may not be perfect and understand we, not, we may not necessarily agree with how the discretion granted to DCRA and DDOT is exercised, but we do not see these regulations as an end point, but merely the beginning of a reasonable system for addressing the issues at hand. Although I have spent a great deal of time talking about the impact of food trucks on public space and how the regulations address those issues, in reality that is only a very small part of the regulations before you. There are 77 sections of regulations, 75 pages. Only five sections, less than five pages, relate to the regulation of the location of food trucks. The other sections relate to many other important issues, including health department compliance, fire safety, licensing matters, and other vital health and safety matters. It would be irresponsible to discard what, as the fourth set of proposed regulations, represents thousands of hours of work simply because some imagine that they contain restrictions we do not, which do not exist in them. We strongly urge the committee to look beyond all the information that has been out there, look at the proposed regs for what they actually do for the residents, for visitors, and for businesses of the district, and send them to the full council for approval. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your uh, testimony. Uh, Greg Kaskin. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Council Member Orange. Um, my name is Greg Kasten. I, I think I have a, a relatively unique position. I'm, uh, I own a number of restaurants in Washington. I am partners in a food truck, and I'm a food distributor, and I own some commercial real estate as well. And the purpose for my coming here today was because I heard that this legislation might actually be tabled rather than work through to its end, and I'm hoping that that's not what happens. To uh, mimic what uh, Kathy had just said, I, we really think we need to get a, a ground zero starting point with some regulations, and we think it would be fair for all businesses to start somewhere, um, including the food truck operators. Most restaurateurs are not adverse to the food trucks, although some individual restaurants may have a specific purpose why they are, but most of us are not. Um, we're actually uh, in support of, of them. We just want the, the playing field to be level, and without regulation, that will never happen. The, the, that's an important point. Um, is, Mr. Kaskin, is your mic yeah. on? Is the green light on? Yeah. It is. Okay. Let me get closer. How's that? All right. I'm hoping you don't want me to go back because I don't, yeah. Um, I understand that there were new regulations or new uh, clarity to the regulations last night, and uh, I wasn't able to get up to speed with a lot of them, but I think that I, I, that's a very good thing. And from what I understand, we're, we're a whole lot closer in terms of how restaurants uh, view the situation uh, or the regulations, and that the difference is very minute and can be worked out. And I'm here to just push that, that the council would push forward with some regulations and to let the restaurateurs and the food truck operators kind of work out whatever small differences may remain, and then hopefully the food trucks can work out whatever uh, differences they may have with the government that you had brought up earlier, and, and I would counsel that they get together on that. I mean, that is really the main purpose for my being here today, and I'll end my comments at that. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Coleman? Yep. Councilman Orange, Councilman Grosso, uh, thank you for having me today to voice my concerns regarding food trucks in our city as it relates to brick and mortar restaurants. And uh, I apologize in advance as I do not relish public speaking, so hopefully I get through this all right. Um, I'm the general manager and owner of my family's restaurant, The Dubliner, which we have owned and operated on Capitol Hill for over 39 years. 
And I'm also an owner of Six Engine, a new neighborhood restaurant located at 438 Massachusetts Avenue in the Mount Vernon Triangle. The Dubliner is located at the intersection of Mass Ave, F Street, and North Capitol Street, Northwest, which is one of the main gathering points for food trucks in the district. It is not uncommon to have 15 to 20 trucks outside my restaurant on any given weekday. While there are many issues related to food trucks, a restaurant our city council needs to address, such as subjugating mobile vendors to the same health and safety standards, making contributions to bids in which they do business, and prohibiting mobile vending from playing amplified music, just to name a few. Nothing is more important than regulating their use of public space. Um, I am not proposing to the council not an outright ban on food trucks, but rather the city should regulate their operations so as to level the playing field with restaurants. I hear many arguments from food truck proponents. One popular one is that brick and mortar restaurants should simply raise the quality of their product to deal with the increased competition in their neighborhood. This is clearly an argument based outside the reality of what it takes to run a restaurant. Most restaurants have certain times of service they depend on for the business. Food trucks usually poach these high times of service, something the political director of the Food Truck Association spun today in the Washington Post as roaming to meet customer demand. Once they have saturated the market with their product, then they move on to the next hotspot, a luxury we do not have. I, on the other hand, am left to deal with a rotating food court in front of my restaurant and parking spaces intended for use by the public to visit businesses and attractions in the area. Parking spaces they often obtain in this high traffic area by sending cars down early in the morning to hold their spots until the, their truck arrives. Limiting the amount of food trucks in a given location will allow brick and mortar restaurants to understand what the competitive landscape will be day in and day out and plan for it accordingly. Another flawed argument I hear is that somehow restaurants and the RAMW represent big business trying to keep entrepreneurs from opening small business in the district, which could not be farther from the truth. The majority of members of RAMW on one or two locations, and somehow we have been made to look like big tobacco in this discussion. Two, two days ago, outside the Dubliner, I watched 30 plus customers line up, blocking two sidewalks in a public park in front of the Chick fil A truck. Is this the little guy the food truck's proponents are trying to protect? One would be naive if they believed other fast food and large restaurant corporations will not follow suit and start opening up food trucks across the city. I understand the food truck staged a demonstration this week by parking their trucks downtown but not serving any customers. I wish I had the luxury to shut down the Dubliner for a day to show my protest against the status quo regulations. But unfortunately I have a payroll with over 70 employees and must make every week, rent at the end of the month, rent to the city for the public space that I lease for my patio, not to mention countless other taxes and fees I must pay to operate in DC that food trucks are excluded from paying. I am proud to run one of the few long-standing family businesses left in DC. We have been through many highs and lows in the district for almost four decades, which is what happens when you make your roots in the community and do your best to serve it every day. I believe this goes well beyond our food and drink offerings, but also our association and participation in civic organizations, support of local schools, churches, and charities, in cooperation with police and fire departments to make our neighborhoods better for years to come. Restaurants are the small businesses that make our city great. You need look no further than the neighborhoods like 8th Street North East, U Street, 14th Street, Columbia Heights, and Barracks Row, where restaurants and bars have fueled recent development. As a restaurant opener, owner, operator, employer of over 100 employees in the district, and a district resident, it is often hard for me to see the council give so much attention to businesses that are often not even based in our city, as opposed to our restaurants 100% are based in the district. I hope the council will support their, show their support for DC restaurants and businesses like the Dubliner by restricting the number of food trucks in a given area and addressing other concerns regarding their operations, something this proposed legislation will only begin to do. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Klein? Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning, Chairman Orange, Councilmember Grasso, and uh, Council staff. My name is Andrew Klein. I'm the legislative representative of RMW. What you have before you to consider is a comprehensive set of vending reg regulations which seeks to balance the various in interests involved with respect to sidewalk vendors, stationary truck vendors, food trucks, and other businesses. I think you should keep in mind that this is the fourth proposed set of regulations, which means that these issues have been considered and reconsidered at least four times. Before these regulations came to fruition in their first draft form, there was a vending task force which, which grew out of the uh, passage of the vending law of 2009. 
So in sum, you have thousands of hours that have been spent by both government officials and private sector representatives examining these issues. So we submit that this is not, shouldn't be the beginning of the process. Um, we should be near the end of the process because these issues have been looked at very carefully. Now I know um, Chairman Orange and Council Member Grasso, you have both expressed frustration that the vote on these regulations is up or down. You weren't on the council when it happened, but that was the choice of the council when the vending law was passed. So I would ask you to look at your own institution in terms of that choice that's being given to you with respect to these regulations. That was the way it was set up. Maybe it's something that you look at differently with respect to another law or another set of regulations, but that's what we have. Uh, I want to address some of the issues that I've heard you um, concerned about today. First, the 10-foot rule. Uh, there seems to be a lot of misinformation, and we, it seems like we've made a lot of progress today in terms of getting to understand what's in these regulations. But, but I want to try to be a little clearer. What the regulations do is they try to look at areas that have the most intense vending activity and send, set up these mobile roadway vending zones, if you will. Um, that way, everyone knows where they are, businesses know where they are, customers know where they are, uh, government regulators can uh, concentrate resources on those areas. Now, with respect to areas outside the mobile roadway vending locations, which exist even in the central business district, there's a, there are certain locational requirements that the regulations set up so that everyone will have fair and easy access to the public space. We've heard about the 10-foot rule. Well, the 10-foot rule only applies outside of the mobile roadway vending areas in the central business district. What no one has mentioned this morning that I've heard thus far is outside the central business district, it's seven feet. Now, the 10-foot rule comes from, as you've heard from some people, other aspects of public space management, including location of sidewalk cafes. I'm told that inner city buses have a similar 10-foot requirement. Uh, and I'm told that it is a principle of public space management to leave 10 feet for the uh, sidewalk um, pedestrians that are walking up and down the sidewalk. That's the purpose. Now, the location of a food truck and its line with a 10-foot buffer doesn't even leave 10 feet if you, if you consider that there will be a line there. Contrast that with our sidewalk cafes. Our sidewalk cafes are required to leave, leave 10 feet clear from the front edge of the sidewalk cafe to the nearest obstruction. That is all for the pedestrians. So it doesn't matter that the sidewalk cafe may be more permanent. The point is the 10 feet is there for the pedestrians. Now, I'm embarrassed to say one of my first visits to this building was the Enclosed Sidewalk Cafe Act of 1982. So I know a little something about these issues. I've been steeped in these issues for many, many years. The 10-foot um, rule is applied uniformly. Keep in mind, with respect to a sidewalk cafe, if it's reduced to as little as six feet, which the public space regulations or the, um, the sidewalk cafe regulations allow, you also have to have space for your, for your sidewalk cafe. So assuming that there's at least four feet or five feet for your cafe, even if it's reduced to as little as six, there's a minimum of 10 or 11 feet there, which is all that's being requested of the uh, mobile roadway vendors in the central business district. Now, this notion that there aren't any spots, we still saw the map this morning that seems to indicate that there aren't any spots. Attached to my testimony, you'll see four photos. Um, these are just random locations within the district. If you will look at those, you will see um, tape measure on the sidewalk, um, the first one is the 1400 block of Massachusetts Avenue, the south side of the street. There's clearly more than 10 feet there. This is an area that's reflected on the Food Truck Association map as off limits for trucks. Simply not true. If you look at the second photo, the unit block of Massachusetts Avenue, the south side, same thing, plenty of space. In fact, you'll see plenty of food trucks there. Obviously, a de desirable location. If it's not within an MRV, um, it would still meet the requirements. Two other photos there. Um, my time is almost up, so I want to make one other point, and that is this. Um, the other issue that we've heard about is the 500-foot buffer. The idea is 
these trucks don't operate in a vacuum. I mean, to suggest that they're there and, and they're there for the enjoyment of, of patrons, which they are, and they have no effects on anyone else, one else in the neighborhood. They don't take up parking spaces. They do, of course. Um, that they don't impede people's ability to get up the, get up the sidewalk. They do. Um, they, they interfere with visibility of other businesses. They do all of these things. So the reason that there's a 500 foot buffer is to say, okay, we will concentrate a certain number of trucks within a central area and then outside that area, so we don't just have a continuation of that concentration, we have a buffer. In sum, we think what you have before you is a reasonable set of regulations. Is everybody happy? We're not happy. We think 19 trucks around Farragut Square with all the activity that's there is, is, is too much. But Council Member Orange, as you said at the outset of this hearing, if everybody were happy, it certainly wouldn't be a very good compromise. Thank you for your time. Okay. Well, thank you all uh, for your uh, uh, testimony um, here, to, here today. Um, obviously, uh, Mr. Caskney, we know each other. I frequent your, your establishments uh, qu quite a bit. Uh, Mr. Coleman, I love the fish and chips at, at the Dublin. I'm, 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 I'm there as, as, as well, especially during the three years I attended uh, Georgetown uh, uh, Law School for my LOM and tax. So I definitely am very uh, familiar with uh, with your establishments and I support them. Uh, Ms. Hollinger and I, we've been knowing each other for a very long time, we leadership Washington together in the Mind Trust and, and so, you know, I have a, a big respect for you and Mr. Klein, you've always represented the, the industry uh, for, for uh, as long as I've known you. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I would have to say that uh, I, I think, you know, Ms. Ms. Hollinger, you know, has put it, uh, you know, very succinctly and that is that uh, the Restaurant Association is not against the, the food trucks. Just looking for something that's reasonable, something that's fair, and something that, that, that works. Uh, but I would say, Mr. Klein, that you know, we have to look at the reality of the day. If uh, we were to vote today on, on these regulations, I can tell you that these regulations are not going to pass. So therefore, it is my job as chairman of the committee to try to fashion something, some type of compromise where we can keep working with the regulations that are before us without sending them back and then we're another, we'll be at our fifth or sixth uh, examination of, 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 of these regulations. I think what we have been able to do today is push people to a point to where these regulations would some minor tweaks can move forward and we can get this in place before the end of this calendar year. Uh, and so it's in that vein in, in which I'm working in to try to get the, uh, the food truck industry and DCRA to go back again and come up with something that I can really push the council to approve indirectly. But if it was come to a vote right now, these regulations would not make it out of this committee. And that's just the reality. I mean, you just look at it, count the votes. It's not coming out. So with that being the case, we have to keep pushing, and I think we're, we're there. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, there can be a solution that can be fashioned in that at least before we go on recess on July 15th and prior to the June 22nd up or down date that we have a compromise in place. And I think that that's what you would want as, as well. Uh, so that's how we're pushing it, and that's what I'm kind of feeling from uh, my other colleagues. I can't speak for them, but I, I do believe that the, the votes are, are, are not there. So, just in, in due respect to what you say about a compromise, from what I've heard today, it seems that it's constantly a compromise between the Food Truck Association and the D.C. government. You keep addressing two main issues that the Truck Association has that if you could resolve, they would be happy, but without speaking to restaurants concerns I'm here today because I'm heavily affected by food trucks I guarantee you if more restaurants were affected as I would you'd have 2,000 restaurants here and not an association that represents 60 food trucks you know this is a, this is the same problem you have in city council about anything to do with from homeless shelters which we deal with down by the Dubliner it's things like that it's always not in my backyard but I want it so I want food trucks as long as it doesn't affect me so I think when you find out that the restaurants have other points and issues that need to be looked at in a full compromise, then it goes beyond just appeasing the government 
in the District Food Truck Association? Well, I, I would, uh, I guess I have to have to disagree with you because it's really based on Miss um, Hollinger's and, and her letter uh, yesterday that I, that I went through thoroughly, and even her testimony here, here today. Uh, the Restaurant Association is pushing for uh, uh, these regulations to be adopted. And, and at this point, the, uh, what I'm hearing from, from uh, the association is let, let's don't throw this out and let's don't go back and have another, you know, team of people come in and, and we have to get this done. I mean, I think we're almost at the finish line. And I'm just trying to get us over where we can score the touchdown now. Uh, but I'm also being realistic and knowing my committee and knowing where the votes are. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's really the, the reality. It doesn't matter what happened in 2009. It, it was, it's what happens today in 2013. That's what we're looking at. And uh, I just think that, that you're there. I, I think that the fact that uh, the industry has been working hard and you've been working hard, you've now forced DCRA and DDOT to come up with 170 locations, 180 locations. Three weeks ago, we didn't have that information. Three weeks ago, I was thinking that, uh, hey, there's, you get a minimum of three, but I don't know what else is going to take, take place. But that information is now on, on the table. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I didn't realize that the 10-foot uh, the rule did, did not operate in the MRV area. So if it doesn't operate in the MRV area, then, uh, you know, what's the basis for that? Why is there the discrimination? So these are all the issues that are being flushed out. But I think that if we keep pushing, we can come to something. And you're right. Everybody's not going to be happy. I don't think that the food truck is, uh, industry is, is, is going to be happy where we are right now. I mean, I just told Mr. Povich, like, you know, if you look at the taxi cab industry, you can only have a certain amount of license. And, and so I know they're looking at growth. I and mean, There could be 500 trucks. But no, that's not what the government has said. We can give you 80 locations downtown now. Let's look at these 180 locations and let's spread them out. The government is saying you get 19 in Farragut, uh, in the Farragut West, the Farragut North locations. You can get 10 in other locations. Uh, I just talked to students from GW. Uh, they, they're a little upset because this plan says you can only get three. In, in G, GW, they're telling me they're operating right now. They get 10 or 12 trucks every day. So at the end of the day, it's about compromise, and it's about whether or not people want to keep pushing forward to work this out, or we start all over again from square one. And I really don't want to start from square, square one again, and that we start this all over again. I think what we have here is the basis of, of moving forward, uh, and that is something that, that we can work with. So that's, that's the angle that I'm working and trying to push my colleagues to, uh, you know, let's come up with a solution. And, and move forward. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Council Member uh, Mr. Grosso. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to say thank you all for coming down and for, you know, bringing this up and coming in a meeting with me and talking through these issues. Um, I, I, I mean, I think it's important for us to take them seriously. And, you know, Ms. Hollinger, like you noted in your testimony, you've been on the other side of this before, so you really understand this is this is not something that anybody takes lightly in the business community when it comes to a regulatory framework. Um, and I don't think that these questions that they're asking are that unusual, you know, for certainty and for not an ambiguous approach and uh, for a way to them to do business in the District of Columbia that allows them to, you know, operate in a way that they're sure they can actually succeed. I, I also understand the concerns that you've raised, um, and I think they're important to consider as they continue to move forward. Mr. Klein, you and I have worked on regulations before and on bills before, and you know um, that you've said to me many times, Four times isn't enough. We got to keep working on this. And so, you know, I realize your argument is is that there's a lot of time that's been put in this, but we also recognize that it's important to get it right. Um, we're not going to get it right for everybody. That's the reality, and everyone should understand that. Uh, that's how. We, that's why it's important for us to continue to move forward and try to keep making it better and better. I do want to ask one question. Um, you mentioned that, that with this 10 foot rule, I'm really trying to get my head around it still. When you when you have a permanent structure, really, or close to permanent structure with the outdoor patio that you know that is something that in and of itself can't move you have to move it um, when you have a line with people in line they can move out of the way and I've walked through these lines and I know they're inconvenient and I don't want you know uh, you know I, I know that it's not perfect I think it should be better line management for sure but it is a different when I say excuse me to somebody who's standing in line uh, 10 times out of 10 the person said sure and backed up and let me go on through um, 
that's not the case with a permanent object. You can't do that. So there is a distinction there. I don't know if you can reflect on that uh, with that 10 foot issue. Yeah, it's a non sequitur. Um, the Sandlot Cafe, I mean, the Sandlot Cafe extends from the building a certain amount of feet. The 10 feet is outside of that. Right, we'll reserve the space. We'll reserve the space. We're right. saying you leave 10 feet and you can even occupy some of it with your lines. So the, the um, requirement for the food trucks is actually less onerous than it is on the sidewalk cafes because the sidewalk cafes have to confine their business outside of that 10 feet and leave the 10 feet clear. Right, right. Whereas the trucks, we're saying have 10 feet and you can, you can even use that 10 feet for your patrons and, and, and for whatever other activities incidentally to your truck well, I think that makes some sense with regulations. Yeah, but I think they're, it's a little hard to do a comparison is what you're saying. I mean, they don't really match the, the one to one. I mean, because it's two different and it's two different things going on here. And I understand what you're saying is all, you're, all these regs do is require that 10 feet space be made available, but the line can be in that 10 feet. Whereas with the cafe or whatever, you have the the actual space has to be reserved for that, for whatever happens outside of there. Right. In other words, we, for cafe, we need 10 feet, mm -hmm. plus we need space for our cafe. Um, and, and our cafe does not intrude upon the 10 feet that must be left clear for pedestrian passageway. Right. For the, for the food trucks, all we're saying is, we'll leave 10 feet clear for pedestrians, and if part of your business activity intrudes on that 10 feet as, as it must, that's fine, and not an issue. But to suggest okay. that somehow the 10 feet is unfair or unusual, it's, it's a standard that's used with respect to pedestrian management all over the city. Your, your, your folks at DDOT will tell you that in public space management. That's what they use, is the 10 feet. And then these regulations look at seven feet outside the central business district. Now, cafes outside the central business district are required to leave 10, although the committee, in looking at an individual situation, can reduce it to, to as little as six. Okay. But obviously, where a truck's going to park, you're not going to have a committee review. You need you need a, you need a bright yeah, line you know, I, I completely understand what you're saying now, and I appreciate the clarification. Now, although, I, mean, I still think line management is something we need to push for, whether oh, sure, it's either. 10 feet or 5 feet or 7 feet or 12 feet. Um, you know, I, I'm... I'm sympathetic, Mr. Coleman, to your point of view on this, and and uh, you know I'm, I'm I'm hoping that the Restaurant Association and that you and others will continue to be involved in this as we try to get it to the right spot, uh, and that it's not just about one industry versus the government. I think it's the whole city that has to work on this together, and I think that's been done. I mean, I think to this point we've had that kind of engagement and involvement, and we should continue continue to do that. Um, I, I'm hopeful in that. I'll just tell you a story. When I came right out of law school, I also went to Georgetown Law, so I frequented not just the Dubliner, but the Irish Times probably too much. But uh, I had a good time, and I think your restaurant's a great restaurant. The, 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 the thing is, though, when I came in there, and, I, and I, my first job on the council was to work on getting the Prompt Pay Act pay, uh, passed, um, which is a health care industry type thing. And they've been working on it for a couple of years, you know, and this was a challenging thing between insurance companies and hospitals and other providers. And the, my boss at the time said, you know, I need you to go in and figure this out and make sure that we can get it done right. And so I went into this situation and, you know, it took us, we started holding regular meetings and trying to figure it out. It took us over a year, uh, meeting over at the Department of Insurance and, and figuring this out, even though people thought we were already at the conclusion when we got there. And so... I'm not thinking that we're that far behind here. I think that we are very close. I think we should listen to what Councilmember Orange is saying and recognize that this is not going to be a long delay, that this is something that we can count on all the work that's being done to get to where we need to go next. And the council has an obligation, I think, at this point to, to step in and help finish this off. So um, I look forward to continuing to work with you guys and getting this done right. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for coming down today. Thanks. Uh, next, we'll hear from Sir Brett Tanwazuzer, Matt Giller, Christy Whitfield, and Justin Villarillo.
Uh, we'll start with Brett. Is it Tarnit, sir. Tarnit, sir? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, council members for the opportunity to speak. My name is Brett Tarnitzer, and I live on Capitol Hill in Ward 6 and frequently visit the food trucks near L'Enfant Plaza where I work. I've been engaged in designing and implementing market-based mechanisms to allocate public resources for nearly 20 years. I'm currently an assistant bureau chief in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau at the Federal Communications Commission, where I manage the auction design portions of uh, an incentive auction program for the agency. I was also part of the team that designed and implemented the first spectrum auctions for the FCC. My remarks this morning are my personal views and are in no way meant to represent the views of the FCC. Um, I'm pleased for the opportunity to use my experience in implementing assignment mechanisms for public goods to provide testimony today on the proposed vending regulations. I have read the proposed regulations, and as a food truck visiting citizen, I have some concerns regarding how DC proposed to assign vending spaces for food trucks. While my professional experience involves designing and implementing auctions, I am not advocating that the DC government implement a pure market-based mechanism like an auction for MRB locations, nor am I advocating that the DC government implement a purely random process, a game of chance like the lottery that's provided in the proposed rules. Based on my experience, I believe the right answer is a hybrid approach that is simple to implement but takes into account consumer preferences in the form of letting trucks prioritize their preferred vending locations as indicated by consumer demand. I believe a rotational allocation mechanism is considerably better option for the district, the food trucks, and the hungry citizens of DC. My written testimony includes more details, including the process by which a rotational allocation mechanism could be chosen and some illustrative results. The bottom line is I think there's a simple way that the DC government can allocate the MRV locations in a fair and efficient manner, and I'm here today to offer some insight. When designing an assignment mechanism for a public resource, the city needs to define its objectives. Those might be some combination of the following, that it serves the public good. After all, this should be first about letting DC citizens have access to food trucks. That it results in an efficient allocation of the scarce resource, the slots for trucks. That it's easy to administer for the government and the food trucks. That it's transparent and fair to all applicants. And finally, that it provides an appropriate return for the government and for the taxpayers of DC. Of course, there's various trade-offs to balance when designing this allocation mechanism. For example, while a lottery process like the one that was proposed may seem attractive because it's easy and transparent, there are certainly serious issues with fairness and efficiency due to the lack of a market-based component and a lack of certainty and stability. The FCC actually tried to create a lottery process for spectrum licenses in the 1980s as a way to create a simple and speedier process than the previous administrative process, which was time consuming and prone to litigation. The FCC found the lottery approach deficient in many of the same ways I think it would be for these food trucks. First, because of its random nature, the lottery can arbitrarily result in big winners and big losers and an inequitable distribution of the MRV locations across applicants. This impacts both the trucks and consumers. Second, the lottery doesn't account for the fact that not all spots are created equal. A random lottery process does not take into consideration variations in the value of spaces based on the different locations and days of the week and is therefore an inefficient allocation mechanism. A simple lottery structure assigns location or days and days of the week randomly among applicants. Further, if you don't factor in some sort of market pricing for more valuable spots, the district could be foregoing revenue. The frequent lottery process also seems a burden to me. Um, holding the lottery process once a month seems excessively burdensome for both the city and for the truck owners and operators. From my perspective, in addition to the uncertainty from the lottery, this seems painful to administer for both the government and the food trucks. Fourth, the gaming of lotteries is commonplace, as entrants are encouraged to find ways to increase their chances of getting good spots. Controlling for this requires more regulations and more, regu and more enforcement, both of which are costly for the city. So what should DC do? I advocate scrapping the lottery approach and starting with a simple rotational assignment process. 
a simple quarterly rotation um, is far superior to uh, a random approach since it assigns an equitable share of prime spots to each mobile vendor each month, recognizing the value of prime locations and the preference of operators as driven by consumer demand. How might this work? So first, in order to participate, a mobile vendor would have to meet certain minimum regulatory requirements. They could then apply for spots by filling out an application where they'd rank their preferred locations and days of the week from highest to lowest, pay an application fee, and agree for pay to pay for all their allotted spaces. Qualified applicants could be assigned a random number then and ranked, um, and a list is created from, from that ranking, and you start with the lowest um, random number. The first vendor is randomly in the randomly ordered list is given its highest preference. Maybe it's Navy Yard on Friday. Then this vendor's preferences for the other locations on that day are removed from the list since it can't be in two places at once. Um, the vendor then goes to the bottom of the list and the number of slots on this day at this location is reduced by one. You proceed in this fashion, taking mobile vendors from the top of the list and giving it its highest available preference. The process simply stops when all the locations for the day are filled. If there's excess demand, those trucks could use other legal spots that are not part of the rotation. Um, new vendors and new spots could be added in the next quarter to adjust for changes in, in, the, uh, in the market. So there are several advantages of this. Um, it, it results in an equitable distribution of the spaces to participants and doesn't include lucky and unlucky outliers. Um, the applicant's preferences are taken into account in the mechanism, resulting in fewer complaints and unallocated spaces since all participants are assigned some good and some bad locations or days of the week. Consumer preferences are also taken into account by recognizing that not all locations are the same, so trucks can buy to serve high traffic areas. The mechanism is highly flexible and would allow the government to enhance the mechanism over time. For example, setting different prices for locations or days of the week could be included in the process and could be, uh, and they could be as easily incorporated into the random process. In wrapping up quickly, um, I've got almost 20 years of experience in setting up and running such programs for governments, and I can honestly say that the approach that I've outlined is easily implemented and in the best interest of the large population that are enjoying the vibrant food truck scene here in D.C. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Geller? Hi. Th thank you, Chairperson. Um, my name is Matthew Geller. I run the Southern California Mobile Food Vendors Association. We're the largest food truck advocacy organization, and we were the first ones to uh, form in January 2010. We're in probably the largest market for food trucks uh, in the country. Um, while permits range for, there are about 2,600 permits in the county of Los Angeles, about 250 of those are the gourmet variety, and the rest are ice cream trucks, traditional, or traditional um, taco vendors. Our industry in Los Angeles is thriving, and the reason for that is our regulations are really public safety based. What I mean by that is we don't have restaurant buffers, we don't have lottery allocation, we don't have you know, anything really other than food trucks go where customers want them. But it's important that these food, what these food trucks have come to find out is that their brand is very important, and burning out their brand is one of the things that will put them out of business pretty quickly. So you don't see a food truck on Wilshire Boulevard three days in a row. And they'll go to Wilshire Boulevard and they may come back the next week or two weeks later to ensure that when they come back, people are excited to see them. The history of Los Angeles vending really starts at the end of the 1800s with horse-drawn tamale carriages. Uh, but the new version is like the, the 1970s when we, the state allowed cook-aboard trucks. But what happened was, because it was an immigrant business, um, there was a lot of crazy regulations against them and so the state decided that in, in 1985 that all regulations that cities created had to be public safety oriented. So uh, I heard somebody talking about time limits and you know we had time limits and um, restaurant restrictions and those types of things and over the last few years most of those regulations have been thrown out. Now what hasn't been thrown out is distance to schools, blocking, uh, blocking um, sight lines on intersections. And so that's what's allowed our, our industry to really thrive. Now, one of the things that 
you know, we deal with public space as well. Um, Los Angeles is notorious for people getting in cars and just driving somewhere and getting out. And we actually don't use our public space. Food trucks are the first time, and this is from the, uh, a statement from the planning department, that they've actually seen people use public space. But we had those same conversations about, oh, well, this is a sidewalk vendor, or this is a sidewalk patio. And this is a um, and this is a food truck, and it's not fair. So we had the same conversations about three years ago. And what we kind of came to the conclusion of a, 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 rest, a food truck is not like a patio. A food truck is like a walk-up to go window. And we have a lot of those, especially by the beach. And so there are no limitations on the size of sidewalks, and we've found that there hasn't been any issues with that, even in large scale uh, food truck events where we've got 30 trucks parked on the street. As been said many times here today, planning is paramount. A lottery system does not allow a food truck owner to, to plan. And what we've seen with the food truck industry is when they're allowed to plan, when they're allowed to go where they need to go, you know, with, with public safety regulations, they thrive. We have 16 members that have created, that have opened up brick and mortars because they have an understanding of where they have to go. So they say, oh, I'm going here, there. Now I decide Pico Boulevard, that's where I'm going to open up my restaurant. And all of them still, you know, they some of them have been open as long as two and a half years, and they're thriving. And they were thriving because their ability to gauge the market and move around. I traveled around the country last year. Last August, I was in Chicago uh, speaking to the licensing board right before they passed their regulation on the 200-foot buffer zone. Um, I've been all through California. There are 88 cities in Los Angeles County alone, and I've probably met with 50 of them. Um, it's, you know, when you look out among the food truck uh, markets throughout the country, and I've been through to most to many of them. I will say that DC stands up there in top three. Um, at how great it is! It, you know, we we watch it from Los Angeles. We, you know, my members watch the brands coming out of DC, uh, and it's it's a really it's an amazing. It's something to be proud of for the district. I think with these types of regulations, however, and most, you know, and I agree with the, the Food Truck Association that most of them are great, but there are a few things that just need to be ironed out to make, and to make D.C. and to continue in D.C.'s kind of pathway to being really one of the top three. Uh, I'm, I'm biased for Los Angeles, so I'll just say top three. Uh, one of the top three um, industries in, in the country. And it's... Um, it's great because a lot of cities are wrestling with this. I mean, I was in Philly last week. I'm going to Baton Rouge next week and, um, and New Orleans. And people are trying to figure this out. But I think you guys are really on the right path. And with this, uh, you know, if you can just get these last things hammered out, you're really going to have a thriving industry. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Whitfield? Uh, good morning. Good morning, morning. Councilmember Orange, Councilman Grosso. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. Oh, I'm a little nervous. Um, my name is Christy Whitfield, and, and I own Curbside cu Cupcakes with my husband. And I'm here today as a business owner and, uh, and a longtime D.C. resident to ask you to send the proposed vending regulations back to the mayor. Um, you know, we've already heard a lot today, and I looked through my testimony, and a lot of it's been covered, so I don't want to be overly repetitive. Um, I do want to say in, in direct reaction to the, to the previous panel, you know, I am... I am the little guy that the, the, the food trucks represent. I'm here today with my husband and my son over there <laughs> to try and save our businesses and our livelihoods. Um, the, the idea that we should pass these regulations right now because we have to start somewhere, because we have something, and because we've spent a lot of hours with something is, is, is ridiculous. It, it trivializes the livelihoods of the people who have poured everything into these businesses. And it's, um, and it's disrespectful to the efforts that we've put in and to the process. You know, the fact that we've come this far is a testimony to what, what the city has done. But um, now is not the time to stop because we're tired or it's inconvenient. And so I, I appreciate your comments that you're going to try and get us to, to the right solution as opposed to basically taking a knee and saying, whew, I'm tired, let's just start here and see if, you know, see what lasts. So I thank you for that because you probably saved my business with that perspective. Um, I'll read portions of what I wrote. You know, these regulations protect brick and mortar businesses from competition. 
They arbitrarily restrict access to food trucks to meet demonstrated customer demand and will ultimately put many of us out of business, not for valid health and safety reasons, but to protect brick and mortar restaurants from having to compete for customers. You know, Washington, D.C. Is, is one of the smartest, savviest, well-educated cities in the country. Um, customers deserve choices, and customers don't need the government to help them choose what lunch options they should choose from. The, uh, the lottery system stands in between businesses and customers in a way that only serves to limit competition, and it's, a, it's an inappropriate use of, of regulation. Um, as we've all mentioned, we've been working on vending regulations for years, and in 2010, the food truck detractors were a little bit more honest about what they didn't like about food trucks. My colleague from the uh, Dubliner said, this impacts my business. It's hard to plan. And what does that mean? That means competition. So I'm here today to say, don't, you know, don't limit competition. Let customers decide how and where they spend their, their dollars. Um, I'm going to skip forward to, to maps because I'm watching the clock. Um, you know, Mayor Gray has, has, has sent you rules that on, the, on this face are, are limiting competition, and we have now a system of dueling maps. <laughs> My map and the Food Truck Association's map and maybe the Restaurant Association will come up with a map. I want to encourage City Council to avoid the temptation of editing maps. You know, the maps are a symptom of the real problem, which is that Mayor Gray has sent you regulations that are not good for the city. You know, please hold this mayor accountable. Task him with fixing these regulations. Task him with addressing the real issues and not the red herrings that have prolonged this process for years. Insist that the new regulations are fair without protecting one type of business from another. Insist that the regulations are clear and objective so that everyone understands how vending will be regulated. And finally, please insist that he do this quickly because as we wait for real regulations, my business and my livelihood are hanging in the balance. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Valtero? Villarello. Okay. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, staying uh, for this and for everyone who's in the, in the audience. Uh, it's, it's really an amazing uh, place to be right now because it's such an identity of our city. Um, so thank you for addressing the important issue at hand by calling this hearing on the fourth proposed rulemaking on street vending. My name is Justin Vitarello. I'm born and raised in the district, specifically Ward 1, Adams Morgan, where my parents vending in the first Adams Morgan day. My family has been involved in the D.C. community for many years, from low-income housing to mentoring at-risk youth to human rights activism. My family is middle class and has put our time and money into this industry during the recession. My mother is my mother. She's my friend and she's my business partner. She's technically the CFO of my company. I personally have dedicated over 16,000 hours into this industry, with less, probably around a dozen weekends of rest over the last five years. The company that I operate, Fergal Brothers, was the first food truck in D.C. We recently, in November, recognized as the number two food truck company in the U.S., very proud of that. I'm very proud of all the fellow entrepreneurs in this segment of the food industry uh, that have joined me today, as well as the communities of people in the city that dine, support, and gather around our mobile establishments. I stress mobile establishments. I start by posing the question, how can we make D.C. the best city in the world to live, work, and visit? Any city that has such large aspirations will most likely fo focus on a robust eating scene that revolves around building community. Vibrant vending would have to be included in 2013. Our industry has received unprecedented <coughs> national and global media attention. DC should embrace this reality and run with it. I do not support these, three, uh, these regulations for the following three reasons. The 10-foot rule, as we talked about, it restricts and kills the mobility that is the fundamental attraction between us and our customers. That's why I stress the mobile establishment. If we just have MRVs and we can't go anywhere else, we're now the past. Number two, we should be allowed to meet the community needs, whether it's 2 p.m. or 2 a.m., specifically oppose the hours of operation. Most restaurants have the ability to be open 24 hours. 
They just choose not to. In a city with a height restriction, people move to different parts of the city at different times of the day, and food trucks should be able to meet those demands. Three, the MRV location should be expanded to locations where people live, um, and not just so much concentrated around uh, downtown. There are three reasons why food trucks are great for this city. Our mobility, our mobile nature allows us to activate public space and or enhance the value of private land. Our industry can go into development projects where retail usually lags anywhere from six to nine months. Franklin Square is a great example of activation of public space. Everyone's seen what the food trucks have done there to activate that space. The proposed regulations prevent these benefits. Number two is we're logistically set up to service the entire city, including addressing the food desert dilemma. The proposed regulations would, would put many of us out of business before having a chance to help in this area. Number three, we're naturally capable to assist in the safety of the city. We are the eyes and ears on the street. The limitation on hours of operation, <clears throat> combined with the 10-foot rule, would prohibit us from contributing towards a safer city. A final question. Food establishments in a certain section of town seem to be frustrated with the emergence of the food trucks, but what are the feelings of the landowners and the constituents throughout the entire district? My company is personally being approached by landowners that are very interested in working with this to enhance the value of their land. The proposed regulations do not allow us to roam like we want to do and like the people want us to do. They turn food trucks into brick and mortars that have assigned places to go. If we can't meet the people where they are, both literally and figuratively, then the rules are not progressive enough for a city that wants to be one of the best in 2013. Thank you for listening and your time. I know this must be hard for all of you, balancing the varied interest. So I applaud you for taking this on, and good luck. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Uh, I really want to thank you all for coming down and, and testifying. Uh, you know, as I uh, indicated before, uh, you know, we're going to keep pushing and we're going to try to get, get, get this resolved. And um, so it may not be what everybody wants and what everybody desires, but uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, especially looking at other jurisdictions, I think D.C. Is, is, is in the forefront, and I do believe that the, uh, the food truck industry is here to stay. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we're going to uh, move in, in that vein. Uh, I'm looking here, um, you know, uh, the report by uh, Timothy P. Carney. And this was uh, back on April 1 when he talked about in Chicago. In Chicago, uh, they're very brazen in their restaurant protectionism. And in fact, the Chicago uh, alderman, Tom Tooney, who owned uh, a chain of, of restaurants, and I believe he also was the head of the Restaurant Association, uh, they made sure that the restaurants prevailed. The, the city prohibits food trucks from selling within 200 feet of a brick and mortar restaurant. Uh, and, uh, and that's uh, within 200 feet of brick and mortar restaurants, coffee shops, uh, any, and anyone else that, that are selling items. So basically, uh, they turned the downtown loop in Chicago into a no food truck zone. Mm -hmm. And we have Kathy Hollinger, who's the head of the Restaurant Association. That's not her intent. And, and I think that we should look at it in that vein. She's here to say that we can all exist here together. And so uh, even looking at uh, what he talked about in El Paso, uh, that their 2009 anti-truck rule has an even bigger radius, a 1,000 feet uh, 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 around any brick and mortar establishment that sells food. We're not trying to do that here in, in the District of Columbia. So I'm looking at these regulations and seeing how we can tweak those and move forward. Let's get something on, on the books. And as time goes on, we have to tweak it again that's the reason why you have legislators. We can create laws anytime we want. Just have to make sure you get seven people that think alike on a certain law. And if you want to really be powerful, come up with nine votes, and it doesn't matter what the mayor says. We can override that. So this is where we find ourselves today, and I think we're extremely close. And I'm going to uh, you know, make sure that we continue to push it. I think the stars have, uh, have lined up for, for everyone in, in this particular case. You can have a different chairman in this seat. You can have a different people on this committee that have a different frame of reference, a different point of view. But it appears at this point that all of us are moving toward, uh, uh, you know, the, the one desire, and that is to make sure 
that the consumers and the citizens of the District of Columbia have choice on where they eat and what they desire to eat and when they want to eat it, but there has to be compromise as well because we're also the person that wants to park every day. Uh, <laughs> you know, the Golden Triangle is concerned about trash. You know, the uh, Department of Health is going to be uh, concerned about the, the, the health code violations. So there's a number of things that we have to take under consideration, uh, but I, I think we're there. I don't have any questions for this panel. I just want to thank you for, for coming down. Mr. Grosso? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's pretty amazing to have a panel of people with so much experience, and I appreciate that, uh, that uh, diverse experience as well. Um, to start with, uh, the the lottery stuff you're talking about, the Federal Communications Commission, your recommendations yeah. towards the end there sound awfully similar to what they're recommending at DCRA. It didn't sound like it was that different. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, when you read the, the regulations and it um, talks just about the lottery, um, what I just lately heard about this idea of the rotations and or about um, people who aren't in getting in later, I, I think there's the ability to compromise. Yeah. And make something more like a rotational yeah, assignment that, work. Yeah. Um, so I, I just think the use of the word lottery in the regulations as sort of the only definition there is the wrong, wrong thing to do. So if you had another pass at it, I would say that it should be the assignment mechanism, yeah, well, giving yeah, flexibility yeah. to do it. And um, you know, some, some of the food truck vendors may not agree with that, but I think it's a reasonable compromise as a way to take preferences into account when assigning these spots. Yeah, I think the um, something like the space assignment matrix. Or something. There you go. Yeah, yeah. See, it's all, it, it's all in the acronym. So, um, but I, I want to say if there is something like that, it has to be in tandem with a marketplace that's able to be created outside of that area. Absolutely. So if we can't, if we can't create the marketplace, the mobile marketplace, the influx of people who came in in 2009 when President Obama was elected, the, the lifestyle and how they're operating, that's what we're meeting, right? That's what, we're, that's what this industry is meeting. It's important that the marketplace uh, grows outside of these areas that are high trafficked for public safety and some other reasons that need to be assigned. But everything else, the market should, should, should prevail. I, well, think, and with I a, think that's a good point. Uh, did you want to add something to that, Mr. Well, I was, with, a, with a clear articulation of what the, the purpose of a quote unquote buffer is, you know, the, these setbacks mm -hmm. and what exactly they're protecting should be articulated because if it's not competition, then what are we protecting with the buffers? If the if the trucks aren't asking for a protection around the MRVs, who is being protected right. by I that buffer? I think Chairman Orange brought that up earlier, and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and something that should continue to be explored. And I absolutely agree. And I think um, you know, outside of the MRVs uh, and outside of the kind of downtown business district, I think there's still going to be pretty considerable freedom in these regulations to go where you need to go. Um, but uh, that has to be articulated and it has to be stated up front that that's the intention and that's where certainty comes in. It's like almost saying we got to be certain and unambiguous about being free to go do what we need to do. That's kind of an well, if you have an entrepreneur on one side who's um, trying to create a market and you've got a willing you know, consumer base on their side that's willing to research, follow, put their shoes on, go there, like, that's a market. Right. So, like, for example, uh, I live in Brookland community. Uh, we're fixing to have a whole lot of residents come in that neighborhood with the new development that's happening. There's no consideration right now where the food trucks would set up or not set up and be engaged there. And the question is, how does that evolve kind of um, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, fair manner that everyone can take advantage of? I will note, though, I think, Mr. Geller, it's a little bit different than here than it is in L.A. Um, the obvious uh, difference is the size. You are how many square miles? 400. How many? 400, maybe. Yeah. And uh, what are we here? I don't remember, 6.4 or something like that? I mean, but we it, do have concentrations of food trucks. You, know, you think of the size of Los Angeles, but the places that they are servicing, they're servicing the west side, the Wilshire right. Corridor, downtown. So there are... Um, you know, while Los Angeles is massive, they're not being, you know, they're not everywhere. They right. are. How many food trucks did you say you had? About 200 that were. 250 more, more of the tourists. Yeah, so, slash. I mean, you see what I'm saying? Like, oh, no. If I were a food truck owner there, I'd be like, well, this place is not good. I can go there. I can go there. It makes sense. Here, it's a little more competitive, uh, a little bit more difficult. I think you have to recognize that. And I'm not, and I'm not uh, saying, you know, my, my, statement was really talking about our public safety concerns okay. and there are public safety concerns with having a you know a smaller area with more food trucks and um, 
you know, just more people. So I'm not, you know, I'm not advocating a free for all. Right. Uh, it works really well in Los Angeles because it's not, and it's, it isn't a free for all. Trust me. But I am um, just saying that as you look at these regulations, I'm always somebody that says, is there a public safety concern? And a lot of times, cars blocking traffic and. That's a public safety concern. concern. So go towards fixing the public safety concern and not, you know, um, competition issues or things right. like that. I couldn't agree more. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Uh, next, we'll hear from Paul Cohen, Nicola Whitman, Caroline Cougar, John Gaber. Christina Kern. Okay, Ms. Whitman, you may begin. Uh, Ms. Kruger will present our testimony. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, I'm Chairperson Orange, Council members and staff. Um, I am Caroline Kruger. I'm a regional property manager with Boston Properties. We own and manage almost 3.7 million square feet of office and retail space in the district. I also serve as the 2013 president of the Apartment and Office Building Association of Metropolitan Washington, known as AOBA. With me today is Nicola Whiteman. This Nicola is AOBA's Vice President of Government Affairs. Here in the district, AOBA members own and manage over 48,000 apartment homes, uh, more than one-third of the city's private rental housing stock. Our members also own and manage over 77 million square feet of commercial space in the district. That's approximately two-thirds of the total private inventory. We are pleased to testify here today. AOPA believes that a comprehensive regulatory framework for vending can enhance the economic vibrancy of the district. AOPA supports street vending. If done correctly, street vending can add to the economic vibrancy of the city by adding diversity to our retail offerings and by serving as a biz business incubator for our citizens. However, achieving this goal requires the district to adopt a comprehensive and holistic approach to vending. AOBA believes that the proposed regulations is a first step towards achieving this comprehensive and holistic approach. The legislation proposes a regulatory framework that for the first time incorporates provisions apl applicable to mobile vending trucks. There are many and often changing interests for use of the public space, as has been noted here today. There are all types of vendors. There's the restaurants with outdoor space, signage, um, just to name a few. Management of the seemingly competing interests requires the district to truly take ownership of the public space and to take ownership of the regulation of all that takes place within that public space in a coordinated fashion. We, um, we encourage continued dialogue among the stakeholders as we move along with this to address the remaining concerns and to facilitate future regulatory reform efforts. AOBA recommends that the Council move to adopt this fourth round of proposed vending rules as an important first step towards implementing a comprehensive vending scheme. We encourage all stakeholders to continue discussions after approving this initial framework um, and to continue talking on how to continue improving and enhancing vending as an economic and business development tool across the district. As with any regulatory proposal, the Council should certainly anticipate subsequent proposed changes that will further develop vending management and operations in the district. For sure, this is an ongoing process. For example, we recommend periodic review of vending site locations at renewal. The 
Department of Transportation directors should conduct periodic reviews of existing vendor locations, including, for example, upon the expiration of a vending site permit and prior to extending or the extending such a permit. This will ensure that the location remains compliant with the applicable vending regulations and that the agency remains aware of any changing conditions at the location which may or may not uh, render it suitable for continued vending there. With regard to vending development zones, we encourage closer review of the objectives for determining the vending development zones. The proposed regulations set forth various factors that the DCRA director must consider before designating an area as a vending development zone. The proposed regulations own, seem to only authorize the DCRA director to establish these vending zones which meet each of eight different factors as outlined. A requirement that each and every objective be met will make it significantly more difficult for the director to establish these zones. We hope that they will continue to look at this process for developing zones and give some consideration to authority and flexibility in these zones areas. Regarding the approval process for vending development zones, these zones are intended to allow maximum creativity and flexibility in managing vending within a designated geographic area. We hope that the district will carefully evaluate this new tool during the first year after adoption of final regulations. While we agree that a zone, if designed correctly, can achieve these goals, additional changes may be, might be warranted in the future after the operation and regulation of the zone during the first year. We learn from our experience. After a year, for example, the, the district should be able to determine whether to change the changes to the 45-day review period are warranted. For example, we, in our comments, we propose shortening the 45-day period to 30 days, which is the normal um, comment period for rulemakings. Additionally, um, avoiding an extended review period will allow approved zones to begin operating and contributing their retail offerings sooner in, different, in district neighborhoods. Finally, the district may wish to consider establishing a term for each vending zone. While the zones will be an exciting addition to the district's vending regulations, the district should reserve the right to periodically review to determine whether it, the zone continues to meet the stated goals in the application and the initial application. In conclusion, AOBA support urges the Council to approve the Vending Business License Regula Regulation Resolution. We remain committed to working with the fellow stakeholders on the many important issues raised here today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, sir, what's your name? I'm John Gaber. Gaber, okay, Mr. Gaber. I talk now? Okay, right. yes. Hey, um, I'm Dr. John Gaber. I'm a professor at the University of Arkansas in the Department of Political Science and the PhD program in Public Policy. Um, I'm also a certified planner. I've been a certified planner since 2001. Um, I'm the guy who wrote the article on street vendors. And the article in 1994 is the article that documents the relationship of street vendors to the formal economy. This article was rated as one of the top 100 articles in the world in 1996 as being significant in relationship to street vendors. Um, I've done a lot of research on street vendors for the past 20 years. So I can provide a historical context as well as an economic context. I'll keep my comments short. Um, I want to talk about two things in specific. One, the economics. Um, I think you have a handout in terms of what my uh, talking points are, but I just want to highlight um, street vendors um, provide, um, I want to talk only about the top three, three very significant contributions to your economy. First, before I say anything, I just want to say you all have a really good problem. Things are going really well in your community, and to have a problem with street vendors means you have a vibrant, growing urban economic system. So this is a good situation to be in. Um, now two or three points. First, street vending is a function of economic geographic demand, and that's a really important concept in that in terms of an economic function, vendors go to where the demand is versus something that's more of an economic supply. 
Um, so whenever it rains, a vendor pops up, right? Um, versus something like a Walmart where people go to a place. And so the function of vendors is that geographic mobility. Second, street vendors are deeply integrated in the local economy. They purchase a tremendous amount of goods and services to sustain their business. And so they're not kind of a fringe thing on the side. Um, and actually, uh, I would put them, although maybe not the same magnitude at restaurants, they're still huge contributors to the local economy. Um, third, market synergism. I love the word synergism. You can use it in a sentence commonly, so here we go. Um, they do two things that are really important here. Um, one is they complement the existing array of goods and services provided by bricks and mortar industries. My research is based upon nine and a half uh, months of field research um, on street vending in New York City, um, as well as kind of cursory review of national vending activities. Um, and so one thing we need to think about is how vendors fit in within the larger urban economy. And the argument here is that they complement versus compete. So the, the issue is the CDs, yeah, there's obvious, you know, hot dogs and mustard, but here I think it's a little bit different. And second is that street vendors provide a very unique shopping environment. They create kind of a festival bazaar uh, atmosphere that most cities are killing to have. And that's where you're kind of in a unique situation is that literally even malls are getting vendors to locate inside their stores. Um, so, you know, when you have something like that happen, you've got a good thing going. Um, I want to conclude. I've got two minutes and 53 seconds. I'm doing good. Um, street vending as an issue is not new. I mean, the very first street vendor law passed in the United States was actually before the United States was in the United States. It was in, 19, it was in 1657. And the classic debate in terms of this vendor policy was Scottish uh, people, Scots were coming in, landing at New Amsterdam, and were fought by local merchants as unfair competition. And so what's ironic is how we've been debating this thing for centuries. Pretty funny. Um, but I want to kind of conclude, and I'm a little concerned in terms of DC. DC's policy is I want to um, commend you in terms of taking the effort to kind of address three vendors in relationship to existing industries. And I think that's really good, but I'm a little concerned about one thing in particular. Um, the geography, the policy position of looking at street vending from a geographic point of departure is problematic. And a good example of this is in New York City. New York City has been debating the exact same vendor policy since 1904. And they actually came up with the actual vendor policy that's built on a lottery and a geography, just like what DC did in 1937. After it was in you know, 1937 by Mayor LaGuardia, it was quickly abandoned seven months later as a huge, utter failure. Because if vendors didn't locate there, it was a waste of time and resources. Because again, going back to my first point, vendors exist at economic demand. And so, as a city and as a government agency, it's, you're in a unique position to provide an opportunity to reinvent yourself, to create new ideas versus regurgitating what has been going on and thinking about the exact same topic for the past 76 years. And so I want to challenge you to think about how can we think about this differently. I'm not going to give you a solution because you're in jobs and it's your responsibility. But I would make it a point to say that your geographic policy suggestion is highly problematic and has failed not only in New York City 76 years ago, but has been very episodic in terms of success around the country. That's it. Thank you very much for your testimony. Ms. Kern? Hi, my name is Christina Kern. I am the sole owner of Stella's Popcorn. Um, I am a Ward 3 resident. I have lived in Washington, D.C. for 23 years now. I um, have been in, the, in Ward 3 for probably 18 years. Um, <clears throat> I'm a single mother. I decided to open my food truck a little over a year and a half ago. I've been on the streets now for a little over a year, about 16 months. Um, I'm very proud of what I've done. Um, my fear is if the proposed rules and regulations that are on the table are passed that I won't be able to make my business actually work um, and will not be able to take care of my daughter who is actually Stella, the namesake of my truck. Um, my story is that I wanted initially to open a brick and mortar but found myself 
looking to secure money through an SBA-backed loan and realized that the only thing that I had to put against that loan was the, my home, my only asset. Realized that I wouldn't be able to afford to do that and take care of my daughter. So opening my truck was a very viable business solution. Um, and I would love to uh, see the, something, uh, a proposed regulation that would um, enable me to work in the more vibrant areas so that I can actually take care of my daughter and continue the success of my business. Thank you. All right, well, thank you uh, very much uh, for your testimony. Um, well, thank you all for, for your testimony. Um, Professor, um, I do have a question for you. Um, I, I agree with you in terms of economic demand and deeply in, in integrating the local economy and the market synergy and added street safety. Uh, now, I, I, I thought you said something, uh, and, and correct me if, if, if I'm wrong, uh, but we have a good problem. Yes, you do. We have a good problem, and it's a good opportunity for us to, to take the lead and, and move forward. But you said you did not want to provide any solutions. Uh, but based on what you've uh, heard here today, and, uh, and whether, from my vantage point, there uh, appears to be a, a good opportunity to at least come up with a, a good uh, resolution to this and get something on the books and, and then move forward, uh, how, would, how does that, uh, I guess, uh, uh, go into your thinking as, as to where, where we are right now? You know, one problem is it's not like buying a used car where you know it's got a problem and you can easily fix it. In government, when you make, when you pass a bad policy, that bad policy kind of attaches itself to a lot of other policies and have ramifications. And so once you pass bad policy, it's not like getting an oil change. It is really complicated to fix. And so you may be, hey, oh. all righty. <coughs> Thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to do my rendition of New York, New York. No. <laughs> um, no, and so therefore, um, it, it, passing bad policy is a little bit harder to fix once it's passed than not ba passing bad policy and then going back to the drawing board and doing it right the first time. Okay. And uh, Stella's popcorn. Uh, popcorn. Popcorn. <laughs> uh, currently, you're, you're operating. Are you operating where you desire to operate right now? I am. And, and generally, where, where do you operate? For instance, today I was at Metro Center. Um, I usually go to Farragut Union Station and uh, Metro and also Lumfont, sometimes Patriots Plaza, um, generally those areas. Okay, and, and how do you see these uh, proposed regulations changing that? Um, well, first of all, I think that the, the concept of the lottery doesn't appeal to me um, because I think that um, the proposed number of sites that we're able to put our names in for the lottery um, don't equal the number of trucks that are on the streets. And um, they also don't consider the, you know, I, I think that our customers, I mean, the, the really cool thing, cool, about being an owner of a food truck is that you're part of this really neat culture. And the culture is that the people really look forward to the dynamic between themselves at the truck, in the lines. Um, and there are certain areas, like the ones that I just mentioned, are the areas that have more traffic, if you will, more people, which is why I'm able to sustain my household. I mean, I live in Wesley Heights. It's not a cheap area of D.C. to live in. And I'm actually able to sustain my home um, by, by going to these locations. Um, I feel that... Um, so what I was trying to say about the culture is that if there is this lottery and let's say all the trucks that win that lottery in that particular location for a month are kebab trucks, 
then you're stifling our customers, too. They don't have a choice. They're limiting choices. So if I, as a business owner, don't think that I could sustain my family and my livelihood if I'm not able to go to the locations where I've actually developed a solid market and following. Now, I guess, you know, here the, the big discussion has been, as I understand it, is really being able to, to operate downtown. And, and, uh, and the government has come forward today with 180 locations uh, that, you know, are considered to be prime locations. And if there's only 200 uh, trucks, it appears to me that you have an a, a excellent shot at being able to operate you know, in, the, in one of the prime locations, be it a lottery system, a rotation system, or whatever kind of, kind of system? Um, I, again, part of our business is that we have to develop um, a following. It takes a long time to develop a following. Again, I've been in business about 16 months. Um, in terms of Twitter following, I have a little over 1,500 people that follow me. It's still small compared to a lot of the larger um, trucks who have been around longer than me. Um, but in order, like sometimes I'll just for, for the sake of, you know, being a business person, I'll just go to a new location. People aren't familiar with me. They aren't familiar with my product. And it's very, very little profitability to do that. Um, so I generally find that I go back to the locations where I've developed the following. Um, and again, I think, you know, the, the, the reason I found um, getting into um, this business appealing is that we can actually have the freedom to go where we know that the market exists for our product. Okay, but it's, it's clear that, you know, that the government is going to regulate this business. And, and, and now it's, it's just a question of, of how. And, um, you know, if, you know it, it's, it's sort of like, you know, when I was growing up, I was a vendor for the Oakland A's. And I didn't know whether or not I'm going to get selected or not. But, you know, you go, you show up, and it's depending on, on the amount of people that show up for the game as to whether or not you're going to get selected to sell the peanuts or popcorns or hot dogs or what, what have you. But uh, the, the law of averages suggested that, you know, I'm going to get selected, uh, you know, and basically I just, I need to, I need to be there. Now, the, the, the problem that I had is I didn't know what, what I would be able to sell. I didn't know whether it was a cold night, are they going to stick me with ice cream, <laughs> you know, or, you know, if it's a, 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 a real hot day, am I going to get hot chocolate as opposed to the Cokes? But, you know, that's, that's the part of the risk of being business, and in every business there's going to be risk. But, um, in the long run, I was successful as a vendor for the Oakland A's, you know, the young kid, you know, doing something positive. And I was able to, you know, to generate the type of funds that I needed, not every night because, you know, on that cold night I may get stuck with the ice cream and I'm only going to make $15. But then again, in, in Oakland, you know, when they had the hot pants day, I, I was lucked out. I got Coca-Colas. You know, places jam-packed, 50,000 people, and it's like 90 degrees, and I'm having a ball. Uh, so it's, it's sort of like a balancing act, and it's just like uh, even at the restaurant on certain days, you know, it's going to be a, a, a nice day where all the customers come out, and then on another day, you know, business is going to run slow. And I think, you know, as long as you're in that downtown area, there are going to be some days where you just hit it just right, and everybody wants to, you know, the popcorn. And then there's going to be some other days where people have a desire for something else. But in the long run, you know, I think that you are going to be able to, you know, sell your, sell your goods. Uh, as long as you're able and you're going to be able to be, you know, part of, of the MR, and the MRA. Now, if there were 1,000 trucks for only 180 locations, then I think, you know, that's, you know, the, the odds of you being able to really count on doing, uh, doing business is, is kind of slim. But the fact that there's 200 trucks and there's 180 slots available just in the MRA, the MRV, and then out, you can definitely operate outside the MRV uh, because there's no really no limits other than the so-called 10-foot rule that we're probably going to address that. Uh, and then there's also the opportunity of being down on, on, on the mall. It just appears that in a, in a city like the District of Columbia where last year we had 19 million visitors, that you are going to have the opportunity to, 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 to sell your goods. 
I understand what you're saying, and I think as a business owner, it's your prerogative to decide whether you go out when it's raining or that you take that day and actually work at home and you get a lot of things done that you need to get done in terms of filing and doing all ordering and all the things that you need to do. I think that, again, the reason I was attracted to this is that I, I, I actually make the decision. Um, and not the decision being made for me. I don't think I probably would have even signed up for this. I mean, I've been in business for over 20 years, and I don't think that this makes sense from a business perspective. And I certainly don't think that I can, as when I decided to open this business, um, I was a catering executive for years, and before that I worked in the computer industry. Um, you know, the appeal was that I am in control of my business and that I can decide when I'm going to go out and what location I'm going to work at that day. I understand that regulations, and I certainly follow everything that, that's been outlined at the DCRA. I have a commercial kitchen. Um, I, you know, certainly have been inspected by the Department of Health. I mean, I'm doing everything the way that I'm supposed to be doing it. Again, I was attracted to this because of the mobility. Okay. Mr. Ruffin? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, first, I want to just uh, ask uh, from Aoba's perspective, what's the, isn't there a certain <coughs> attraction for your buildings and for your occupants and your, you know, your landowners and building owners and the tenants therein to have this kind of industry around? I mean, I would think you're very supportive of having lots of food trucks downtown and around. Is that not right? Well, absolutely. I mean, we started off by our testimony by saying we support vending. Um, and, and Caroline can speak more to this, some, you know, our tenants or some of the, the patrons in, in the lines. Right. Um, and, I, and I agree with the, the statement of the other witness that we're actually, you know, we are in a very good place. It's a testament to the fact that it's a vibrant economy. Uh, it's a place where people want to be. Uh, the issue for us, I think, is that the, the district, um, particularly DCA and DDOT, has been in a position of, of, of trying to balance various interests. And so you have the, the, on the, on one side, kind of the public interest, the public safety, while also trying to encourage um, the development of this type of business and other types of businesses. And, and one of the things that the mobile, the regs do is that it's not just about food trucks. There's a Class D license, so you could have, um, I think there's a shoe shine guy, but maybe there's I don't know the right. manicure lady or something like that. But there will be it won't just be food and merchandise. Um, but I think one of the things in terms of the public interest and public welfare perspective with these mobile uh, mobile roadway zones is that it it that it gives the city the ability an easier ability to really inspect the the mobile trucks. And I, I think I don't know if that's something that was addressed earlier. Is, while also giving the mobile trucks some flexibility in terms of, of where they are. And so, you know, from our perspective, we, we need uh, a set regulatory framework. Um, in order to have any kind of progress, you really have to take that first step forward. This is not by uh, any stretch of the imagination the, the, the first or the, the, certainly the last iteration. Um, I think there are a lot of concerns here that, um, that have been expressed today, and we can continue to work on those. Um, all of you on the panel know that as part of the regulatory process, uh, we've come back again and again to fix things. I won't mention nuisance properties <laughs> and how many times that was amended. Um, but, you know, you, you don't necessarily always get it right the first time, but you try and at least move forward and make um, and some progress, and in response to concerns, you fine-tune and revise regulations or statutory language. That's right, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate your support. I think that's really important. Um, because I, I, you guys see it from a unique perspective. And so and, thank and, you. And, and I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but okay. you'll, you'll, you'll see based on the comments that we've submitted and, and the agencies can submit, uh, can attest to that, is that we've been very pointed um, in some of our comments and some of our recommendations, uh, some of which have been incorporated as with the other stakeholders. So the, the kind of key characteristic, if you will, of a compromise is that there are things that people like and there are things that everybody doesn't like. And so this there are still issues here which we think need further refinement, um, but kind of overall, I think that the primary objective should be let, let's at least have something in place and take the first step. And I think Councilman Orange and Councilman Grosso, you both have said today, we're, we're, we are so close and we are so much closer than where we were before. That's great. I appreciate that. Mr. Gabber, I'm as confused as, uh, as Chairman Orange on this. I, if if we don't do this from a geographical perspective, what do we do it from? I mean, is geographic, geography different than space, or 
or is uh, time or what is it size? What? It, how do you go about regulating this if you don't do it from a geography perspective? And given the fact that we already do it from a health perspective. Well, you know, I would it, I would hate to pull off from the Los Angeles example, but the Los Angeles example, although LA. You might want to move up a little before they ask you to sing. I'll again. Sing again. Um, I think the issue with I think the Los Angeles example, although LA is not DC, I think the process by which LA is going about it is much more. Um, workable and defendable and transparent. Um, one of the things I'm really concerned about, and on the I'll second, I'll just say just right there before you go too far. I, this has been pretty transparent. I mean, I, I would say four iterations, working closely together. The departments have been open. They've been engaged. I would argue that even the food truck association would say that they've been pretty open. The transparency might have fallen off a little bit there when people moved away from talking to each other, um, and we're hoping to reinvigorate that and get that going again. I, I don't want to, and I also wouldn't mind um, just. Well, let me come on on there. I think there's a lack of transparency in the geographic identification of these zones. I think they're arbitrary and not consistent with the existing land use or the comprehensive plan. Okay, so. These are used. These zones. A lot of these zones, aren't they? Where trucks are already. I mean, am I mistaken here? Uh, I think some are, um, but I'm not sure. From a, a zoning perspective, you can control the total number per area outside of health and safety. Okay. And so, therefore, then you have this kind of dual logic going: geography total numbers and that's where you run into your problem so you can say total numbers for a basic area or you go with a geography without a total number but when you're starting to do both then you're having kind of combining two different like rap music and classical music at the same time it becomes problematic all right I think I understand what you're saying I, I assume you have papers written on this that you can share with us uh, in terms of the geography, no. What I do have the paper on is on the economic function of street vendors in cities and how they relate and that they have nothing to do with the geographic kind of dispersion of them, but more in terms of the synergistic relationship of vendors to the local established businesses. Okay. Well, I'd love to see it. Uh, I have a copy of them right here. Oh, that's great. Um, Ms. Kern, I appreciate your testimony, and I'm glad that you came down. You know, the, um, I, you know, I always get worried too when the government gets involved. So I think that you have something to be worried about, and I'm saying that, and I'm the government. So, uh, um, but but at the same time, I think we have to recognize that uh, things often do work out, and and that it's not always a total debacle. And in spite of Mr. Gaver's skepticism, sometimes Gaber the government uh, actually, well, Gaber Gaver, sorry, the government actually saying. does do things right a lot of the time, and, and gets it done in a way that everyone can benefit from it. And I'm hoping that in this situation. And the council being willing to step up and be engaged is going to be able to move us to that point. So thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I would just say thank you all for coming down, but uh, I do believe that it is about geography, and that's the reason why everybody's here. They want to be at a certain location. And, 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 and the brick-and-mortar restaurants are saying that that's fine, but all 200 of them can't be in the same location. And so it really is about its location, 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 especially in, in the nation's capital. I mean, if I'm going to do business, I mean, I'll tell you, I want to be either downtown, Farragut North, and, and uh, Union, Union Station in those areas where people are going to be. And the other area would be on the mall uh, if, if I'm in, in this type of business because, you know, I, I really don't want to be out on uh, New York Avenue at uh, New York and Bladensburg. There's nobody there. Uh, so it, it is about you know geography, and, and I think that's that's why it's all coming down to these maps, the credibility of the map. Is your map accurate? No, my map is accurate. So, but you know we'll just agree to, to disagree. So thank you all for testifying here today. Thank you. Uh, next we'll hear from Mike Leonard, Willie Carter, and uh, Ryan Conehan of GW Student Association. I don't believe Richard Bradley is not here. Uh, Shannon Creton. Uh, David Wilsonberg. Weisenberg. Stephen Lobb. Yeah, Loeb, I'm sorry. One down. Yes, sir. 
Okay, we'll start with Mike Leonard. Thank you for taking the time. Whoops. Thank you for taking the time to hear about the important issues uh, facing the vending community here in Washington. My name is Mike Leonard, and I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., in Ward 3, and currently reside in Ward 1. I'm also the owner and operator of the Takarian Food Truck and one of the founding members of the Food Truck Association. The current proposed regulations before City Council could potentially kill or limit my food truck business in D.C. I started the food truck, the Takarian Food Truck, in the summer of 2010 at a time where there were only a few food trucks on the streets. Over the past two and a half years, I've built our brand and our customer base. With that additional growth, I've been able to hire 10 employees, eight of whom are D.C. residents. One thing I'm particularly proud of uh, is Takarine's 1% for D.C. charitable giving program. Since our first sale, Takarine has been committed to donating 1% of gross sales to local charities. Remember, that's gross sales, not profits. That's a big number for a small business. We've contributed thousands of dollars to D.C. Central Kitchen, the Anacostia Watershed Society, and D.C. Greenworks, amongst others. Just this past winter, we donated over $4,000 to D.C. Central Kitchen and D.C. Greenworks. Support from Takarian enabled D.C. Central Kitchen to purchase local Virginia winter crops, which fed 16,580 people. Additionally, we work with Department of Employment Services and Project Empowerment to provide job training to D.C. residents that are re-entering the job market. In addition to what I built with the food truck, uh, the Takarian food truck, uh, I was one of the founding members of the Food Truck Association and helped start that as well. In the fall of 2011, uh, at one of our Truckaroo food truck festivals, we mobilized a food drive and collected over 11,500 pounds of food around the Thanksgiving season. Our industry is giving back to the community in many more ways than one. I poured all of my passion, experience, and creativity into this business concept, and none of it uh, might have been possible under the current proposed regulations. The reason our business worked is because we were able to meet our customers where they wanted us and not set up a limited number of trucks in a food court via a lottery system. Because of the arbitrary 10-foot rule restricts us from doing business through most of the city, that means if you don't win the lottery one month, you might not do business. Uh, I think that people have already stated it's pretty obvious that businesses can't leave their livelihoods up to chance in this manner. I also realized that today in the 11th hour, our friends at DDOT and DCRA showed up with a new proposal for several reserved spots for food trucks in high-density areas. Unfortunately, their new proposal is not part of the 86 pages of regulations that we are discussing today, and the manner in which they've been unveiled to us uh, is slightly insidious. The Food Truck Association's map and campaign effort are direct response to what's actually written in the regulations and uh, the definitions of which were told to us at a DDOT meeting last October. DDOT um, gets sweeping power in these regulations, and while Mr. Bellamy has promised us X today, these regulations don't protect that promise. Who knows what the next DDOT director's view will be, and because there is no criteria or appeal process written into these regulations, it gives this industry vast uncertainty. I can also uh, point out a section specifically in the regulations at the end of the section where it talks about MRV locations. Uh, number 537 about director's discretion. It reads, the DCRA and DDOT director has the discretion to propose, modify, or remove a designated MRV location at any time. So at any time, for any reason, no criteria, no appeal process whatsoever. So that is kind of the primary concern here. We're obviously, you know, optimistic about some of the things that have been said today, and, and, and that's cool and everything, but that doesn't really uh, appease us uh, in an acceptable way, at least not yet. I will support food truck regulations that protect the public's health and safety and respect the usage of public space. There are many ways to manage uh, some of the higher density vending areas through smart regulations that will still allow our industry to thrive and allow vendors to meet demand where they have it. The current proposal does not address all of these concerns and uh, in some ways appears to be a cover-up to limit competition in a response to a few powerful business groups. We should do what's best for our city's residents and consumers, businesses, and public space. These regulations do not uh, completely represent that balance. Uh, please work to not uh, limit my business and suffocate the industry I've spent so much time working on improving, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your uh, testimony. Uh, Mr. Carter? Well, thank you all for having me. Uh, my name is Willie Carter, and while my food truck is not licensed for D.C., I'm licensed in Arlington. Um, I grew up here in D.C. I was raised here in D.C. I was born in uh, Holy Cross Hospital, attended March Elementary, Deal Junior High School, Wilson Senior High School. Um, and I actually dropped out of Wilson Senior High School. Um, I turned to restaurants. I was a busboy, a server, 
and a bartender, and I thought that's what I would be doing for the rest of my life. But um, one day I saw food trucks. I had no idea what they were, saw a line of food trucks, saw an opportunity, and I took it. And that's really what I'm here to talk about. Um, food trucks are a huge opportunity, an opportunity that I would not be able to take advantage of if they were not around. I would not be able to open up my own restaurant, uh, mobile or otherwise. Um, I thought that, or I've been told always that, you know, most restaurants fail within their first year and 90% uh, of them fell within their first year and uh, there were huge startup costs. Uh, but my wife and I took the little bit of money that we have, we did buy a food truck in Arlington and we opened up there with hopes of opening up here in DC. I am here pretty much to find out whether or not we are going to be able to do that. Um, I've attracted an investor who wants to open up a brick and mortar establishment. Uh, we've been pretty successful. and. Um, We've been looking at properties here in D.C. as well as in Arlington. And um, like I said before, there are not too many opportunities for high school dropouts. Uh, I am one. And, um, you know, I just want to hope that, you know, you consider that when you consider these regulations. Obviously, I've heard much today. You've discussed a whole lot of things, and I've learned a whole lot. And uh, I thank you for taking everybody's opinion. That's all. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Carter. Um, Mark? Scott Lowerman. Scott. Scott, how do you spell your last name? L A U E R M A N N. Welcome, Mr. Lowerman. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Orange, and the rest of the committee for allowing me to speak today. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the George Washington University Student Association. Uh, together, we represent the more than 25,000 students on campus, both graduate and undergraduate. Um, and we just want to convey that the food trucks play a very important role on our campus. Um, only a few years ago, we, we only would see one or two, if any, on campus. And now, um, on the area of 8th Street, um, we'll see up to 12 during the day um, with lines out in front of every one. And we believe these proposed regulations, um, well, as they are written right now, would limit that number to three, uh, which would, would, would be a detriment to the GW community as they do provide um, a source for food, um, a source for community gathering, um, and the GW community is looking to expand their involvement with food trucks. Um, there was a proposal this year with the university um, to get our um, colonial dining program, which um, allows the students to spend money, um, to spend their, their, uh, their university money um, with the food trucks. Uh, and I think that's still in the implementation process, but that was passed. Um, the university is looking to further work with the food trucks um, and I think it would be very unfortunate to see that this law limit the food trucks to only three on campus as they do provide a lot of cultural diversity. They provide a great source of food for our students um, and we would really like to see them stay. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Loeb. My name is Steve Loeb. Along with my brother and sister Marlene and David, we operate Loeb's Deli at 1712 I Street Northwest. We are the children of the original owners who opened the deli in 1959. This month, May 12th, will be exact our 54th year of operation in the nation's capital. We relocated in February 2011 due to stimulus renovation project. Now we are faced with the infection of 18 to 20 food trucks daily across the street from our new location. Simply stated, a small family owned operate, operated business for 54 years is now struggling. Overhead, property tax, insurance, workman's comp, as well as lease-related expenses are not a factor for the food trucks, but could very easily force a, a small lease business to fold. If competition like this is not required to have similar expenses regulations, it's, it's going to be the demise of small businesses, small independent family-owned businesses. Um, I think it's a safety hazard. I mean, watch Farragut Park at 9 o'clock in the morning. It's, it's a cat and mouse game between the food trucks and the police and the ticket writers and I mean I'm not saying I'm not against the food trucks I just think they need to be regulated I mean you know I could, we've been in business for 54 years we know how to compete but when you have 20 new establishments right across the street it's not a fair playing field is that it all right well thank you all for, for your uh, testimony um, here today um, Mr. Lope, you said you've been in business for 54 years. Where did y'all first start out at? At 617 15th Street. 
where the old David Grill is, right across from the Treasury. Right. Okay. And how long were you in, in that location? My mom and dad were there from 59 to 79. Okay. And then 79, that building got renovated, and they moved to 832 15th Street. And they were there from 79 till three years ago, when uh, it was a government building that got 100 and I don't know how many million dollars in stimulus money to renovate, and they kicked everybody out. So I relocated three blocks west to 1712 I Street. I think I, I remember you from the 832 15th Street location. And, and, and you said that you were there from 79 to when? 79 till uh, 2010. 2010. Okay. And um, you, you're more of, of a deli than restaurant, is that correct? Yeah, quick service deli. Okay. So, so that means that the food trucks are in direct, I mean, you're in direct competition basically. Absolutely. With, and your price point and everything. Absolutely. Okay. But like I said, I just want to see regulations. I mean, it's 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 like the Wild West out there at nine o'clock in the morning, the cat and mouse game, and it's it's a public safety thing mm -hmm. with the traffic and and it's the police trying to run them off, the ticket writers right behind them, the the, the squatters holding the spots, you know, through rush hour, and they eat the tickets, but still, it's 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 a it's a safety hazard. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for, for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Lauderman, uh, I want to thank you for coming down. It, it was uh, good uh, actually entertaining the, the Government Association the, the other day in, in the office. I had a great time uh, interacting with you all for about, about an hour. And uh, thank you for taking the invitation to come down and, and testify here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and I also uh, understand that you all will be coming down to, at least someone will be coming down to the uh, hearing next week on the, uh, I guess, the, the bill on uh, gun insurance in the District of Columbia. I, think you, I believe that's right, sir. Yeah. Uh, now, you indicated, and I think I just surprised you all, that the, on the government's list today, they uh, indicate there will be three locations for GW. And if I recall from our meeting last week, I think you all were telling me you at least have a, a dozen of the uh, food trucks and you really enjoy <coughs> the experience and and what have you. That's correct. Um, I referenced uh, 8th Street between 21st and 22nd by the Gelman Library and the Marvin Center where we currently have upwards of 12 trucks during the day. Um, the, that area would be restricted to three according to the current bill. Okay. And uh, has, has the association uh, received any complaints from, uh, from having those uh, 10 to 12 uh, food trucks in your location? Um, there was an ongoing debate for a while. Again, I represent the Student Association, not the university, so I can't right. speak on their behalf. But there was a, a debate for a while with competition with Sodexo uh, and the food company that they serve at, at the university as far as competition there goes. Um, but I believe that's been mitigated. Um, and as I said, it was a big step for us to get our university dining program um, compatible with the food trucks. And that should go into effect um, and in the coming months, uh, that's in, in, in the implementation process. So the university um, seems to be on board with the food trucks, and the student association is definitely pushing for it. Okay. And, and how will that, that arrangement work? Will you, will you um, so we, we have a colonial cash program where essentially um, part of the tuition, you have $1,000 or $2,000 linked to this card. And local vendors in the area right now, like CVS and Whole Foods, are part of this program, and students can spend their money there uh, through this card, uh, the, G the G World card, and we'd like, we're trying to get the food trucks, or we have um, been able to get, to get the food trucks on this program. So st students who don't want to use their personal credit card, they can use their university dining dollars. Well, great. Well, once again, thank you for coming down and testifying. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Mr. Uh, Leonard, uh, you indicated you're one of the, the founding members of the Truck Association? Yeah, so yeah. there's um, 17 founding members that originally founded the association, and I was actually on the first board of directors as well and did a lot of the back end work as well. So. Okay. Well, I, I do want to uh, applaud you for all the, the goodwill that you're providing in your operations and uh, the fact that. 1% of your gross sales, uh, and, and I do emphasize gross sales, uh, it's pretty admirable that, that you have that type of consciousness, uh, uh, you know, for your, your, your uh, operation to, to give back. And, uh, and I know that's, uh, that's, 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 that's pretty good. Um, but for, for you and, 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 and Mr. Uh, Carter? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you say to the gentleman that's sitting there with you, Steve Lowe, who's operating a, a deli operation and, 
and clearly uh, this is different from you know established brick and mortar restaurant and he's really has the deli food and he's really in direct I mean y'all are in direct yeah. competition I understand what you said about price point and quick service and um you know, obviously, I, I don't think that regulations sh should be made by the government uh, to protect one industry over another. So I would disagree on that basis. But uh, you know, you know, I, I would agree to a certain extent that you know, obviously, there are situations at Farragut Square that that should be better regulated. You know, the Food Truck Association has never said that we don't aren't willing to regulate uh, in, in various ways that that would help you know these types of situations that have been brought up. We just want more clear criteria as to how they're created, you know, where they're created. You know, um, the Food Truck Association in the past has said that Farragut is one of the spots where we would say, yeah, you know, we, we can do some stuff here and we can, we can bridge that gap. Um, I think that the, the biggest concern with these regulations and the way they're written, um, and I'm speaking more for myself than the association, um, although with that background, uh, it, it's really a criteria issue. Um, there's no sets of criteria that the DDOT or DCRA director has to go through in order to establish a zone, um, meaning they can just do it on whims. Like, you know, if, if they're getting calls uh, from different business industries and getting pressure, they can say, okay, let's do a zone here. We obviously adamantly oppose that type of situation, but if there were, there's uh, unsafe situations that are being documented in certain areas and there's legitimate safety or public space issues that are being, you know, documented officially in certain areas, then that can add up to be criteria to create a, a higher, higher managed zone, such as an MRV uh, in some capacity, and, and that's the type of thing that I think that most food trucks could work with. It's just the uncertainty, the lack of criteria, and the lack of appeal process um, that are the real big sticking points um, for us, in addition to a couple other small things. I don't want to speak on everything, but. Okay. I, I, I think you, you would agree, though, that there's been a tremendous amount of, of movement in the, in the past few days. However, I, I would also add to that, uh, 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 what's the old saying, trust but verify. So now we need to. We, you know, we, we don't want uh, this, this, the trust us regulations uh, are, are obviously not comforting. I mean, and you can imagine what it's like for us to sit here and say, oh, you know, oh, we're going to take care of you guys. You know, this is going to be okay, but it's, it's just not written down. Well, well, well and that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Now it's trust me, but now we're going to, we're moving to the right. trust and verify sure, sure. phase of this. And it, at least it appears from, from the president of your association that if we can verify a lot of what the government has said here today, and tweak it a little bit. I that think that would be a terrific be starting to, point. Yeah, have a good start or, or a middle point. Yeah, you know, further along. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Grossman. I want to thank you all for coming down. I appreciate your testimony. I don't have any questions. I just, Mr. Love, I, I hear what you're saying on that issue with you know, and I think your argument is right that that it's a mess down there, and I think that's why it's, these it's, regs, I mean, why these regs have it's been. It's like the wild there. west down there. I mean, they fight me just this morning. A squatter who parks their car to hold the spot for whenever the food truck shows up. Another food truck was backing in behind it, hit her car, and it was, I mean, they were yelling and screaming, like going off on each other. It was, I mean, that was just this morning. At, on well, I think that demonstrates the need for some government regulation on this, and so I think that's what's trying to happen here. Uh, it's not perfect, though, and as you can understand, I'm sure you've dealt with it a lot in your life as well, and we have to work on it to get it right, and I think we're not far off from that, and so hopefully that'll make well, it. Well, I just want to see it made a level playing field. Okay. You know, I like I said, we've been in business for 54 years. We've dealt with competition. Right. This is just this is infestation. All right. Well, I appreciate your testimony. I appreciate all y'all coming down. Take care. Councilman Thank Graham. Thank, Thank you all very much for your testimony. I appreciate it. Mr. Lib, how long have you been in your current location? Uh, February was two years. Two years. And when you moved there, did you have food trucks there? Yeah, but not nearly as many that are there are now. So there has been an increase in the food Absolutely. trucks. Absolutely. That, that's what I'm, I'm interested in questioning you about. Have you seen an impact on your business? Absolutely. The increase in the food trucks. Is there any way you can give us some more detailed information in terms of the loss of business or the gain or whatever has happened? What, numbers? Well, it, it, well, how about this, for example? Monday was raining. Tuesday was raining. 70, uh, Wednesday was 70 degrees and beautiful out. I should have been rocking and rolling. I should have been, had the line to the door. I was busier Monday and Tuesday than I was Wednesday. So you're, you're quite sure that there has been a fall off? Absolutely. As a direct result of it. Not only that, I've, I've got outdoor seating. 
which I pay for. It's public space. I have to pay the district government for that mm -hmm. outdoor seating. I have to. I hate to say it like this, but Mr. Look, <laughs> take a deep breath. I'm not going right. to rush you through this. I have I'm to chase people out of my seats that are eating food from the food truck, and I pay public space to provide that for my customers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I and that makes it. me look like a jerk to them, but I'm not paying for those seats for these guys. Now, do you have one other, and I know some of this question may be, you know, kind of puts you on the spot a little bit, and I, don't, I really don't mean to do that. But, I mean, do you have any sense of price comparison between what you're offering and what they're offering? I think we're very similar in price. Very similar price. So, because those food trucks, you know, are specialty food trucks for sure. I mean, they're not selling hot dogs. They're selling very, very specialty meals. How much are their meals costing? Do you have any idea? They're around nine, eight, nine, ten dollars. And that would be about what your meal. That's what I, I get. I get nine dollars for a corned beef sandwich. So help me understand the dynamic here. If, if what is it about the food trucks that trucks that is taking away from you? Because there's too many of them. Too many of them. I can, like I said, I can compete. I don't. I can compete with anybody. But when you put twenty restaurants right across the street from me. That's not a competition anymore. That's an infestation. Okay. Now, I'd like, having heard your point of view on this, I'd like to turn to the others and see what your point of view is in reaction to what he said, if you would, please, if you care to uh, say anything. Um, uh, well, I mean, as I said before, um, I think that he, he makes some valid points on, on some of the congestion issues and things of that nature that I think, if they're documented, should add up to criteria to to differently manage uh, a zone such as Farragut, you know, as far as vending is concerned, um, within a certain criteria. Uh, as far as just um, the sheer numbers and, and, and the competition issue, I don't necessarily see eye to eye with that because that's uh, kind of the nature of what we've got here. Um, Excuse me, but aren't you competing with each other, the food trucks? I mean, yes, I are. mean, aren't, aren't people coming up and saying, "Well, I want this, I want that." Maybe this. I mean, it's an active competition yeah. in I, that group, isn't I it? I have a unique uh, perspective as well because I was one of the first food trucks in 2010 when, you know, I would show up to a Lafon or Union Station or even Farragut Square on certain days, and I'd be one or two food trucks on the entire square. And uh, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that that things uh, are not what they were for me now than they were then. Um, and uh, that's obviously something that, that I budget for and, uh, and we, um, we need to account for when the industry grows and we've got to get more creative and everything like that. And we also have to get smarter with our expenditures and, and make sure we can achieve the amount of profit that we used to achieve perhaps with less sales, which, which is the reality of having that many more trucks than there were when I first opened. So, um, let, me, let me go back to Mr. Loeb. You, yes, know, you said you're, you're good at competition. You know how to compete. We've been doing it for 54 years. Precisely. And so are, are you able to, have you thought of ways in which you can compete against, since you're at the same price level, nobody's, they're not a bargain compared to you. You're not a bargain necessarily compared to them. Have you thought of ways that you might more successfully compete with those trucks? I. You push, you have a seat. I uh, yeah, I've got a seat and I've got air conditioning, <laughs> but I pay a whole lot more to operate than I'm sure they do. Right. It costs me a whole lot more between rent, the, the other expenses in my lease that are mandatory from my landlord, uh, and, uh, workman's comp insurance. Uh, I mean, but you're still at the same price. But I'm still at the same price. Right. I mean, hey, if, if I could get 20 bucks for a corned beef sandwich, I'd do it all day long, but it, it, it ain't going to happen. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming out and testifying today. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Victoria Harris. <laughs> Tad Rudell Tabloso. <laughs> Josh Saltzman. Diego Salazar, <laughs> Ariana Bennett.
سارے اجازت All right, so since we're missing some people, I'll just have you, we'll, we'll start with you, sir. Just identify yourself and give your testimony, and then we'll go down the line. Hadid Al, no worries. My name is Hadid Al Tabasola. I'm a chef and co-owner of Barbecue Bus with my husband, Che. And we've, we've been up here so long. Do you have any barbecue with you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take barbecue and a little Coke. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thanks for having us, and thanks for having me. Um, I'm a resident of Ward 2, and then, like I said, Chef and Connor Barbecue Bus. Uh, many of my colleagues and supporters, I'm going to do this, I can look at you guys, um, of mobile vending are testifying as to why, oh, I am nervous. We as mobile vendors do not support the proposed regulations. Uh, the Great Administration argues that these overly restrictive regulations are necessary to protect the health and safety of the public. Um, I believe that the administration is using this rationale as a way to protect brick and mortar establishments from competition. I've never seen or heard a single reported incident of any customer or passing by complaining about sidewalk congestion. Conversely, conversely, the only complaints I've heard are from special interests that prefer not to have competition from mobile vendors. Um, has there been any kind of a study on this, is, or is it just you know word of mouth that the mayor is using? Um, neither the mayor nor the city council of the district of Columbia should be in the business of protecting one business from competition by another, nor should the mayor and the council be in the business of limiting dining choices of D.C. consumers in a free market. Um, mobile vendors, it's timely, this one. Mobile vendors have many of the same fixed monthly expenses as brick and mortar counterparts, although I will admit that they're probably, for the most part, they're not as high. Um, commercial kitchen, that we lease, utilities, triple net, which means repairs and you know all the stuff that goes along with the lease that my friend back here was talking about. General liability insurance, umbrella, staff, maintenance, the list goes on and on. Um, I read my testimony that Barbecue Bus has about $10,000 a month in fixed monthly expenses, but when I did the math, it's about $8,700. Um, so $8,700 in fixed monthly expenses. Um, we pay all these fixed monthly expenses willingly, even that we know a vast majority of our business depends on one lunch service each day. We pay all these fixed monthly expenses willingly, knowing that we are at the mercy of Mother Nature. F food truck operators knew this when we decided to enter this industry, and still we decided to chase our dreams and take a shot at making names for ourselves. There are major cities in our nation that embrace the creativity and diversity that food trucks offer. Why is the district not one of those? These proposed regulations leave so many details unanswered for me and for my brothers and sisters on the streets that supporting these regulations for us literally would mean signing a blank check and saying to the mayor, DDOT, and DCRA, we, you know, we trust you, fill in the blanks whenever you guys figure it out, and then we'll go from there. And I don't think anyone on this council would sign that, sign that blank check. Um, I started this business. Oh, I'm sorry, I was almost trying to clock. I started this business because I love cooking and I love feeding people. If the customer doesn't like what I have to offer, he or she moves on. Customers are the kings and queens at the end of the day, and customers should decide who stays and who goes. Um, since yesterday, additional details have been released regarding locations and MRV spaces. That's awesome. We'd just like to see those included in the regs. We'd like to see it in writing. We'd like to see definitions of subjective words and phrases like the unobstructed sidewalk and so forth in the regs. Please fill in the blanks. And then in closing, um, I thought about this this morning. These regs are kind of like a Mad Lib, if you remember those when, from when you were younger. And by this, I mean no dis disrespect to the folks that wrote them and worked very hard on writing them. But if you think about it, it's a story with a bunch of blanks. And then you fill in the blanks later in the hopes that when you read the whole thing at the end, it comes out and it makes sense. And um, DC shouldn't be creating its laws this way. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, hello, everyone. Chairman Orange, it's nice to see you again. Um, my name is Victoria Harris, and I am a Ward 4 resident. I am also one of the founding members of the Food Truck Association, and I am their social media ringmaster. Um, I work on Cat Mac and DC Slices. My background is a tad different than most of the people giving testimony here, mostly because I am not an owner and do not have any money tied up in food trucks or brick and mortar establishments. I'm here because I love this industry, both restaurants and food trucks, and I am ashamed of how little the Restaurant Association has worked with us to create a solution. Moreover, I find it insulting that the Restaurant Association is pretending this opposition is to protect public space when it's really about protecting their profits. 
I've been in the culinary industry since I was 13 years old, and it's all I've ever wanted to do. I received my education from the Culinary Institute of America and my master's from Rutgers. I moved to D.C. in 2010 to join forces with another 23-year-old named Brian Arnoff to open Cat Mac. I had no idea what food trucks really did or how they operated. I thought it could not possibly be any more difficult than working in a restaurant, and I was wrong. It's hard. It's really hard work. And contrary to the common misconception, there is not a ton of money to be made. Similar to every line cook and chef I know, we did it because we loved it. All we wanted was for people to come to our truck, love the food, and maybe tweet us from time to time. Who cares if we were working 70 hours a week? We were doing what we loved. The same goes to the people behind me. They work as hard or harder than I do every single day. They don't have it easy. They are moms, dads, daughters, and sons trying to provide for their family the same as everyone else. All they want is a fair shot. In a city where politics and policy are the norm and opinions differ from person to person, it's hard to get anyone to agree on anything except us. We are the connectors of the city. Um, ooh, yeah, we are the connectors of the city. People from any race, political party, or background all have a food truck that they love. For almost three years, I've spoken to at least a thousand people a week, all from working from the window on a food truck. I know someone in every industry you can think of, and that's one of the reasons I am where I am today. I never wanted to own my own business. It's too much work. <laughs> However, because of the skills I've acquired from working on a food truck, I've become a social media consultant. And that comes with two interns and two internships I've created with George Mason University as well as George Washington University. I've actually been forced to become an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur that has helped three startups get, up, get off the ground, two food trucks and one mobile app. I am helping local business owners like Warren Brown from Cake Love improve the way they interact with their customers. I work with restaurant and food truck owners every single day, and I've yet to meet one that has any animosity towards the other. In fact, the opposite is true. We work on charitable events and joint collaborations all, to, all the time. Some of the board members from the Restaurant Association um, I've worked with side by side personally. Entre entrepreneurship is contagious. I've never seen so many startups become successful in my life. Coming from an area where very few people open their own businesses, the culture I've been exposed to is nothing less than inspiring. We are great for the city, and this is a city that needs all the help it can get in order to change its rep for being bad for small businesses. Please send these regulations back to the drawing board and don't kill the spirit of entrepreneurship. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Hello. Um, my name is Saad Jalad. I'm the owner of Crepeway Restaurant on 20th and L Street in Northwest Washington, D.C. I think the regulations should be passed primarily for two reasons. One, it would stop the trucks from parking in spaces created for the public. Currently, the trucks park up to 10 at a time on L Street between 20th and 21st Street in Northwest, D.C. I have a photo of this with me available on request. Between the trucks and the new bike lanes, there are usually no parking spaces for anyone to park between the hours of 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. Monday through Friday. The trucks arrive just after the morning rush hour and stay until 2 p.m. regardless of the one hour parking sign locate, located on that block. The $25 fine for this violation is useless because it's designed to find the public, not a commercial business that can make over $1,000 in a couple of hours. The regulations would take care of that if they pass because they would prohibit the trucks out of the designated area from parking in public spaces. Two, if passed, the regulations would help the health department monitor the trucks during truck hours of operation. Currently, it is extremely difficult for the health department to conduct unannounced health inspections on a regular basis because the health department do not know where the trucks are. This lack of fear of being inspected by the health department leads to improper practices by some of the operators. And I have this, I have photos of this also available on request. If the regs pass, then the health department would have a clearer understanding of where the trucks are located due to the monthly designated areas. This would allow the health department to conduct unannounced health inspections, which will lead to safer practices by the truck <laughs> operators. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Bennett? 
Hi, my name is, I'm sorry, my name is Ariane Bennett, and my husband and I own the Amsterdam Falafel Shop in Adams Morgan. We are residents of the district. We live above our business. I have been here since I was three years old. My husband has been here since 1969. We've both worked in the food and restaurant industry the entire time. And I have prepared testimony for you, but a lot of those issues have been covered today. So I would like to speak a little bit about the various things that we've heard here today and how I feel a sense of disillusionment when I listen to the back and forth between the parties. I'm very much in favor of having a vibrant food truck industry. I am very fond of the truck industry that is going on um, in Austin, Texas. I'm very fond of the trucks that I find around the country and in other parts of the world. When we talk about food trucks and their mobility, I hear them say that this bill or this legislation takes away their ability to be mobile. It really doesn't. And I find that disingenuous to say. I feel that at the end of any given day or on a rainy day, a food truck can get decide to go home, whereas a brick and mortar business stays there with its doors open and ready for the public at any time. The challenges that we face are very different. And if you were truly to think that this is a fully free market situation or should be, then I would be surprised at that perspective because I would find that you would be acquiescing to all customers' demands everywhere. At that point, I believe that we would see bars being open 24 hours and CVS would be selling marijuana. Okay? And that's just not the case. There are regulations that need to be in place for everybody who does business in a city. And it is the job of the city executives and the various people in positions of power to make sure that the economic fabric of the city is not torn, ripped apart, or thrown aside for the interests of any one special interest group or any one emerging economic interest. <coughs> My sadness is that you keep asking everyone else to give and not the food trucks. I hear so much about why it's OK for restaurants to have a 10-foot space in front of them, but it's not OK for a food truck to have a 10-foot space in front of them. I feel like we're asking for an, a level playing field here. And that includes rules being the same for all. The food trucks have an absolute advantage at this point by being able to move daily, hourly, weekly, monthly to any other location within the city that they wish to based on traffic flow and customer needs. That is not the case for restaurants, and we're not asking for those types of equalities. We're asking for things that make sense. We're asking that the food trucks be spontaneously inspected by health inspectors in the same way that we as restaurants are, because this keeps the public safe. We are asking that food trucks pay comparable taxes and that they invest in the community around them. That means taking care of their trash and not creating nuisances within our communities that are unacceptable and that are intolerant for our communities. Today, as we sat here in this meeting on 12th Street, I have a friend who watched 12 food trucks line up. They began jockeying for position, much as you've heard today here, at 9 AM. They were chased off by parking enforcement, only to return immediately afterwards. They forced, as they parked in the right lane, cars who needed to turn right to go around them, to the left of them, and make illegal turns from the center lane. This behavior is unacceptable. When I listen to you talk about how much you want to do to promote the food truck industry, and I am very much in favor of them, I do not hear you saying anything about the behavior of the food trucks over the past three years as it exists here in Washington, DC. I do not hear any discussion about the fact that in the absence of these regulations, they have been behaving in a manner that is disrespectful to other restaurants, coming in to use their bathrooms, parking directly in front of them with the exact same foods. I am a small business who needs to support my family. Pierre Abushakra, who owns Firehook Bakery, is a small business that needs to provide for his family. He has lost his location on G Street because of the food trucks and for no other reason. The cupcake trucks that pull up in front of his pastry establishment and serve every day in front of him relentlessly are disrespectful to the community in which they operate. 
the constant jockeying for parking in an illegal manner and paying other people to hold their spots during rush hour is a clear sign of the way in which they choose to operate. No one has forced them to do this. Nobody has held a gun to their head and said, you need to operate in this way. It is their choice. So I'm asking the council, when you consider regulations moving forward, to be very mindful of the fact that there has been behavior already displayed that has made quite clear that the food truck operators as a whole are unable to police themselves and are committing infractions of our daily community rules in a manner which is disrespectful to the area in which they operate. I thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much uh, for, for your testimony uh, here today. Um, Mr. Jai, you, you talked about the, the parking. That's, that's, your, that's your major concern is, is the parking, parking that's situation? One of, well, that's one of the concerns. There's no place for anybody to park on L Street in between the hours of 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. because you have the bike lanes on one side, mm -hmm. and then on the other side you have these food trucks. And it used to be two food trucks maybe three, four years ago, which was fine. Now there's ten. So it's out of control, like the man from the deli said. Uh, and you said that that's one of the concerns. That's pretty much what you testify about. Do you have other concerns? Well, yeah, I think there's a health concern. Yeah? In my restaurant, we know that the Department of Health is going to come by. So we're always aware of this. That, so we have our stuff together. Make sure everything is up to par. Make sure the food is prepared at the right time, the right temperature. Right? I have a photo of a guy from a food truck serving food without shoes or socks. Do you think someone in my restaurant would have the guts to do that? They don't have that fear because um, they are not unannounced, the inspections, from what I understand. That's another concern that I have. Well, uh, we heard testimony from the government that they are uh, subject to uh, uh, health inspections and that uh, uh, pretty much here today when I raised the question as to did it, were there any other issues, uh, they didn't really have an issue as it relates to, to health inspections because they are subject to health inspections. But they are scheduled. If you told me when the, the well, they, Department they're, of Health... They're, they're scheduled and unannounced. They are unannounced? Yes. But how would they know where the trucks are to go and inspect Well, we already know every day there's at least 25 of them in Farragut North, so... Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. But, but, but I, I understand your point. I mean, the bottom line is you're stationary. You can't go anywhere and, you know. We uh, just want a, 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 fair, a fair game here. You know, we, we have to install toilets for our employees, yeah. correct? Why shouldn't the food trucks also have to install toilets for their employees? Okay. All right. Thank you. And um, Ms. Bennett, um, I appreciate your testimony, but, um, you know, the, the council here, I mean, this is a fact-finding. Uh, mission. So you have to come and make the case, not us. We're going to create a record off of the public testimony, and then we're going to take everything that's been said here today, we're going to digest it, we're going to try to, you know, fashion a, a, a solution and move forward. But it's, that's the reason why it's a hearing. It's a public hearing, so anyone can come down and place on the record their concerns. And uh, to be honest with you, but for you testifying today, I wouldn't have been aware of a lot of concerns that you have put forth. Now, Mr. Jai, I've heard about his concerns as it relates to the parking, uh, but some of the concerns that you've placed on, on the record, uh, this is the first that the committee is hearing about that on the record today. So, that, so those are concerns that will be taken under consideration as well. I appreciate that. I think it's very important that people really understand the global impact and that just because someone has a brick and mortar business does not mean that they too are not a parent providing for a child or trying to pay rent or support their mother or do something else that is equally important as the people who sit here today from the food trucks. Okay. Um, Sarah, she had the way in. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the inspection thing because I think that like that's a public misconception. I've worked in the restaurant industry since I was 13 years old and every restaurant I've worked in I've made you, you get an announcement, A, that there's going to be a health inspection coming. So you're prepared. 
No, you don't. That's you only get that when you first open. Okay. okay. I'm saying when, first, when you first open, you do get some type of announcement that there's going to be a health inspector. But regardless of all that, I've got, how many times a year does a restaurant get inspected? Maybe twice? No, that's not true. Maybe Four twice? Times. Since I've been on a food truck, I've been inspected at least 10 times a year. At least 10 times. And most of those times, you, they were not expected at all. And when you fail an inspection with a food truck, you have to shut down. When you fail an inspection in a restaurant, there's a different protocol that goes along with that. I think that this in the inspection, that, that inspection thing, I, I really wanted to just clear up because I don't think that's, that's accurate. Parking is another issue. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councilman yeah. Graham? This is a good panel. I mean, it's kind of equally balanced. And, and we've got two, four very uh, eloquent spokespersons for this issue. Uh, Mr. Rudell Tabasola, I think you married very well, if you don't mind me saying. <laughs> <laughs> I just knew that was incorrect. Thank but, you. Uh, but I have met the chair on various occasions, and he's, uh, he, of course, is representing the food truck industry today, and, and he, does a, he does a very eloquent job also for his interests. Uh, where is your business located? Uh, our physical kitchen is located in Alexandria. Uh, the corporate okay. headquarters, i.e., my yeah, house where is, is here. Your truck? <laughs> I'm sorry. Where is your truck? Physically at this moment? Well, no, where, where do you typically the, go? The commercial, uh, downtown DC, mainly, mainly for lunches, sir. Do, do you go a different location each day? Yes, sir. So each day you have a different, a different place? And how many locations would you go to in a week's time? Um, there are five days a week for lunches, um, and we rotate about 20 different spots. Some we might do weekly, some bi weekly, and some monthly. So there's not a stability that much to the location itself? Um, there is. We, 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 um, we have loyal followings at each location, some bigger than others. So folks want us back more frequently at some locations and, and less frequently at other locations. So to, to build a bigger audience at a Cap South, for example, See, like a monthly. Yeah, that's interesting because one has a different impression. Uh, maybe somebody, I, mean, I have a different impression, let me say, that, that the stability of the location is very important and that you all go to the same, same location every day, but that's not the case, right? Um, per week, maybe. Yeah, maybe once a week for a, a particular location that, that, that is... Well, you, you sell barbecue, don't you? Yes, sir. And so if people, people have to, someday you're not there and people won't have barbecue, and days that you're there, you'll have barbecue. Well, so there are other folks that provide similar foods than, than I do. Um, how, much, how much competition? Are you ever at Farragut Square? Um, yes, once every week or two weeks. I mean, you've heard people describe what is very, very possibly a dangerous situation in terms of the jockeying for space and with pedestrians and with other drivers, cars being hit, and we've had testimony to that effect. I mean, what is your experience at Farragut Square? Do you have somebody there reserving the space for you so that when you arrive, you have it? Um, sometimes I do that myself, um, to be very honest with you, because it is important to find a space. Um, what I will also offer is that the DC, <laughs> DMV FTA, um, has 60 members now? 60. 60 members of the, the 100 and I think 70 food trucks that are operating in the district. So on any given day, if you look at something like Farragut Square, we might have five, maybe six DMV FTA association trucks in that larger group. And I, I think that's important because within the organization, with, I'm sorry, within the association, um, while we do, you know, save parking spots and things that, that we have to do to, to run our business, um, we self-police in terms of, you know, the not getting in fights with one another and, you know, being a, one big, happy, loving association family. Um, but I wanted to bring that up because you know, there are a lot of trucks out there and there are just, you know, maybe a third of them are members of our association that does really try to put our best, you know, foot forward and, you know, make things go smoothly for everybody. Well, I've heard everything. I've liked everything I've heard, and it's been all spoken very, very well. But Ms. Bennett, of course, you're a special favorite, and I think you have been especially eloquent today. You know, I'm well aware of your advocacy at Adams Morgan, and you really have made a huge difference there in so many different ways, and not the least of which is your fine product. Uh, but I, I, you give me the opportunity, I wanted to particularly hear your testimony, because you give me the opportunity to understand, since I represent Adams Morgan in the, in the council, you know, just what the food, pack, food truck impact has been on that neighborhood uh, in, in its recent development. Um, initially, 
about a year and a half ago, they began to come into Adams Morgan on Friday and Saturday nights, right at the peak time, just at the time the parking meters were expiring and beginning to allow people to park freely for the rest of the night and then taking advantage of the time between midnight and 4 a.m. to cherry pick the business that we sort of wait all week to get. Um, the Fry Captain truck parked one space down from my business competing with the one of two products that I sell, French fries. Um, the Afghan Meals truck has parked in front of my location and verbally called customers to them as they were making the choice to walk into my restaurant. The Lobster Roll truck has parked across the street from me in the now gone shawarma spot, in front of the now gone shawarma spot, and went in to use their facilities because he had no bathroom. He bought a sandwich from the shawarma spot and when Nazir asked him why he was parked in front of his space and why he felt it was okay to do this, he said, hey man, what's the problem? I bought a sandwich from you. And Nazir said to him, or Nazir said to him, yes, but you took 25 of my customers and now you come in to use my bathroom. So there is a backlash of feeling against the trucks who, mis who misbehave in neighborhoods and possibly give a bad name to all other trucks. There is a resistance to us wanting the trucks in our community. We have a bid in our community we all pay into. We contribute back to our community through this, both in terms of the police that will then patrol the sidewalks in front of their trucks that we hire out of our pockets, not through taxes, but through the reimbursable deployment officers. There are numerous amounts of dollars that we pour into the marketing and advertising in Adams Morgan and hours and endless hours of effort on our personal behalf on a volunteer basis for us to further our community. These trucks don't come in at a time at three in the afternoon when times are quiet. They don't come in when the weather's bad. They come right at the watershed moment, well, the waterfall moment, when we're all waiting for this moment to come, and they take the water from our mouths without giving anything back. And so we have a problem with this. As you know, our time is limited. Sure. Right now. So what would you say would be the solution for Adams Morgan in this regard? For Adams Morgan, I would find it, and I think other um, businesses in our community would find it very welcoming to have the trucks along the street in front of Marie Reed at the end of the night. It would be fine for us to have competition in the community as long as the spaces are not directly in front of our businesses, selling competing food directly in front of our businesses. We have very narrow sidewalks which have just recently been widened a bit, but they are supposed to be for pedestrian traffic. So if we had designated spots within the community and the bid participated in selecting those spots, it would be great to have them on the bridge going from us to Woodley Park, creating a huge traffic flow for those trucks to be there and not impacting the businesses directly across from them five, ten feet away, as did Unity Park in our community, which drove that entire section of businesses almost to extinction. Okay, and this is happening in downtown. We hear all the time reports of people being unable to lease out spaces from their buildings and people being unable, un, not desiring to go move down there because of the truck inundation. So that would suggest to me that you would not be in favor of these regulations because there is no, if you don't mind me saying, there's, and I, I was very particularly interested in the dynamic that you've just described and I asked this question of the agencies about, you know, if, if, I'm, if you're going to use CDs, but that's very much out of date. If I'm, if I'm selling barbecue in front of a barbecue place, you know, there, there's obviously a problem with that uh, for the person who has the brick and mortar restaurant. If someone is selling falafels in front of the Amsterdam falafel shop, you know, I think I can readily understand it. So there's nothing within these rules, as they responded to my question, Correct. that would accommodate that kind of concern. Correct. There is so nothing in the rules to do that, and there is also nothing that includes Adams Morgan in these districts, in these, well, in these districts. And, and it should be, because we are a business district that is vibrant and alive and has cultivated a huge amount of foot traffic. Well, I think, you know, I, I mean, I think I'm inclined to oppose the rules, as you know. But I think that, see, this is one of the improvements that we could get out of the rules that I think would serve any business. I'm thinking of Ben's Chili Bowl. Ben's Chili Bowl wouldn't tolerate someone selling chili dogs in front of Ben's Chili Bowl. Even if it was legal, 
even if it was licensed, there'd be, there'd be an uproar. Do you understand what I'm saying, Mr. Uh, uh, what? I have to remember your name, Mr. Rudell Tabasola. Uh, and yeah. heard what she's saying. Do you agree or disagree? Do you think as you should be selling barbecue in front of a barbecue shop? I absolutely agree that um, it would be, uh, <laughs> what's an elegant way to put this, a jerk move. Yeah. Um, I, I, and I person, personally have never done it, um, and my friends don't do it, uh, but I don't think it should be illegal. But some people are jerks. Some people are jerks. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it just takes one jerk to take 25 meals away. That's what the regulations right. are for, for the people who right. can't self-police. Yeah. And I'm surprised but, that after how many years we've discussed this particular issue, that it's not in here. And, and that there ought to be some restraint in terms of the direct competition with the same or extremely similar product. Uh, you know, what, what do you say to that? Do you uh, well, I mean, it's, it, there has been language to that effect in previous versions of these regs, if I'm not mistaken, um, that was removed. I, I, I mean, how do you define same, similar food? If someone sells a cupcake and someone sells a cupcake, or if I sell some kind of pork and this person sells some kind of pork, I mean, well, I'd like it would be impossible. the opportunity to struggle with that, with you all involved. And you can tell obscenity when you see it, and I think you can tell unfair jerkish moves when you see them. And what about the crepes? The crepes, okay. Uh, do you have crepe sellers come right in front of you? Uh, you're asking me if there's crepe trucks that park in front of my restaurant? Uh, yeah. If I've seen it today? No, but I've seen it before, yes. Okay. Well, I think that, uh, I mean, because you wouldn't support these regulations in their current form, would you, Ms. Bennett? I think what... That's kind of a leading question. I, I, no, I, I hear what you're saying. I think what the issue here is, is that if you were to say to me, do you want to support these regulations, I hold out for you as an alternative, more stringent regulations, which would more impact your business in a more positive way, I would say to you, I welcome that. However, I think that the reason you have a lot of people here asking for these regulations today, despite them not being perfect, is because there is no more stringent alternative being held out, and it seems to be to many of us, especially from Mr. Grasso, who I, you know, deeply am disappointed that he left, especially from him, that he wants the concessions to be more on the part of the industry that exists and less on the part of the incoming industry. And that these are not regulations that will be reviewed to be stricter and more protective of the people who are out there already, but are reviewed so that we can make them less protective of the people who are already doing business and who have already made significant investments in the community. And so you're asking someone, would I like a mouthful of water or a whole glass or none? And I'm saying, well, if all it gets a mouthful, I'll take it. But I'd really rather have the whole glass, of course. I think that's well spoken. And so let's, let's think about this as we move forward. But I think that uh, U Street and Adams Morgan are of great concern to me and what affects them. Because there's a lot going on there right now, which is not necessarily uh, pro business and pro prosperity, and I'm, you know, you know, I'm very concerned about that. So I don't want to add to that, that those issues. I want the neighborhood to have more people, more people who come in, behave responsibly, and spend money. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for your testimony here today. Thank you. Uh, Seth Shapiro, Sam Whitfield. Jackson Carnes, Berth Gall, Berth Gall, Berth Gall, Asher Huey, Kristen uh, Martinelli, Okay, Sam uh, Whitfield. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak in front of you today. <clears throat> I, think, uh, I think right now we're really getting to the crux of this argument. We're talking about competition here. We're talking about people's livelihoods, and not, not only the food trucks. I think, uh, I think the lady from Amsterdam Falafel uh, spoke passionately and sincerely, and I think her, her, uh, her concerns are definitely validated. However, I don't think it's the, uh, the, the role of government to regulate competition. 
I think it's the role of government to regulate public health and safety. So today I'm, I'm just going to speak about the tweaks that you want to do to this, uh, to this legislation that's, that's before you. Um, you know, I think my, my uh, food truck partner, Mike, from Takarian said earlier that these are trust us regulations. And we need to make them more clear. I, you know, when I was in uh, law school uh, contracts class, my, uh, my professor said, you know, legislation is like, it's like a private contract, but it's a public contract. And I think my professor would be very mad at me if I signed off on this contract because it's poorly, poorly written, um, at least the parts that really affect us. Uh, I agree with you uh, in terms of 80 to 90 percent of this is done. We are almost ready to go. Uh, but there's some things that need to be uh, to hashed out. Uh, let's talk about the 10-foot uh, the rule. We got a new definition of the 10-foot rule today, a uh, definition that, uh, that actually is quite shocking and surprising. Uh, before, flower boxes and tree boxes were obstructions, meters were obstructions. This language needs to be in the four corners of the document. You know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Majette's employee helper provision is not in the proposed regs. Um, under pro proposed regs, every employee needs a license. That means my baker that's in my kitchen all day, baking cupcakes with my wife, needs to have one of these licenses. We need to write this reg these regs better in a more clear way. Let's talk about uh, Let's talk about how the DCRA evaluated proposed areas after drafting and publishing the regulations. That's backwards. That should have been done before. You know, uh, Councilman Graham asked, he asked earlier, let's see if I could find my notes to make sure I get this right. He says, uh, you know, where's the impact study? You know, uh, there's no data for the assertions made about the impact of the regs by DCRA. Shouldn't that have been done? You know, when, when, you're, when you're putting regulations out for, for a new thriving industry, shouldn't you know the impact? Should you just write regulations and say, well, we'll figure it out after we get these pushed through? No. Let's see here. You know, I think, uh, I think the 500-foot rule is quite arbitrary. I think, uh, I think uh, Mr. Vincent Parker said that, you know, the problems of, uh, the problems of parking and congestion need to be pushed out 500 feet from the MRVs. Uh, I disagree. I think they need to be resolved and not pushed out 500 feet. My cupcake truck has four, I have three cupcake trucks, by the way, and they have four stops each a day. I have no more than an hour at each stop. These MRVs would not allow me to operate as is today. I couldn't go from McPherson Square for a half an hour to Farragut Square for a half an hour to LaFont Metro for a half an hour because of this silly 500-foot rule that's arbitrary and capricious. So let's talk about leveling the playing field. Let's talk about what's not fair. Uh, it hurts. I agree. It hurts me listening. To the, uh, to the brick and mortar establishments when they put their heart, sweat, soul, mortgage into their establishments. And then food trucks wind up on their street. But they don't take their customers. We don't take their customers. We earn our customers. We earn them. I think we, we, get, we lose sight of what we're really doing in this business of, uh, you know, food prep, food uh, industry. We earn our customers. Good service, good food. You know, expenses are expenses. We all have, we all have business risk, but we should absolutely not have regulatory risk from a government that's being swayed by the restaurant lobby. So, You know, I, I just want to say that, you know, leveling the playing field is about making sure that, yes, we do abide by health and uh, safety regulations. Yes, that these parking uh, issues are gone. 
uh, but I but also feel that we need to have clear and unambiguous legislation because we don't at least the corruption at least the abuse of power as well as opens the door for lobbies exerting the will on our public officials which we don't want to have you know this is the DC people knows and has come to expect I'm with Councilman Grasso and wanted to pass good legislation that changes the perception and culture of our great city and its politics. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Kearns. Hi. Good, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Orange, for holding this uh, hearing on the proposed uh, food truck regulations. My name is uh, Jackson Carnes. I'm an advisory neighborhood commissioner in Foggy Bottom and West End. Uh, Foggy Bottom, as you may know, uh, has historically had few dining options. In recent years, the food truck uh, trucks have filled this void. And uh, Virginia Avenue by the State Department and H Street in the heart of George Washington University's campus are two of the most popular places in the district that food trucks frequent. The most glaring problem with these regulations is that it classifies both of these sites and other popular food truck stomping grounds as MRV, mobile roadway vending locations, determined by a lottery system. This means that instead of the market determining the fate of food trucks, government will intervene to determine where food trucks operate in a month-by-month -month lottery system. This is bad for business and customers. It stifles entrepreneurial experimentation and finding the best places for business and lessens customer choice. Appalled by these proposed regulations that lack emphasis on public health and safety or traffic concerns, I introduced a resolution at the April ANC 2A meeting opposing the proposed uh, food truck regulations. It passed unanimously. Just this past week, our neighbors to the north in the DuPont Circle ANC also unanimously passed a similar resolution opposing the proposed food truck regulations. Clearly, large swaths of Ward 2, where a good number of food trucks operate, believe food trucks are an important aspect of urban life. I ask that you oppose the regulations. I fear that these regulations will transform DC overnight from a leader in mobile vending to one of the worst in the nation through a one-size-fits-all approach. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Gall? Yes, thank you, Chairman Orange. Uh -huh. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important issue. My name is Burt Ball, and I'm a senior attorney at the Institute for Justice, a nonprofit civil liberties public interest law firm that advocates for the economic liberty of entrepreneurs nationwide. I also direct the Institute's National Street Vending Initiative, through which we work to protect the rights of street vendors to earn an honest living, free from arbitrary and anti-competitive regulations. Although we have successfully sued uh, many cities in the past over their anti-competitive regulations, we also work with legislators in c cities so that they can avoid passing those laws in the first place. Uh, a couple of the cities uh, that we or have litigated against have been mentioned today. There was El Paso, uh, which passed a, a restriction saying that no food truck could park within 1,000 feet of any brick-and-mortar restaurant. We sued El Paso and pointed out that that law was, could be, only be based on protectionism. Um, and they, in response to our lawsuit, repealed that law. Um, we also are currently suing the city of Chicago over its 200-foot restriction, which was mentioned before, has essentially turned most of downtown into a no-food truck zone, and where it was clear that the local restaurant industry was pressing hard for that, including members of the, members of the city council. I appreciate the fact that, um, Mr. Chairman, that you recognize that protectionism is not the way to go and that we instead need to look at just re actual regulation that is really focused on public health and safety. And I think you're, you're really getting there by hitting on this, the idea of what's wrong and, and what can be changed about the 10-foot rule and the 500-foot rule. The 10-foot rule is a rule, um, and, and we have conducted a study of all the, the food truck laws and street vending laws, and I can make a copy of that available to you in all 50 cities across the uh, all for the top major cities across the country, top 50, no other city has the equivalent of this 10-foot rule that's being discussed here. Um, it, it, just doesn't, it, it just doesn't exist. Uh, the vast majority of cities deal with things like sidewalk congestion by simply saying, don't obstruct the sidewalk when you vent. Um, it's, a, it's a flexible approach, but they don't kind of impose this one-size-fits-all 10-foot rule approach. 
Um, the other thing here that, that people have talked about that, that needs tweaking is this 500-foot rule, which, which does seem arbitrary. Um, and, uh, you know, government representatives cannot seem to offer any real government reason for such a regulation, only that they wanted to protect the food trucks who had won a lottery space. Well, the food trucks aren't asking for protection. <laughs> they want to compete. Um, and a 500-foot law, um, it, it, it's, it is, that number will, is, is so large that it will, you know, cut off, you know, at least a city block, if not more, all around um, these MRV locations. So I, I, I think the 500-foot the rule should be scrapped because it is important to leave food trucks, and along with the 10-foot rule, with as much mobility as possible. There are cities such as Boston and Chicago that have taken the, the dramatic step of really trying to restrict where food trucks can go through assigned spaces and these proximity type restrictions. And just, it, it's not surprising that those cities have some of the worst food truck industries um, in the country. Not because they don't have ambitious entrepreneurs who want to put out great food, but because the laws make it incredibly difficult to operate in those cities. By contrast, when you look at a city like Los Angeles, which has for the most part said, look, we have to deal with health and safety, we have to deal with sanitation, we have to deal with parking, um, you know, we, we have to deal with all those basic health and safety issues. They deal with it on a targeted basis that works. It works in other cities as well, and it can work here. DC, as people have said, has one of the top three food truck scenes in the entire country. Um, I think that if you move to make some of the tweaks that have been talked about here away from the 10-foot rule, away from the 500-foot rule, um, I, I think the lottery has got some problems for some reasons people have discussed. I, I think you can keep D.C. in that top three. Um, just in conclusion, I'll, I'll also note that in January of 2012, um, the government, the administration put forth a second set of proposed regulations that in both structure and, and effect are very similar to the regulatory framework in Los Angeles and other cities with successful food truck industries. Those, those regulations dealt with public safety, they dealt with parking and a number of other uh, issues that the government absolutely has a role in, in taking care of, but they did not have a system that, that seems designed to reduce the number of food trucks. Uh, because again, trust but verify, uh, promises aren't the same thing as what's written down. Um, there is a better way. You're not far from it. The second set of proposed regulations showed how to do it. Um, and I think there's also a way forward here with getting rid of some of these other uh, individual restrictions we've talked about. So thank you. Thank you very much for your t testimony. Oh, I get so nervous when I speak. Um, hi, uh, my name is Asher Huey, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to, to speak here. Um, I'm a labor activist. I'm a progressive organizer, a DC resident, and a food truck enthusiast. I've lived in DC for eight years, and I have come to think of it as home. I work for a labor union. Uh, I spend my days organizing for progressive causes, uh, and I volunteer my free time helping organize and save the DC food trucks. Uh, you've mentioned the uh, four rounds of regulations. I was um, there from the beginning helping the trucks organize, form the association, and uh, have been very proud to have been a part of uh, it and a part of the group. Um, food trucks have provided a lot for DC. They create an energy and culture that downtown has lacked. Uh, people are excited to eat at the trucks. The food trucks create positive foot traffic for all businesses. And this is a concept called clustering. Why do shopping malls do well? Gap and Banana Republic should compete, but both do better because the other is there. Why do food courts do well? Uh, a pizza place and a burger joint in a food court should compete. But no, uh, they do bit better because of the cluster. When you concentrate options, it brings consumers out and everybody does better. Where I work at Union Station, my coworkers regularly uh, walk out to see what trucks are parked there. Because of the lines or because they don't like uh, what they see, they, they don't see the food that they want, my coworkers turn and they walk into a deli. This deli now has business that it otherwise would not have had because of the cluster the food truck created. Uh, because of the food trucks, all of the businesses around there do better. Uh, today, You've heard about uh, some of the problems with blocking sidewalks or creating trash and, and other issues, parking. Uh, but 
these issues aren't solved by this draft of the regulations. If several trucks are parked in one of the vending zones, there will still be lines. Uh, there will still be trash. Uh, other trucks will still need to park other places, and you'll still have to deal with parking. Uh, these regulations will not solve these problems that the food truck opponents are bringing up. As a progressive, I love good proper regulations. Good regulations that keep us safe, they keep things working, uh, they benefit all people. Uh, but what the council is considering are not good regulations. They're bad. And they're the type of regulations that allow conservatives and other people the opportunity to paint all regulations in a bad light. I welcome proper regulation of the food trucks, as does the association. Uh, but regulations that could potentially shut down the industry and deprive DC of the food trucks, uh, are, they're not going to solve any problems. The food trucks create jobs. They've created hundreds of jobs in a terrible economy. They're the most innovative small business model that the city has seen in a very long time, and they're popular. Uh, residents are looking to the council to for leadership on this issue. There's plenty of money behind the anti-food truck lobby, but the people have, have spoken. Over 90% of the public comments on these regulations were opposed to them because people are worried for the trucks. I know that uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of people have emailed the city council. If you look at what's happening on Twitter, if you, if you search for any of the council members' Twitter uh, handles or their names, you'll see that the vast majority of people who are talking about this, the actual people who go out to the trucks, they want to see the food truck stay. So in the end, I hope that that outweighs everything. Uh, these anti-food truck regulations are not what we need. Uh, and as council members, I hope that you can recognize that. Uh, so please send these regulations back to the drawing board. We need rules that work. So on behalf of everybody who has written, who has called, who has tweeted, who has Facebooked, please do the right thing. Well, thank you all uh, for your testimony uh, here today. Um, as I don't know if we're going to send them back or we're going to try to uh, write them. Uh, and try to get something done. I mean, we've, we've been at this for, for quite some time, so I think as the majority of people have, have indicated we're, we're close, uh, we need to just get it done. Uh, so we, you know, we're on the 10-yard line, we need 10 yards to go to score this touchdown call today. <laughs> so we're looking for a victory for all parties. It may not be the, the type of victory that you want. You may not win by 100 points, but as long as you win, uh, I think that's what, what, what counts. And uh, something has to give here. And um, there is one thing. I don't think that uh, Mr. Majette said it in, 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 or meant it in, in, with any malice. But, you know, the government can, in fact, you know, if these rules don't go forward or nothing happens, can, you know, enforce the rules that are on the books. I mean, that's, that, that's their option. I don't know if they would do that, but that is an option. So if we're this close to, uh, you know, to getting something where we can at least all live with for now and then, you know, you can you know, move forward, and this isn't going to be the end of it, because I can tell you two years from now, from now somebody's going to come up with some more laws and some more regulations. It's going to be <coughs> something that's just part of life. Uh, but I do think that before there is a new administration, because you have no idea what that new administration is, what's going to be in their mind, but right now, I, I would honestly say from my vantage point, I honestly believe that uh, Mayor Vincent Gray is for uh, the food trucks but he's also for uh, the, uh, the bricks and mortar. And I do think that you have a person that's running the uh, restaurant association that, you know, is for the food trucks, but, you know, wants some type of, you know, regulations. So I think there's enough parties that are involved to where we can come to some uh, type of resolution. We certainly don't want y'all to call in Mr. Gall and have him suing us. <laughs> so, you know, indirectly, you got your... I'm suing enough say right yeah. now. So indirectly, you have, you have your friend at the table. It's like indirectly, uh, right. Mr. 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 We hope you, right. you guys will do the right thing. Yeah. So everybody's pulling up, you know, and, and so now it's just time for, I think, for all of us to just, you know, exhale, take a deep breath, and get back at the table, and let's get this done. Well, uh, Chairman, uh, right. yeah. yes. if you don't mind, I... I think uh, I think from the food truck and association perspective, I guess our our frustration was we thought that we were in discussions. We thought that we were in negotiations all last year, and uh, come to find out that we had a seat at the wrong table. 
We had a seat at a table, but not the table. And what, I guess what we ask now is that, you know, look, you guys are most likely going to vote this down. Um, it's, you know, not my words, but <laughs> what you said earlier. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so can we get all the stakeholders together in the room and, and, and really just, just get this done, you know, get the tweaks done, and, and like you said, get it done before summer? Well, we're, we're certainly going to be, you know, uh, pushing in, in, in that vein. I mean, you know, you need willing parties, and, I, and it appears to me that we have willing parties that are, are ready and able to, to take the to, to take that extra step. Uh, and now is, is the time to to do that. Uh, but I, I still believe, just looking out and seeing how things are moving, I still think that the District of Columbia uh, is is uh, doing quite well, and, and the food industry, the food truck industry, is doing well here. The, Bricks and mortar restaurants are doing well, and now we just need to, you know, really just put in the extra effort to, 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 to really get it done. And I would say you said you were at the wrong table. I don't know if you were at the wrong table. Uh, I, I think that, you know, everybody has a strategy. I mean, our collecting bargaining agreements, there's folks that just got a raise after 10, 12 years without it. So, yeah. you know, I mean, that's just the, unfortunately, that's the nature of the, of the beast. But I think that with all the pressure that you've been putting on the system, and over the, the past couple of days, I mean, the, the administration is reading the tea leaves just like you're reading the tea leaves. I mean, they can count. And, and I think because of that, you know, there's been some breakthrough. And now the question is, are we going to take advantage of, of the breakthrough? Uh, so, you know, the, you know, I think there, are, there may be a, a lot of tables, but we're getting down, down to the end. And now the legislative body has entered into the discussion now, whereas before it was the executives in, in your industry. Uh, but the fact that they sent the regulations over here, then that means that now we have to act. Uh, and uh, as long as you guys keep the pressure on, uh, you know, we're going to keep on, uh, on moving forward. So I think today has been a very good dialogue. I think all of us has, 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 learned, has learned something. And I think there's a, a willingness to, to, to keep this dialogue going and uh, don't miss out, you know, on, on the opportunity. I think the worst thing would be for us to, to start looking at a, at a fifth draft or if someone else has to uh, come forward. Because if this one doesn't get done, then, you know, with uh, next year being an election year, you're probably talking maybe three or four years before there's going to be uh, uh, some real regulations. And then now the pressure is going to be, you know, you know, we really will have the bricks and mortars really pushing this government, say you guys aren't enacting the law. And then, you know, they can also go into court and say, hey, they're not enforcing the law. So I think there's a lot at stake in here, and there's been a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in this process. So we should make sure that, that we, we benefit from it. But I, got, I know you might want more to say, but I still have 30 more witnesses, and uh, we need to uh, keep this uh, moving on. I've been very generous with the clock. Generally, my colleagues put you on three minutes, and they don't care where you are. <laughs> three minutes, you're out, the next person. So. Well, we'll just keep this going. But thank you all very much. For thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your leadership on this issue, sir. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, George Farrell, Gina Cadora. Tom McDonald and Jamie Leeds. Was it any order? Anywhere. Josh Salzman. Okay, Josh, we'll begin with you. Absolutely. Uh, I apologize for my tardiness. I know I was supposed to be in an earlier panel. Um, my name is Josh Saltzman. Uh, I'm the owner of the one of the owners of the pork food truck, as well as an owner of uh, Kangaroo Boxing Club, a restaurant in uh, Columbia Heights on 11th Street. Um, you know, thank you, thank you for holding this hearing today and listening to all the testimony. It's been an eye-opening experience. Um, you know, one of the things that I want to stress about. Uh, how my business came to be here is that uh, my business partner Trent Allen and I actually tried to open a food truck in Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan. And right before we were going to be the first food truck there, the city passed laws uh, that made it impossible 
to have a food truck. And we looked all over the country and said, w w you know, where is, where is the spot that we want to open up, that we want to do business? And, you know, we think this is a good idea. And we packed up a old Buick Regal and uh, moved here in 2009 uh, in winter to do that. Um, and, you know, uh, a little less than three years later, um, or from the time that we got our first food truck up and running, we now have a restaurant as well. And so I think that uh, I have an interesting perspective on these regs because I understand the issues that brick and mortar businesses have brought up here today, and I understand the issue, issues that food trucks have brought up. And I think one of the most important things to, to, that the council really needs to see and that this committee needs to understand is that you know, we can't regulate innovation out of, out of business. It's one of the most important things. Food trucks are one of the most innovative new business models. It helped me get going when I couldn't afford a restaurant. And if the regulations as they were presented today passed, we, my business would never have been here. The 25 people that I employ wouldn't have jobs. There would be $100,000 plus less in sales tax in the city's coffers every year. There'd be 40,000 plus less in the city's coffers related to employment taxes. And you know, th that'd be a shame. And that I, I think the important thing to see is that the end game isn't a food truck versus restaurant battle. It's that we're all food service businesses. And there's different advantages to each. If you're on a food truck and it rains, you lose 60% of your business. I don't see that in my restaurant. I also don't sell booze on my food truck, nor, nor am I looking for you guys to, to put that into the regulations. Uh, but, you know, there, there's, there's obvious advantages and disadvantages. And there's costs associated with both, and the costs are enormous of running both businesses. And I hope that, you know, the council sees that, that the, the importance of these regulations is not to prevent the next innovative business <coughs> idea, whether it's in food trucks, if it's in a new business model from starting up in D.C. because this city needs more innovative small businesses of all types and we can't restrict it now when it's just getting going. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Uh, this is George Phil. No? I'll tell you, since I don't know who's uh, called out the names, we'll just start with you, ma'am, and go across. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. um, Thank you, council members, for hearing my testimony. My name is Jamie Leeds, and I am the chef and owner of Hank's Oyster Bar. I am here today to stand with the D.C. food trucks and to ask the committee to send these regulations back for revisions. In 2005, I opened Hank's Oyster Bar in DuPont Circle. I wanted to create a neighborhood restaurant, and I named it after my father, who is my inspiration for becoming a chef. I have been very fortunate to enjoy success. After we opened, we were nominated for a Rami for Best New Restaurant by the Restaurant Association of Metropolitan Washington. And in 2008, we won the coveted Rami for Best Neighborhood Restaurant. Last year, we were nominated again for Best Casual Restaurant. Today, I have restaurants in DuPont Circle, Capitol Hill, and Old Town, Alexandria. My support for food trucks today is not despite the fact that I am a brick and mortar restaurant owner. I'm here today because as a brick and mortar restaurant owner, the values I hold dear for hard work, entrepreneurship, and the love for creating something to serve to people every day demands that I stand with the DC food trucks. I've been a chef for 28 years, and I can see that food trucks are a great opportunity for people to get into the food businesses. The contributions the food trucks makes to the DC community are unique. The diversity of cuisine is important to offer to working people on the go. The food trucks make places like Farragut and Franklin Squares two true destinations that people want to go to. I know well the challenges over regulation present small businesses here in the district, and do not feel that my restaurants are threatened by food trucks. In fact, in 2012, I partnered with Michaela Brennan, owner-operator of the Hula Girl Truck, to do a one-day pop-up restaurant at my DuPont Circle restaurant called Hula at Hanks. Hula Girl Truck prepares Hawaiian cuisine that is truly unique and that no other brick and mortar restaurant in DC offers. My regulars enjoyed the new dishes, and the Hula Girl truck brought new customers to my restaurant. All the food truck operators want are regulations that are fair. They are telling you today that they support much of the proposed rules. However, other sections of the regulations threaten to shut down many food trucks and take away so many of the wonderful dishes they provide our community. As a small business owner, I especially take exception to the proposed lottery system. I would never leave the success of my business up to a game of chance. 
There needs to be a compromise here, and in order to arrive at it, you must reject these harmful regulations and send them back for revisions so that the food trucks, the restaurants, the district, and community can work together to make the needed revisions to get these regulations right once and for all. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. McDonald? Yes. Good afternoon. My Good afternoon. name is Thomas McDonald, and I'm the co-owner and daily operator of DC Slices. I manage and operate the district's only mobile commercial pizza kitchen, and I'm a lover of all things pizza. I'm a founding member of the DC Food Truck Association, and I'm also a second generation street vendor, and have held a license to vend in this city since 1994, when I started out selling souvenirs with my father as a roadway vendor along the National Mall. For my father, selling souvenirs was not an easy job, but it was an honest one that paid the bills and put me through college. For me, the interaction with customers and being in a different location every day while learning the basics of business management for my father was an extremely high point. However, a low point for me in vending was the ability to vend was left up to a monthly lottery system where we had no guarantee of always winning a location or working every day. To look back on it now, that lottery was one of the things that always reassured me not to quit my part-time restaurant job. So when we won a lottery location, we would work, and when we didn't, we would have the day off. My father retired in the year 2000, but I continued to vend while keeping a part-time restaurant job until 2004, when growing bills and the uncertainty of not knowing if I would always win a lottery location made me decide to take a management job at a local company on Capitol Hill. Fast forward to four years ago, to 2008, when after years of dreaming of pizza and wanting to open a small restaurant, I managed to talk my best friend and now business partner into joining me in emptying our savings accounts along with our IRAs to open a food truck with the hopes it would be the first building block on a long road to restaurant ownership. So in 2009, the DC Slices brand was created and we took a leap of faith in the district's residents, the local government, and everyone that works in this city with the hopes that these same people would also have faith in DC Slices. We opened our first truck in April of 2010, and like most small businesses, the start was not an easy one, but after three years of nonstop work in a rough economy, we are slowly growing and moving in a forward direction. At the moment, we now have two food trucks and are actively looking to open a small brick and mortar restaurant in the next 15 to 18 months in either Ward 1 or Ward 6. We also have a total of 11 employees, nine which live in the district, four in Ward 1, two in Ward 4, two in Ward 5, and one in Ward 6. In closing, I ask the committee and the council to reject the proposed regulations put forth by the mayor's office to remove any language moving forward that would leave the ability for a business to operate to a game of chance. I also ask to strike any language that would limit the ability of food trucks to stay mobile or any law that would create an unnecessary sidewalk restriction that would highly restrict where food trucks can park. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Gina Cordero. These views are my own. I've worked in Washington, D.C. since 1998. Eleven years ago, I took a job on Fort McNair in southwest D.C. Until about three years ago, my lunch choices, if I did not bring lunch from home, had been a cafeteria, an officer's club that is not open every day, and an army mess hall that's since been closed. For the most part, my colleagues and I would drive to Virginia to get lunch. Food trucks have increased the options around me and have been a godsend as the economy has slowed the growth of the restaurant industry near the Southwest Waterfront and Nat Stadium. As a federal employee, I cannot take a long lunch. If the food trucks go out of business, my closest fast food options would be limited to a Subway and a Z Burger by Waterfront Metro or a Subway, Five Guys Burgers, and Potbelly by Navy Yard Metro. There's not much choice there, especially for someone who doesn't eat gluten. It is a lot easier to explain your dietary restrictions to two food truck workers as opposed to the five plus on a sandwich line. I believe that food trucks bring value to the Washington, D.C. community and do more than just provide lunch. Their uniqueness as mobile vendors allows them to serve the city in many ways. For example, they've been a part of the Cherry Blossom Festival serving food at the Southwest Fireworks Display. And that's a big draw to my friends and me, especially those who don't work in D.C. and don't have the opportunity to try them during the week. I've noticed that food trucks have helped to attract people to the new Yards Park in Southeast, close to my work. In the summer, they are there providing dinner during free outdoor movies or concerts just about every week. They certainly make me want to stay in the city after work instead of driving back to Virginia. They've partnered with D.C. United, serving food in RFK's Lot 8. 
I volunteer at one of United's supporter group tailgates, and while we serve about 200 of our members during weekend matches, I've never heard comments about the food, about the food trucks being competition. In fact, they, they enhance the overall tailgate experience. In the last two years, I've bought five food trucks to serve on Fort McNair for staff events. The owner operators I have worked with have been courteous and professional. They have provided catering codes competitive with established brick and mortar companies, and in some cases I've gotten feedback that they serve better food. The food truck industry has done nothing but provide value to, to Washington, D.C., and instead of proposing regulations that have threatened to put them out of business, I believe you should work with them on regulations that will allow them to continue to operate and serve the community. To close, I'd like to thank the FTA for giving me the opportunity to speak and to the city council members for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you uh, very much for your testimony. I want to thank this panel uh, for your testimony. I don't have any questions. I think most of it is, has been said. I uh, just want to give everybody else an opportunity to testify. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you sir. Okay. Uh, Craig Bossy. McCullough Britton. Gary Saren and Charlie Ellis. Okay, there's no Charlie. Uh, Vi True. You may begin, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, my name is Craig Barcy. I'm the owner of Sweets Cheesecake, a brick and mortar bakery. My wife and I began this journey almost 25 years ago with very little cash, but with the belief that if you work hard enough and long enough, your vision of a successful business will come true. Through the years, we've had many ups and downs, as do businesses, as do all businesses going through their growing pains, but in the end, they simply become lessons learned. The dreams, however, turn quickly into the day-to-day -day running of a business and all that this entails. As with any small business, you find yourself wearing many hats. In the morning, you may be creative, but by afternoon, you become the chief bill payer. As a brick and mortar owner, I have many bills. As taxes go, I have payroll taxes, property taxes, self-employment taxes, sales taxes, federal, state, and local taxes, and many more. I also have fees, such as licensing fees and permitting fees. I have inspections, such as health inspections and fire inspections, water and sewer inspections. All of these have to be satisfied so you can then work on your dream. I have had many competitors along the way in the past 25 years. Do they make me nervous? Yes. Would I like them to go away? Of course, but that isn't my call, just as it wasn't anybody else's call when I began so many years ago. So I look within myself and my company to find ways to adapt and change and improve so that we remain strong. You have to be able to adapt to a changing climate, and we have had to change many, many times or I would not be here today. I do not have the power nor the right to eliminate the competition, but I should have the power and the right to be competitive. I am also the proud owner of a DC food truck. I have many of the same obligations as a food truck owner that I have as the owner of a brick and mortar. I have taxes to pay, I have permitting and licensing fees to maintain, and I have health inspections to pass, which I might add, are spontaneous. I worry about payroll as well because I have other families that are counting on me to realize their own dreams. I have the same concerns whether it be on my truck or in my shop. I am here today with many of my food truck friends. They are hardworking, honest entrepreneurs who are playing by the rules. We are competitive by nature, and it is that competition, whether it be by other trucks or long established businesses, that compel us to be innovative. We are legitimate businesses, not rogue wanderers of the streets. It should not be the business of the mayor's office or of special interest to legislate us out of business. As with any business, our customers should decide whether we are here based on the quality of what we do. 
Isn't that how a free market is supposed to work? We are not here today asking for special treatment or exemptions from fair-minded rules, just simply the power to remain competitive. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Michaela Brennan, and I've lived in Washington, D.C. since 1999. I moved here from California to D.C. to work for Marriott International as the Director of Design and Development. I bought my house in Ward 2, and when I first moved into the neighborhood, it was still a little bit shaky. But I saw the potentials here. One of the reasons why the area has changed was due to small businesses taking a chance. I remember when walking down 14th Street as a woman was not an option. Now there are new restaurants, retail, and other amazing businesses that have all taken the gamble and opened in the neighborhood. I owned and operated a small, biz small food and beverage consulting firm here in D.C. for 11 years. I employed D.C. residents and helped to open many of the top restaurants in this area. Over the past few years, the economy took a turn for the worse, and I was one of the ones that was hit hard. I had to lay off my employees and figure out how I was going to make a living. I owned a restaurant in California, and I wanted to get my hands dirty again. I did my research and found that the new food truck industry here in D.C. was a great way to test a concept before making a larger commitment. I wanted to have a restaurant, but with the economy taking a nosedive, no banks wanted to lend me the half million dollars it would take to be open. So I took my last bit of savings, I asked my parents for some money, and I put a second mortgage down on my home. Then I took a giant leap of faith, and in 2011, I opened up the Hula Girl truck here in D.C. Much to my surprise, Hawaiian food was an instant hit here in D.C. Perhaps due to that local Hawaiian guy in the White House, or people just like what we were doing, but I have an incredibly loyal and hungry following here in D.C. The Hula Girl truck was featured on Bazaar America with Andrew Zimmern on the Travel, show, uh, travel Channel on a show about D.C. America's eyes are on D.C., and they feel the food trucks are a big part of this city's scene. It would be sad to see that all of my hard work in creating this successful business in D.C. would be washed away if these regulations were passed as is. With your help, we can continue to add to the vibrancy, culture, and activate unused spaces within the city. I'm excited to pass regulations that work, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Ms. Sarah? Hello. Before I begin with the testimony that I prepared for you today, I'd like to give some feedback on some things that I've heard during other people's okay, first, testimonies. First of all, identify yourself for the record. Um, my name is Gari Serain. I am the owner-operator of Something Stuffed Food Truck. Um, the owner of Amsterdam Falafel spoke heavily about how the brick-and-mortar restaurants in Adams Morgan contribute back, to the com contribute back to the community and spoke of how food trucks do not do the same thing. This is highly incorrect. Mike Leonard of Takarian's entire testimony was about the contributions that his particular truck has given back to the city. All of us sitting in this room do similar um, activism to give back to our community members. Myself in particular, um, I, oh, I rent kitchen space in the Noma area and participated in Noma Bids cleanup of the neighborhood just two weekends ago. I also participated in a home a Thanksgiving event for the homeless in Farragut Park, a location that's been heavily discussed today. Another point that I like to talk about is um, in regards to people, food trucks coming in front of restaurants that sell similar products. Well, I don't do that, and I know a lot of my fellow DC Association trucks don't do the same thing. Um, I know some trucks do. However, if food trucks are given a rule saying that they can't go st stand in front of a restaurant that sells the same product, shouldn't restaurants be given the same rule? I know for a fact in Adams Morgan there are more than one falafel locations. There's more than one pizza location. Now for the testimony I've prepared for you today. As I said before, my name is Gary Serene. I'm 25 years old. I'm the owner of Something Stuffed Food Truck. What is Something Stuffed? Well, much like my story, nothing about my truck menu is typical. We serve a variety of handmade stuffed items with fusion-inspired fillings. Close to 90% of my menu is scratch-made, and we use as much local product as we can sustainably source. Each and every one finds its way on my menu board through recipes I've created through my culinary journey. My product is unique and different, which can often deter 
deter a large number of customers who flock to the familiar. For this reason, it is important for me to find locations where customers are adventurous and are looking for items that aren't normal. Um, I, look, I also attract a large number of vegetarian and vegan customers. If these new regulations were to pass as is, and I was lucky enough to get a lottery spot, who's to say I wouldn't get a lottery spot in a place where people aren't willing to try something out of their normal box? This could potentially put myself out of business. When I said culinary journey, please don't think I'm a shelf. Well, not a professionally trained one anyway. Actually, I graduated from George Mason University in 2011 with a degree in communications and public relations. <laughs> like many college students, my college experience was faced with a number of life-changing events. For me in particular, in the middle of my sophomore year, I was involved in a serious car accident where I found myself flying, flying through the windshield of a car and breaking my back in four places. After an intensive surgery that left 10 screws and six hooks in my upper back, my surgeon assured me that I would be fine, but I, wouldn't, I shouldn't expect to live a normal existence. Knowing myself, I knew I had to prove my surgeon and my body wrong. After all, I was given a second chance. Second chance. There was no way, no way I couldn't make that count. Less than a year after graduating college, I took the money awarded to me after the accident settlement and invested the majority of it into starting my own business. Something stopped. While my parents urged me to use the money as a cushion for my future, I assured them that my food and my brand would grow into a success that would provide for a sustainable lifestyle. While being a food truck owner means working well over the normal 40-hour week and forces me to push myself past my physical limitations, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I love my job. My business allows me to showcase my creativity, provide for myself as well as three full-time employees, and has served as a catalyst for other business inventors, including the launch of my bottled sauce line, which was recently picked up by Washington Greengrocer and will hopefully find its way into other retailers in the near future. If this current set of proposed regulations was to pass, myself and my fellow food truck owner operators would lose the inherent nature of our business that I love so much. We are able to meet the people where they are, to bring unique meals to areas of the city that are barren and not oversaturated with mundane choices. Unlike many, and I'm not saying all, of our lunchtime brick and mortar competitors that are run by large corporations, the majority of the people standing in this room work on their trucks daily, serving the people of the district their various foods and sharing their story. This is my story, and I thank you for taking the time to listen. I hope that today when making your decision, my words and the words of my colleagues and friends resonate with you. Please don't pass these regulations. Please don't threaten our livelihoods. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. True. Yes. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is V. True, and I am a roadway vendor. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. I. I'm a little bit different from the, the mobile vendors. I'm actually a stationary mobile ven um, stationary roadway vendors. Um, it's all been almost been 30 years uh, that I've been working with my parents, and um, I have three things that I would like to to um, discuss. Is the first thing is the monthly vending fee. Um, a lot of the vendors would like to understand how the 450 per month came up, because um, if I if I done the math correctly, it's uh, you know 104 dollars a week, 14 almost 15 dollars a day, and this is just per month. But this it says it's per location, so that means that location you can only work four days in that month. Um, so it, it doesn't um, add up to the vendors, the stationary vendors, and we would like to understand where that number comes from. Um, most of our business comes during springtime and summertime. The fall and winter, there is hardly any business. Kids are, are back in school. Um, everybody is, is back working. Um, another thing that we would like to to discuss is a lot of the trailers are pulled by vans and we are already um, paying the meters for the van and um, so that would actually be doubling our fees um, not just for the monthly um, uh, uh, fee for our location but also for our van 
Um, the second thing that um, we would like to, to discuss is the lottery. We have we have been doing the lottery since since we've started working and um, allowing the roadway um, the mobile roadway vendors to come in into the lottery we will need more locations because as of right now there's 77 76 locations that over 150 um, <coughs> participants in the stationary roadway vendor um, lottery and allowing the the um, mobile roadway vendors to come in there will be there won't be an, enough to go around and um, I have been in the task force for the DCRA right, four years ago discussing the same situation and we've asked for additional locations um, but we just haven't got anywhere with that we haven't had any addition um, additional locations added um, Let's see. Um, the other things that we also ask for is if we continue having a lottery, that instead of having a monthly lottery, we would like to have it you know, at least maybe three or six months out of the year. Um, that would help people that, um, that don't do this every day to at least plan their, their life out. Um, I, I think that's I think that's everything for right now. Just we just need some more some more answers from the DCRA and how they came up with the numbers. Okay, well, uh, thank you for for your uh, testimony here, here today. The, the four hundred and fifty dollars per month, as, as I understand it, that's the four hundred fifty dollars per month if you want to then on the mall. Correct. And it's and you're right. It's four hundred fifty dollars per month and it's per location. But I thought for the other ones that are that have been doing this, the the, the 176 population that you talked about, uh, and only seven, there's only 76 spots. I believe they pay 475 per month, and and it's per location. And what they're doing now is, is adding the uh, food trucks if they want to. Uh, enter into that lottery as well. That's the question I raised to them. If uh, all of a sudden, if there are 200 food trucks in the, in the district and you want to add that 200 uh, to come into this lottery, I mean, that's really going to be a bad situation for those that have already been operating there because I believe the number was uh, no 186 spots and, and only 76 can actually win the lottery. So now if you add 200 to that, now you want almost 400 people that are vying for 76 spots. I mean, right. It's worse than what they're talking about in, in the MRV where they believe there's 200 uh, uh, food trucks and there's 180 spots available. Uh, so, um, you know, that's what I gathered from, from their testimony uh, here today. Um, in terms of uh, doing the lottery three or six months, I'm uh, having to go for three or six months. I, I don't know. That's... It's something that, uh, since you've raised it on the record, and they know I'm going to raise it with them. Right. Uh, so uh, you should uh, have an opportunity to interact with them on, on your uh, on your issues. Right, because I, I just feel like um, a lot of the, the vendors, um, also the police officers that go out there every month to, to operate this lottery for us, right. um, it takes a lot of time from them as well. And um, there will be months where they are... Um, called out to to an event where we would not have a lottery that month and uh, and it would just be carried on to the next month so that's where we're just asking if if this is a time to discuss that if we could modify that okay. somehow okay and I take it that, that you uh, currently operate on the mall yes okay. and and I am the stationary I, I stay in one spot I'm not the one that uh, moves that moves around all right. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Um, let's see, Miss Sarin. Yes. Yeah. Um, you have a very compelling story. I'm glad you made it through the, uh, you know, the accident, and uh, and you seem to have a lot of, uh, you know, determination and ambition and perseverance. And so, uh, good luck, uh, you know, with, with your business, uh, something stuff. Uh, certainly, uh, enjoyed your. Uh, 
uh, testimony here today. Well, I wish the things that uh, happened to you didn't happen to you, but you at least you're here today to uh, you know to talk about it and uh, and able to uh, engage in, in lively and engage in, in your business. Uh, the Holy Girl. I was wondering what the Holy <laughs> Girl was all about. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for for, for being here. Um, have you had uh, President Obama come down and get something off the hula truck? Not yet. <laughs> not yet. And I went to the same high school. I keep trying to pull oh, that the, the alumni school. card on him, but yeah. it's not working. I'm sure he hears that all the time. Yeah. You should have an automatic guest card. <laughs> you'd think. We should be coming to you. Hey, can you get us in? <laughs> I, I hope. Yeah. But well, th thank you for uh, t uh, testifying here today. What part of California are you from? San Diego. San Diego. Born and raised in Oahu, uh, Hawaii, and then moved to California. Oh, okay. Good. And so I say thank you as as well. So you have the uh, uh, you're like uh, you have dual status. So you have a yeah, brick, I, uh, I do. yeah yes uh, the brick and mortar restaurant as well as uh, having the food truck. So you know the the both of best worlds and the worst. The, of best yes worlds. yes so, so to speak. Yeah, but uh, you're surviving and, and uh, as you indicate, you're just modifying and, and diversifying your portfolio as you move forward and looking for other opportunities. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thank you all for uh, testifying uh, here today. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Have a great weekend. Now we're going to move on to uh, Michael Hamilton, uh, Lavani, and I'm going to try to announce this, pronounce this last right. name. Okay. Uh, Isabel Perilous and Kathy Taylor. Don Pelfley, Mary Lord, Jeff Kelly, Scott Magnuson, Jason Martin, Seth McCullen. This is looking good. Elizabeth, <laughs> Elizabeth uh, Munati, Rui Hankins, Ann Brandless, Hi, right, Mr. Hamilton. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for hosting us today and for giving me the time to speak. Um, I've been very encouraged by the uh, discussions today and the leadership you provided, Mr. Orange. Um, thank you. I'm Michael Hamilton. I'm the founder of In My Backyard, D.C. We're a local citizens group with uh, 600 members from throughout the district. Uh, we've worked on a lot of the other issues so far, like the uh, proposed liquor license moratorium in New Street, but we support uh, general issues where we try to find a more interesting and affordable uh, District of Columbia. And so most of the issues I was going to talk about today have been covered in pretty much in detail over the last six hours. I'm going to skip to basically just one section. Um, uh, one of the biggest problems um, I saw with the regulations um, were the discretion given to local officials. Um, the regulations themselves did not create a single mobile roadway venue location. Um, and that's, I think, the reason why we've had such different maps put out by different groups. Uh, instead, they allow the DC, uh, DCRA to propose locations and the number of food trucks that can operate each one, and then that's subject for review by DDOT. Uh, this is uh, Section 537 of the uh, regulations, uh, states that either the director of either organization um, has the discretion to propose, modify, or move a designated MRV location at any time. I think uh, if we're going to uh, go back and change the regulations, this is probably the first part that would need to be addressed, and I think this removed entirely. Um, <coughs> If the regulations leave it up entirely to the discretion of two people without any kind of process of review, either from uh, the food truck vendors themselves or, or city council members, that uh, we really wouldn't have regulations at all. We instead have basically the rule of two people, which could change after every election or based on the whims of those two guys. Um, and so, uh, uh, and for the current proposal, um, I, I know in my written remarks that uh, if if we had to vote up or down, I'd say reject them, and you've noted that you want, want to try to go back and find a way to change them. And if you did so, I had one short proposal that could try to uh, work things out for people. 
Um, in place of the uh, current regulations, I would strike the mobile uh, the MRVs completely, um, and I'd basically expand the other section. So under the current regulations, there are some simple rules to follow um, that s outline where food trucks can go who are not assigned to the MRVs. I think basically uh, a better regulation would be just to have this exact system, but with a much uh, more lenient rules that are very simple to follow and easy to figure out what to do. So get rid of the 10-foot rule, um, make sh get rid of the rule that says they can't park within 40 feet of a crosswalk, and then uh, maybe have a few spots where there's a public safety problem where you guys can say they can't go. So that way we have uh, most of the city open up to food trucks to park anywhere that's you know, a metered location, that's in a commercial district. Uh, with some clear rules about where they can't go. Um, and that way, instead of having to pick every single possible location that a food truck could possibly sell and then having to oversee who gets to go where, you have a much simpler task of saying, okay, what are the problem locations? We can cross those out and then allow the food trucks to go there. Um, and the easiest way to do this, I think, would just to be to issue a uh, monthly parking permit to the mobile vendors that they could probably pay uh, a rate that equals to using the meters five days a week for four hours plus some kind of premiums. So that way they're paying more than a normal uh, par uh, car that's parking there would be. So um, in conclusion, just by keeping the food truck regulations simple and rule-based, uh, we can ensure that there's an even playing field between uh, restaurants and food trucks, between different food trucks with each other. Um, and that way, the means of the consumer will go first. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, testimony. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Chairman Orange. My name is Levan Gachwashwili, and I'm a sous chef with Chef German DC. I helped launch the business with the chef and owner Jerry Trice just over a year ago. We proudly serve the downtown DC area to customers who are on the go, don't have much time, don't have many options around, or just looking to try something new. Most of our clientele is loyal regulars who return time after time. I have lived and worked in the DC area since 93 and recently moved into the city along with my wife. After much consideration, I decided a few years back to follow my lifelong passion of good food and dream of one day becoming a great chef. Against most of my family's advice, I enrolled, enrolled in culinary school. After graduating from L'Academy de Cuisine in 2010, a local, local school based in Bethesda and Gaithersburg, Maryland, I've built up some much needed experience along the way working at a couple of local establishments until ending up as a sous chef with Chef Driven DC. Being a chef anywhere is <clears throat> not an easy task. You can ask any chef, they'll be happy to tell you that. It's very demanding, time consuming, and labor intensive work, and I love it. There's nothing else. I would rather be doing. <clears throat> we put all our efforts, countless hours, and lots of love into anything and everything we do. Personally, it gives me, gives me great pleasure having the opportunity to provide people with good, good, simple food made with time, care, and passion. It's the best feeling to be able to see someone enjoying a meal. The currently proposed regulations would greatly jeopardize the ability for food trucks to do what they're meant to do. Go to the people and bring them different options of varieties of consumable goods. It's already a very hard, competitive, and cutthroat business, and this would be suffocating the fair chance for all food trucks to do well and thrive. The streets are the habitat for the animal that is the food truck. Taking this habitat away would mean making many of them go extinct. I strongly believe if we can work together on this, it is possible to come to a fair consensus, but as is, many of the food trucks will be exterminated. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, sir. All right, thank you for having us today. Appreciate it. My name is Louis Hankins. I'm with uh, Rito Loco, owner and operator. Um, I'm pretty new 
to the food truck industry here in Washington, D.C., and uh, the proposed regulations will, I feel, effectively end my business. Um, since 2008, uh, I've been searching for a way to rebound from the economic recovery. I was a very successful salesperson for a major home builder. I was making a great living. I lost my house. I lost all my savings. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I was given some money from my grandmother um, as she passed away. And I've put it all into this business. I work well over 100 hours a week sometimes. I do everything I possibly can. And since August, we are now finally making a positive impact on our revenue stream. Well, we are looking to open brick and mortar restaurants. Uh, restaurants say that we have an unfair advantage because we're a mobile food truck. Well, I say to them, open your own food truck, just like I'm open my own brick and mortar. I would love to have opened a brick and mortar restaurant from the beginning. However, I didn't have the financial resources to be able to do so. A food truck provided me the perfect incubator to start a project and to see if it could grow with the finances that I had. Um, and we are definitely heading in that direction. Um, you know, we're here in the capital of capitalism. You know, we're in Washington, D.C. And us as small businesses, I don't feel like should be regulated by the government. And, you know, I think that if anything, uh, we should be helped and incubated and developed. Thus, we can help the economic recovery here in the District of Columbia. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your uh, testimony, Ms. Benz. Um, hi. Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Anna Brownlees. I own DC Empanadas with my husband, Sean. I am also one of the founding members of the DC Food Truck Association. We opened our food truck in Washington, DC on January 8th, 2011. Um, I've lived or worked in Washington, D.C. all of my adult life. So when we decided to open a business, I couldn't imagine opening our business any place other than the city I've always called home. Like many of our colleagues, both my husband and I had corporate jobs before embarking on what at the time was a new untested industry. We were one of the first 12 food trucks in the city. I have a bachelor's degree in economics and an MS in applied economics from Pennsylvania <coughs> State University. I worked at the World Bank for several years and most recently co-managed a nonprofit. So what would make us want to leave the comfort and security of corporate jobs to spend countless hours working under extreme conditions? Well, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and my priorities changed immediately. I no longer wanted to spend one more day working countless hours in a job that I didn't love. I was not passionate about what I was doing and I wanted to spend my time doing what I loved and that was cooking. My husband, who was a mortgage broker, had been laid off and was having difficulty finding a new job. So we spent months agonizing over the decision to quit my job. We have two kids, Haley, age 14, and Jackson, age 5. We also have a mortgage and an unknown amount of medical expenses pending for my cancer treatment. We weren't wealthy, so the thought of taking all of our savings and putting it into an untested business in a field where one in four new businesses close within the first year was terrifying to us. Initially, we wanted to open a small restaurant, but we quickly discovered that in order to do that in D.C., we needed to have at least half a million dollars. Given that the country was in a recession and bank loans were impossible, the only money we could count on to start a new business was our savings. The only way that we could follow my dream of working in the food industry was to open a food truck. We researched all of the regulations and had our truck built. And in January 2011, we opened DC Empanadas. Thankfully, our business was received with great enthusiasm by the market. We were able to test our concept and build a loyal, steady following of customers that eagerly waited for us at multiple stops. We created a schedule that takes us all over the central business district. We go to all parts of the city and serve our customers in northwest, northeast, southeast, and southwest. As a result of the support we received from our customers, we were able to expand our business and in September 2012, 
We opened a permanent location in the new Union Market located in Ward 5. DC Empanadas has been fortunate enough to be featured in many national magazines, including Southern Living, Every Day with Rachel Ray, and Parenting. We are currently in the process of looking for a location in the district to open a full-service brick-and-mortar restaurant in the next 12 months. We take great pride in being responsible business owners. We fulfill all of our obligations to the city, and we regularly support local charities, such as DC Central Kitchen. For the past two years, we have done a toy drive and made sure that every child that was a resident of the My Sister's Place Shelter for um, Victims of Domestic Violence had Christmas presents. Um, we employ a total of seven people, including two hearing impaired students attending Gallaudet University, between both our food truck and our union market location. We work in collaboration with many local small businesses to help get their products out to our customers as well and help them grow in their business. In the last few months, my cancer returned and I had major surgery. I'm currently in the middle of my chemotherapy treatments. Our health insurance didn't cover a large portion of our expenses, and if it was not for my food truck, we would not have the funds to continue our treatment and be able to feed our kids at the same time. If these regulations are passed as is, we'd be forced to close our truck and lay off our staff. That would mean we would be unable to pay for our health insurance. And that I wouldn't be able to continue with my treatment. So for me, if these regulations are passed the way they are, it's not just a death sentence for my food truck. It's that death sentence for me personal. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for your testimony, um, Ms. Bradley's, and I uh, wish you good luck in, with your treatment and also with your business so you can uh, continue to, to move forward. Uh, I want to thank you all for your, your testimony um, here today, and um, let's have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Next for uh, Jerry Trice, uh, Enrica Vanquez, Kristen uh, Barcy, uh, Brandon Bird, okay, uh, Brian Farrell, uh, Balin Licknickin. Xavier Exto. <laughs> so you may begin. Thank you. Uh, well, you've been here all day long. You've been here as long as we have. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sticking with me. Yeah. Um, My name is Jerry Trice, and I'm the owner of a Chef Driven DC food truck. Uh, we're a DC-based company that rents kitchen space in the district and currently have a total of four employees, four hardworking employees, uh, half of which reside in the district. I'm proud to say Chef Driven is just over one year old and continuing to build momentum and an uh, extremely loyal following. Our customer base is at least 75% repeat customers, and all of this is not by accident or luck. This is from countless hours of hard work, determination, and planning. Um, my background has been fine dining restaurants for the past 18 plus years. After receiving a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Virginia Commonwealth University, I was drawn to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, having always been enamored with good whole food all my life, I found myself working in the first real, true professional kitchen for the first time. It was an eye-opening experience, to say the least. I quickly began frustrating the uh, American Culinary Federation certified master chef, Leif Eric Benson, with my numerous novice uh, questions. I was determined to educate myself in this newly discovered world and get a foundation on which to build. Uh, chef Leif was instrumental in, instrumental in encouraging me to try to get into the Culinary Institute of America. Um, he spoke very highly of this institute and even owns a uh, 
culinary school himself in Portland. Um, he wrote a personal as well as a professional reference on my behalf, and I applied and eventually did, did get in to the esteemed CIA, where I found the work pays dizzying but extremely rewarding. Graduating in 1995 with an associate's degree in the culinary arts, and through networking with other CIA alumni and chef instructors, quickly began working in the D.C. area at some of the top restaurants. And after being in this hard-working industry and sharing countless, I mean, endless hours with fellow culinary professionals, journeymen, part-time college students, second career, late bloomers, and everything in between, and even despite my family's advice, this is the career I've chosen and I've stuck with thus far. Um, this is what I've always been drawn to. So after all this hard work and several years later, it was only inevitable that I search for my very own restaurant space, uh, which became a full-time job in itself. Um, I range searched from Annapolis, Maryland to D.C. and consumed the majority of my shrinking free time. I found after numerous landlord meetings that it was easy to do major improvements and sink thousands, if not millions, of dollars into someone else's property. Um, the landlord has the considerable advantage in this equation. He got to own the real estate attached in order to make this a, a, a more safe um, equation. Um, I was certain I wanted to cook my own food, but did not have millions to invest in my own real estate. There had to be more of an affordable or even temporary segue. Thus, a food truck was born. I began researching DC mobile food vending and found this to be a viable option. After several months of preparation and truck build out, Chef Driven DC actually came to fruition. I feel as though my business has brought the city not only upscale seasonal food I'm very proud of, but also tax revenue and jobs to DC residents. The proposed regs, uh, which changed a little bit, not on paper though, today, um, would greatly stifle the way we currently do business in the city. The areas that would be left open would be flooded with the remaining trucks, and we would certainly have to focus on Maryland or Virginia in order to survive. This could mean leaving the district altogether, the kitchen space, and even employees. These regulations hardly seem fair in any way, to be quite frank. Um, they would make D.C. one of the most unfriendly cities to operate a food truck business. I have never believed a food truck is harmful to brick and mortar establishments, and I've been on both sides. I've never preyed on customers about to enter any eatery on wheels or brick and mortar, and I've personally spoken with restaurant owners that wish they had a food truck to promote and expand their current business and create awareness. Uh, council members, um, I, we are eager to collaborate um, to update mobile food vending rules and regulations. Please let us be a participant of our mutual success instead of killing creativity and diversity altogether. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, thank you, council members, for your time. Um, my name is Brian Farrell. I'm the owner of Basil Time Food Truck. Uh, I own two food trucks, but only one of which is operating right now despite being licensed and legally available to operate at present. But I'll get to that a little bit later. We've only been in business serving the folks at DC for almost two years now. Like many here, I've sacrificed my 401k to finance my dreams, and no bank would give me a loan despite an 850 credit score. <coughs> in fact, I did not even have the money for a fancy wrap like one of the trucks. In the cold winter DC months of January through March of 2011, I ground the entirety of the outside of my aluminum truck with a drill and sandpaper, spending about 200 hours to give it that from scratch look it currently has. <clears throat> I know when we started that with incredibly hard work and dedication to quality, we would do well. I'm proud to say that during that tenure, we've been ranked among the top 100 trucks in the nation, have, uh, as have about 10 of my colleagues. Um, we were named runner up food truck of the year last year. And Basil Time is currently the number one truck on Yelp, as well as number six for all restaurants in Washington, D.C. I mention that because uh, I'm not here to break my arm patting myself on the back, but food trucks represent not just a consumer choice, but excellent food options for those that live and work in D.C., Jerry's truck especially included. Um, uh, 
many of the mobile food vendors uh, would be, excuse me, many of my mobile food vendor colleagues serve food that any establishment in the city, brick and mortar, or otherwise would be proud of. Uh, many of our customers say that the work, <coughs> uh, that we work in extremely underserved areas where restaurant options are often zero to none and are extremely thankful for our presence. I think it's important to counsel our work to preserve choice here, which I see these regulations as fundamentally restricting. Um, kind of off speech here, I, I was a little confused when uh, I had a conversation yesterday with uh, Vincent Parker, who indicated that uh, there were going to be 150 spots. I heard uh, Chairman Orange suggest there would be 180 spots in the CBD. I, I thought I was here to fight 100 spots, which was actually one of the paramount reasons that I decided to close one of my food trucks. I felt that we were certainly under eminent failure, given a 50-50 shot were those regs to go through, and I felt that uh, I didn't want to have my truck, frankly, be one of hundreds that was going to be unloaded. It was a, a hedging of my bets, as it were, and it was a horrible decision. I, I let three of my people go, giving them a, a month and a half notice, uh, but I felt like the momentum was unbearable, that uh, the council would likely do, or I should say the, that would move with the mayor and, and likely pass these regs and thus put an end to my business, and rather having somebody tell me that my business would be ended with a lottery, I figured, well, then perhaps I should just be proactive. Um, in this case, I'm deciding to continue on with basal time if and until these end, uh, regs do put an end to us. However, um, I, I would say I was rather appalled in speaking with uh, Mr. Parker last evening. It was a chance meeting. He and I met down uh, at the net scan. And um, uh, one of the things that's most striking to me is he seems to think that, um, you know, uh, 20%, you know, uh, not being in business where um, if you are uh, put in a lot of system where, you know, maybe maybe you have an 80% chance for getting a spot on a given day, but multiply that by five times, uh, you're likely to certainly not have one day or two days a week that you're working. Uh, my chef is a top chef master sous chef. We put out quality food. I can't turn to him and say, I'm sorry, you're only working 32 hours this week. I'm sorry, this month you're only working 24, 24 hours a week. I mean, that's preposterous. So uh, it, it's just, it's a, it's a toxic, ill-conceived set of regulations. When I spoke with Mr. Parker, uh, he said uh, that he had accounted for all the trucks on mapping on Food Truck Fiesta, which is a common... Uh, aggregator of where all the food trucks are, and I said, well, what about the trucks that don't tweet? He said, what? Because uh, when, when he said there were 140 trucks daily, I said I was shocked at that number, because I knew there were easily 180 2.0 trucks, if you will, um, and growing every day. And he said, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm surprised to hear about that. Actually, I'll, I'll look into that. So I, I just feel like these are poorly cooked to use a, a bad metaphor, but um, I'm just going to, I'm going to leave my testimony at that for today. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Councilman. My name is Xavier Adazal. I've been a Ward 6 resident since mid-2010 when I moved to D.C. from Long Island, where I lived after graduating from college. Uh, for those of you that have never lived or worked on Long Island, variety and cuisine does not always seem to be a very high priority. Uh, this is part of the reason why I was at times overwhelmed, but more often overjoyed when I relocated to Washington. I didn't have lunchtime options any longer that were just McDonald's versus Burger King. I had healthy options, creative options, any options at all. I feel like I came along near the beginning of the D.C. food truck phenomenon, and I consider myself lucky to have sampled uh, so many meals that are created by people with the dedication to focus on crafting a few specific dishes better than anyone else. Having had an opportunity after feeling so limited previously, I have a great difficulty understanding why we'd ever want to limit the choice uh, in the way that the proposed restrictions would. Now, I understand that we're looking for fairness between food trucks and the brick and mortar restaurant industry, but limiting where the trucks are allowed to serve food would all but be a nail in the coffin for the industry as a whole. And most certainly for trucks with less name recognition than others who might not be fortunate enough to find themselves at popular locations often enough to cover their overhead. Now, the industry is already hindered by several factors that don't affect brick-and-mortar restaurants in the same way. 
So if it's raining outside, I can still get myself a Chipotle burrito or sit down at my favorite Thai restaurant for lunch. But a food truck could lose an entire day's income. A great many sit-down restaurants also probably make more in alcohol sales than on any given day than most food trucks pull in in the few hours that they set up for lunch service. So this is fine, and these are the negatives that go along with operating a food truck. I'm sure these vendors are fully aware of that and hopefully prepared for those circumstances. But setting up another roadblock for the trucks, uh, pun regrettably intended, uh, in the interest of fairness seems, at least to me, the consumer uh, like the big guy picking on the little guy. Now, I know some might argue that having a food truck around the block during lunch will steal business from established restaurants, but I disagree. The presence of food trucks isn't what's going to stop me from eating in a specific restaurant. Not being in the mood for that restaurant is what's going to stop me. I don't always want the offerings that can be found within walking distance of my office, and the trucks are a great alternative when they come around. They change their menus when things get stale, they interact with their fan base constantly, and they provide wonderful customer service. My barber can't remember my name, but everybody that works at Cat Mac or the barbecue bus is already waving to me when I get into the back of the line. It's a very nice feeling. If uh, brick and mortar restaurants are made uneasy by the presence of mobile vendors, they just have to follow their lead in these few endeavors, and I know that a great many do. It really works for any restaurant tour. Recently enough, I was drawn into a corner bakery chain. I don't eat a corner bakery, but I was drawn there as a result of a new menu item being promoted online. So you can see it's not impossible for the two industries to remain on equal footing here and to stay competitive. Now, these restrictions are damaging to small business owners and their staffs, but also to the nine to five community that they're both here to serve. All the same, you know, as the established restaurants. Now, in this way, I see these two industries as being mutually beneficial to one another. They should be pushing each other to improve and succeed in the spirit of competition instead of pushing each other away with a damaging lottery system. In the end, the regulations currently on the table seem at odds with our capitalistic society. The restaurants that are still standing years from now won't be around because they had an address versus wheels. They'll be around because they provide the best options and the best service, which I think many of the food trucks do. So briefly before my time is up, I'd like to point out part of what upsets me about living in D.C. is the fact that it's very transient for people my age. I've made a great many friends that have already left feeling like the district was just a pit stop for them. I plan on settling down here for quite a while, due in large part to the unique character and charm that the city possesses. I feel that the food trucks contribute to that charm immensely, and I pray that the council recognizes that and does what they can to allow the industry to thrive. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Mr. Lincoln? Lincoln, yes. Lincoln. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman Orange and fellow uh, council members. My name is Balaam Linekin. I'm the founder and executive director of Keep Food Legal. We're a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit that advocates in favor of food freedom of choice without advocating any particular choices. Uh, we count uh, food trucks and brick-and-mortar restaurants uh, as issues that we advocate in favor of, and we also count them as our members and supporters, along with farmers and others around the country. Um, I also am a, uh, I'm an attorney, and uh, I graduated from American University Washington College of Law, where I also did my undergrad work. I first moved to the district in 1990. I also hold a Master of Laws degree in Agricultural and Food Law uh, from the University of Arkansas, where I did not pick up the uh, southern twang. Um, I would like to uh, note here that we uh, keep food legal and our members and supporters oppose the proposed uh, regulations. Um, we think that they'd be very harmful to competition and to the food truck industry. Um, and I don't think that uh, protecting uh, brick and mortar restaurants is a, the proper role of government. Uh, just to go through some of the things that we oppose uh, very quickly, because others have touched on at least some of these, uh, at least until uh, this morning, I guess, late last night. The regulations appeared to treat uh, people, uh, taxpayers, residents, workers, uh, as obstructions. And I think that's uh, sort of dangerous territory to treat people as obstructions, especially when they're taxpayers in the district. I think that the ice cream truck rule, which the regulations would have repealed, uh, actually, uh, and that would have been a good thing, uh, essentially that forces people to go into queues to line up uh, to wait for uh, food at, at the food truck. And I think the regulations would, in turn, have, while abolishing the ice cream truck rule, have forced uh, customers uh, uh, have forced customers not to stand in lines, uh, and that's an, a result of unintended consequences of the ice cream truck rule. Circular logic, in other words. Um, one thing that I, I, I've heard uh, complaints about, uh, both uh, in print and, and somewhat here today, are the idea that crowds of people are somehow a problem. 
Uh, when we think about, uh, and I again moved here in 1990, when we think about crowds, especially uh, around an area where business has taken place, I think of the things that have uh, sort of arisen since I first moved here. I think of places like Haleo that was uh, sort of an anchor in the Chinatown uh, neighborhood. I think of uh, the late Abe Poland who opened up the Verizon Center or what I guess was the MCI Center at that time. I think of National Stadium. I think of uh, vibrant new spaces where people are standing outside and queuing up. And even the metro, where people are going to and from work. These are masses of people, but they're also masses of taxpayers that do nothing but good for the district. They may create temporary crowds, but that actually is a good thing. Um, to, uh, I've heard a comparison of uh, Portland and Austin in terms of the regulations, you know, how should D.C. <laughs> regulations and should they be more like Portland and Austin? Uh, no. Um, Portland is a city that uh, has five times as, uh, uh, as much space as D.C. Uh, Austin has twice as much, and they both have about the same number of residents. And so regulations, uh, it would be inappropriate to base one on another. Uh, and finally, I, I want to note uh, in terms of the problems that uh, the regulations may uh, give rise to, that no city I know of, and I've studied and written about food trucks for several years, including in scholarly articles, and I taught a class at American University on food and social media that uh, last semester that focused on brick and mortar restaurants and on food trucks, no city I know of has ever been sued for uh, not discriminating against food trucks. And I hope that uh, D.C. will continue to be one of those cities. Finally, um, I'd like to, uh, uh, I guess, because my organization is not, uh, is not a food truck lobby, uh, we are in favor of food freedom of choice. I'd like to note that brick and mortar restaurants are overregulated in the district just as food trucks currently are and certainly would be under these proposed regulations. I think it's important. I wrote an article a couple of years ago in which I interviewed the owner of Liberty Tree Restaurant, uh, who's helping revitalize the, uh, the H Street corridor, he told me that he lost something like $500,000 in revenue while waiting to open uh, due to inspection issues. He had opened up in a space that was an existing restaurant. So I certainly would uh, uh, urge the, the council to reject the proposed regulations. But also, when you go back to the drawing board, uh, which uh, it seems likely at, at this point that you will, that you consider lo lowering the burden not just on food trucks, but on brick and mortar restaurants as well. I think that a lot of the uh, complaints today from brick and mortar restaurants about being overregulated are legitimate ones. I think the ones about asking the council to uh, create a competitive advantage for those same brick and mortar restaurants are uh, inappropriate. And so in conclusion, I think that uh, I would urge you to, uh, as uh, Mr. Gall from the Institute for Justice suggested, um, reconsider the second proposed set of regulations that came out of DCRA um, and to regulate uh, only based on health and safety going forward. I think you'll find that uh, consumers and uh, restaurants, uh, brick and mortar and mobile, are, are both uh, better off. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you uh, for your testimony. I want to thank you all for, uh, for your testimony uh, here today. Thank you. Thank Is you. there anyone, any other public witness that desires to testify before we uh, bring back the government? You come on down. And you haven't testified already. <laughs> it's not a second bite at that. Hi, Chair uh, Orange. Thank you for having me here today. Um, my name is Camden Lee, and I am. I was born and raised in the D.C. area. My family has been in the D.C. area since they immigrated to this country in 1882. Uh, and my family has had restaurants in the district since 1930 when um, my great-grandfather, a Chinese immigrant, opened a restaurant in what was then China, Chinatown, which was in a slightly different area. Uh, my family was able to um, to build their lives here because uh, of DC's focus on small business. Um, they were able to really be a part of this community and to this day my family still has a restaurant in Chinatown. Um, I'm here today uh, not as somebody who works at a food truck, 
not as somebody who has any um, monetary investment in food trucks. I'm here as a customer. Uh, I took the day off he today to be here all day um, because I really care about these small business owners. Um, Brian from Catmac, who is unfortunately not allowed to be here, um, works long hours and um, really cares about the residents of DC and the students at GW and the workers in my office and every other office. Che and Tad work long hours both for their business and the association and other jobs to support themselves. And Anna does an amazing job supporting her kids and um, going through everything. And all those business owners here really work hard uh, because this is their lives. And my family was able to build their lives here because of DC's focus on small business. And I uh, would kindly ask you to not overregulate these small businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Sir. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Frankie Doyle. I'm uh, the owner of uh, Puerto Proveos. Uh, since 1989 in the district, uh, I uh, employ 28 uh, employees, uh, 25 of which are district residents. Um, I, I apologize if somebody else during the day had already brought this up, but I, I wanted to touch on something that uh, that is really integral, I believe. When a business owner, brick and mortar business, business owner such as myself, does a site survey for a particular location, um, obviously the competition is is uh, is looked at and uh, it's determined if whether or not that that's the, the correct location for your business. Um, seven years ago when I opened up um, my one location at 1225 I Street which is right at uh, Franklin Square um, we had six competitors and uh, I opened up and uh, a couple of years later uh, when the food truck Food truck issue uh, mushroomed. Uh, it, it it it's a completely different story. Uh, yesterday there were 22 uh, food trucks in front of my business, and um, when Miss Bennett was speaking about 12th Street jockeying for position, those are all in front of my uh, my uh, business. Um, what's the name of your business again? Of Proteos. Okay. We have two locations in the district, and they both are affected by uh, food trucks. But the, the way I look at, at the food truck operators, I, 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 honest to God, I look at them like brothers and sisters. They, everyone, when you work in this industry, no one knows how hard it is until you do it, and I realize that. Um, you've invested your blood, sweat, and tears. Um, when, you, when you mentioned the immigrant story, that's my family, same thing. Um, it, it's a lot of pride. You have to have pride, otherwise you're not going to last. I, I've, like I said, I've, I've been at it uh, since uh, 1989. Um, we, we have to, to make it, you know, where everyone is, is able to coexist. I believe that there are underserved areas in the, in the district that could benefit from it. I feel and I think everyone here, if they spent a day in my shoes, would feel the same way I feel. You know, I know that everyone has invested a lot of money, and usually forty to fifty thousand dollars for a truck. I invested over six hundred thousand dollars in my uh, I Street location, and. To, to say that a pot can only be sliced so many ways, I, I think that says it the best way. There, there are only so many bodies on Franklin Square, and, it, and it, believe me, there's wonderful smells coming from these trucks, and, and they do a wonderful job, uh, a lot of tasty things, and there's a lot of good folks on these trucks. Uh, uh, Craig, uh, who spoke earlier, is an old friend who I buy things from. I wish I could buy some more things from you, Craig. <laughs> Business is down about 30%. But 
But I'll tell you an interesting story with Craig. Um, one day, I happened to look up across the street at the melee of trucks, and I saw Sweets Cheesecake, and I was like, oh my God. I, you know, it just hit me right in my heart. I picked up the, the phone and, and called Craig's office, and uh, I said, Craig, you've got, I'm, I'm selling your product in my spot, and you've got a food truck directly across, across uh, 12th Street from my business. He instantly called his, I believe, son-in-law that was driving the truck and said, no, 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 that's not a policy that we do. And I was very appreciative that, that you did that. And uh, there, there are lots of good folks in these food trucks. And hard working, and unless you've worked in the food industry, maybe while you were in college or something, you don't know the bond of, of camaraderie that happens in the kitchen. The, the most stress ever, but also the most camaraderie. But anyways, I guess I'm here just to say as, as somebody that, you know, gets hurt by the no regulation that's going on right now, I, I really enjoyed the words that uh, Ms. Bennett was giving earlier because I, I, I feel that every day, the frustration, folks from the trucks trying to sit at my tables, trying to use my bathrooms, and I'm, I'm, I'm losing business. I'm, I'm also a father. I've got two, two sons. Um, I was born at Columbia Hospital here in D.C., raised here in D.C., uh, graduated from American University. My son's at Catholic University. We're all in this together. But you have to understand, you know, my, my investment, which is, you know, and that, not that it makes a difference, but it's over ten times what each food truck is, is usual investment. I see it slipping away. And if, if I close my shops, you know, that they bring a lot of sales tax into the D.C. Uh, into DC government, what are you going to do then? I mean, we've already had two big businesses close on, on Franklin Square, and it's an eyesore. And, and that, those landlords aren't getting, aren't getting rent money, and uh, they're, not, they're not paying employees that work there. So I, I'm here to say you have my information. I'd love to help in any way. These guys are all hardworking guys and they offer great stuff, but there has to be some sort of way that we all can coexist. Unless you want to buy me out of my lease where I am, and no one's going to do that. You know, my, I'm on the line for 10 more years there, and if I, if I go out of business, I have to declare bankruptcy. You see, it's, you know, the, I see your point of view, you've got to see my point of view too. It, it's hard. So, I know Baltimore did a, a special uh, thing where they, they had uh, the food trucks only in areas where they felt were underserved or brick and mortar places weren't there. I mean, you know, I worked hard to get um, my little corner busy with, with people enjoying food and, and it hurts to see, you know, 22 trucks right across the street trying to capitalize on that. And that's all I'm here to say. I, you know, I wish everyone luck. I think we can coexist. This is a big enough city, but um, you know, I, I I think we this this the way it is now. It's almost cannibalism. So thank you for your time. And I invite anybody to come down and to my place and break bread with me. Uh, and I'll show you. You know, we can cross the street from his uh, restaurant, and it is really good food. And I, I make sure that I go there as well as the food truck. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's awful sweet. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ethan Simpettis. I'm the uh, litigation counsel for the Port of Piraeus. And as you can tell from my size, I don't discriminate against food. I love it all. Uh, but I do have a preference for brick and mortar um, and the Port of Piraeus. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, I think um, uh, I haven't been here the whole day. I came in the afternoon. I've been asked to appear here on behalf of my client. Um, one of the operative phrases and I, is very valid, and I think that's what uh, Mr. Doyle has been echoing and many others as well, and that is an unequal playing field. And without getting into the advantages or disadvantages, I think it's been articulated many times over, I just want to just focus on one issue, and it may have been covered, I don't know. I'm just going to raise it 
and I apologize if it is redundant, and it is the issue of taxes. And I know this uh, on a professional and personal matter uh, with Mr. Doyle. He pays property taxes towards the landlord, towards the property space he uses. There was also a special assessment, I remember a few years back, for that grand old stadium that we love, uh, National Stadium. That was a special assessment to Mr. Doyle that he had to pay. And those taxes, my question is, are those taxes applicable to the food truck vendors? And if they're not, then people like myself will be coming forward very soon and addressing that in court. And I think somehow that has to be addressed. There shouldn't be a disparate level of taxation. Or if you want to remove the taxation entirely, I'm sure Port of Piraeus and many other establishments, establishments would welcome the tax relief. So I don't know the answer to that question, but I would like the council to comment on it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, well, I want to thank you all for your, uh, your t testimonies uh, here today. The, the council doesn't answer questions, but I'm sure you can call the staff and we'll uh, get the an answer for you. Uh, but at this time, we've been here since what uh, I started at 9.30 this morning uh, with hearings, and uh, this is the second hearing. So we're going to uh, move forward. I want to thank you all for testifying here today. I ask Mr. Majette to come back up along with Vincent Parker, and so we can close this out. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> okay, gentlemen, it's been a it's been a long day. Is there uh, anything else that you desire to, to, to put on, on the record today? Um, one clarifying point, uh, Councilman. Just, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, present yourself again. Vincent Parker, uh, DCRA Vending Manager. Okay. Um, there was earlier conversation about the employee requirements. Um, Section 564 of the proposed regulations does say an individual business or an individual vending business license or an employee is required or everyone, you know, the implication from the food trucks is that every person is required to be licensed in that sort of way. Um, well, earlier we discussed that only one person on each vehicle. Um, the vending model uh, that these regulations uh, in some instances envisions is that a vending operation is only one person. So 564 is addressing a sidewalk vendor who's in a hot dog cart. Um, and that person either needs to be the vending business licensee or an employee. Um, Section 533.1 of the proposed regulations says that a mobile roadway vending vehicle shall have either a vending business license, one of the other, one or the other. You either have to be a vending business licensee or a vending uh, employee um, shall be on the vehicle at all times. So that was just one thing that I wanted to make clear that f Section 533.1 applies to mobile vendors. Um, and their model is because it addresses mobile roadway vending vehicles having one of the licensed people on at all times. Okay, okay thank you. Um, Mr. Majet, anything else you want to put on the record today? Uh, uh, just that um, we have a, you know, our, our society is an ever changing society. Um, who would have thought that um, t the print media, newspapers would have the hard times are having now because people are communicating electronically. Um, business executives are handling their own uh, correspondence through emails, they're handling their own telephone calls with cell phones, they don't need secretaries like they used to, the Ministry of Assistance. Things change. Who would have known when we implemented uh, ice cream truck regulations that there would be uh, full service food trucks that cook food, serve food, and we're, and we're mobile. Nobody envisioned that. Um, and we had to change regulations according to the times. And the times have now dictated that the food industry via mobile food trucks is a viable industry. It's, there's a demand from our customers and our constituents. And we think that the regulations that we proposed, um, which we 
mulled over for over a year and through meetings with both brick and mortar and the mobile food industry. We think that we've come up with regulations that of course won't please everyone, but they strike a, a balance um, and kind of level the playing field so the mobile food vendors are paying their fair share of taxes, and as you know, they're now paying full um, sales taxes and so forth. And we think these regulations um, are a, a, a good start to regulating the mobile food vendors. Well, um, Mr. Majai, I appreciate um, you know, your testimony here today and your team's presence. Uh, but as, as I indicated earlier, I, I just don't see what, where the votes are to, to move the regulations forward. And uh, I would hope that uh, you know that would motivate you to uh, uh, continue to work with us so we can fashion something that, that, that can move forward. I would hate to see us uh, lose all this momentum. Uh, and uh, clearly, uh, uh, as I've tried to get the, 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 the trucking industry to, to understand as well, with there being an election next year, there's going to be it may be some time before we really revisit this, uh, depending on you know on what happens. I, I do think that uh, the mayor is uh, in favor of, of, of food trucks, it's just like he's in favor of, of the uh, bricks and mortar restaurants. Uh, but I, I do think that we're, we're at a point now where. A number of, of my colleagues have, have expressed, uh, you know, concern, and um, so I would hope that we would use this as, as an opportunity. You might have to give a little bit uh, in, uh, in order for us to really get this done uh, uh, this year. Uh, I think we're close, uh, and we'll, we'll be calling on you, uh, you know, after we uh, finish this hearing and call on you early next week to, to, to see, uh, you know, is there some, some movement and where we can actually uh, work something out to uh, to get this mo um, moving forward as opposed to letting this be the, the end. Uh, one thing that we do have, uh, I guess we can say we can have going in our favor is we know we have until June 22nd, but we really don't have until June 22nd. Uh, just based on, on, on the, the council's calendar and the fact that um, we are uh, you know in the midst of the budget uh, right now, so the you know, budget is, is a big priority. Uh, but I think after being here all day and, and after all the activity, and, and like you said, I do think that the, the media has distorted some of, of what's been uh, reported. Uh, and uh, I would say on, on the trucking industry's behalf, they're, they're saying like, uh, you know, trust, but we need to verify it now. And so we might have to, you know, just move a, a move forward on some other items and, and get this done. But I'm hopeful, but I think that, uh, you know, the ball is in your court. Certainly, uh, uh, as chairman of this committee, I'll, I'll be there to help facilitate uh, something that we can move forward with and try to work with my colleagues to, uh, to see if we can come up with something that uh, uh, that the council can get behind them and move forward. But at, at this point in the makeup of this committee, I, I just don't, I, can't, I don't see the votes. And I, I don't know what your reading of this is, but uh, like I said, we can talk as, as, as we move forward. I would also actually look at that section that deals with uh, advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, and really take, take, take a look at that. I don't know what the rationale is for uh, those <coughs> food trucks not being able to advertise, especially, you know, others are advertising. And, and I do, as I put on the record today, there has to be standards. And, and I do think that since you have these regulations, you should take the lead on that as, as, as well and take a look at that. But uh, I'm here, I'm open, and uh, look forward to continuing to, to work with you. I do want to say once again, as I said uh, earlier today, I think that uh, DCRA, DBOT, uh, in particular, you've put a lot of work in here. And, uh, and I know the mayor has been put here as, as well, as well as the, the food truck industry and some of their recommendations as well as the restaurant association and in particular all the people that actually operate the trucks that have come down here today and spent the day here. Uh, I'm sure they've, they've lost the revenue by being here. Uh, but the fact that everybody's here at this particular table, I know one person indicated that uh, I think that he may have been at the wrong table, but I think we've all shown up at this forum. This is the right forum to be at. <laughs> and now we just hope out of this forum uh, we can uh, get something that we can move forward. And as you know, even, even uh, if, if, if uh, we find a solution and, and we're able to, to get it executed, this is not going to be the end of it. 
things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think everybody needs to understand, you know, as long as you have a legislative body and an executive body, uh, there's going to be more laws and there's, there's going to be more initiatives uh, in, in this body of law. Uh, this one came out of 2009, but I understand it really came out of 1998, so, you know, the, the saga continues. Mm -hmm. And as you indicated, uh, uh, the news media, uh, I mean, they're, they're facing their challenges now, mm -hmm. uh, just as... Uh, uh, the bike messengers now facing challenges mm -hmm. with emails, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's just the nature of the beast. Mm -hmm. uh, the, our taxi industry is facing issues with Uber now, mm -hmm. and uh, as new emergency businesses come come along and new technologies are created, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people are going to have to uh, modify it and adapt. It's not killing competition; it's the competition is just taking on a, on, on, on a different face. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do. I think Mr. Barcy is his name. I think he's still here, but he's modified his uh, 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 how he operates to just keep up with, keep up with the times. Um, I know it took me a long time to, to get to the BlackBerry, but now I'm I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> the curve waiting for some place to come. You know, but that's just the you know the way it is. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank everybody for being uh, involved in this process. And, Let's keep the momentum going. Let's, let's right. don't kill it here. This is not the end. Let's, let's keep it going. Thank, Thank you very much. This meeting stands adjourned. At 629 p.m. on Friday. <laughs>